morning. Andrew Beckstrom here at Direwolf Studios, joined by Patrick Sullivan here for another Open. This weekend, we've got the Krogar's Choice 5K Expedition Open. We're going to be watching um, over 64 of our best players from around the world competing in a single elimination best of three bracket for the title of Open Champion, winning $1,500 out of that $5,000 cash prize pool, and they will be advancing to our next world championship. Patrick, this weekend we've got Expedition up as the format. Tell us about what we can expect to see. Well, uh, with the release of Unleash, the Unleash mechanic has shown up. A uh, combination of Miner's Musket, maybe Ageless Mentor. Uh, there's a lot of Praxis-style decks uh, essentially built around the notion of reducing the cost of an Unleashed unit and then flooding the table with a bunch of under-costed units. Um, beyond that, a lot of the old staples are still around and present. A uh, collection of good Justice cards, um, Helena, Furious Mind Adventurous, Lunar Claw, even though Mind Adventurous uh, and Helena have both received nerfs, are still part of the format. Uh, we've seen a variety of uh, Frenzy decks. Another mechanic uh, that is made its debut here in Unleashed uh, either Stone Scar or Feln or three faction builds that play a variety of, uh, you know, aggressive units backed up by spells or other sources of frenzy damage to proc that. And then also the the time stuff, the just good time cards, uh, various mid-range cards, including the new uh, Chatter Rewards card, are also around. So anecdotally, uh, from a format balance, how represented are the various factions and how different are the different archetypes that are available? This is one of the most both diverse and sort of unexplored expedition formats that I can recall. So it'll be interesting to see what our top players have brought to the table. Yeah, it's going to be a fun uh, day for sure. So the way that this is going to work is that we will have seven rounds of coverage for you all today. Each round will start off with a featured match. We'll jump in and watch those players play that best of three single elimination match to its completion, and then we'll pick up any of the other matches in the round that are going on in progress once all the matches are done. Come back to the booth, couple minutes break, and then we will be back with the next round, and we'll keep doing that throughout the day until we are down to just one competitor left standing. And so how did these players get here this weekend? Let's talk a little bit about the sort of the first struck, the first round of this event in our, our open structure for this year. So players on Friday and Saturday – could compete in runs of 14 games with their Expedition deck of choice. Players who completed and won 10 or more games in their run advanced to the finals here today. And all the competitors who competed this weekend got four copies of this this month's uh, alternate art card, Zoltan Conclave, a uh, new power card in the Unleashed set and uh, a very beautiful art harkening back to that Zoltan tableau that we saw um, back in Promises by Firelight. And so in addition, of course, we see on the screen all of the other run rewards that players get. And so there's a lot to play for in our Opens each month, uh, regardless of if you make it to the finals or not. But for the players who did, they are just six or seven wins away from advancing to a world championship, and we'll be finding that out today. Uh, so, Patrick, uh, that, that Zoltan Conclave, uh, I, it's, a, it's a shame we aren't allowed to compete and get our hands on that one. I know. I mean, I, I can go into the back end maybe and get some uh, someone to help me out <laughs> on that. But that, that artwork is beautiful. Um, a card that I'm personally very fond of from the new set. And so hopefully a lot of our players got the opportunity to snag that this weekend. I've got a question for you. I like to humanize this a little bit because we are not just calling the tournament, but we ourselves are also designers on the game and play quite a bit. What have you been playing in Expedition lately? Uh, I like to play with Island, uh, Island Hand of the Tempest. So that's been my jam. I, I pair her down, up with the Crinkle Boys, and they they come in. They're poking things. I like to splash time into the deck. Um, I've been mixing around with different splashes right now. I've been uh, mixing in some time so that way I get access to Dismantle and Chrono Storm because if I get up, I can usually tempo people out with like Serpent Squads and Islands, but the Chrono Storm helps me out a lot, even if it's bouncing back a bunch of Unleashed stuff. And the nice thing about it is that with Torgov's Wares and the time cards I'm playing being inscribed cards, I could still sort of play them and still have a very, very heavy Primal Sigil base for, for Island. Yeah, I've been, I've been having two decks that I've been playing a lot, as you probably know. Uh, Mono Justice Good Stuff which was something I was very fond of for a while. Kind of put that one on the shelf. I've been playing a lot of uh, Felon Frenzy lately to great effect, as 
you know, I keep sending the 10 consecutive win streak achievement to people in our designer chat or whatever. Um, but I don't know if any of those decks are particularly popular this weekend. Something that's really struck me about the expedition format playing on live is all the factions are out there. You know, you have Argent Port mid range, you have Stone Scar and Felon as aggressive strategies, you have Praxis as something of a sort of combo style uh, deck as well. And so uh, all the factions are out there. And no matter what your predilections are as a player, there is a deck for you. Yeah, the default sort of control decks are both seem to be shadow with um, either Argent Port, and then you're getting access to Nothing Remains, Black Book, maybe Mystical Shackles, Parliament Elder. Or if you go in the Xenon route, you can get, um, in addition to things like uh, Huntmaster Vikram, you also can get U.S. Saloon Massacre, which you can have in both builds as well. Um, and then Krogar, uh, Burdened Hero, which is one of the biggest cards that we'll see this weekend, appearing in both the Praxis list and in the Xenon list. And uh, it's, a, it's the namesake hero of this month's chapter. Uh, so Krogar, this uh, giant, uh, went on quite a journey for players over this past month, and we'll get to see him in action for the first time on the tournament stage. Right, and Huntmaster Vikram, I think, is really a card to look out for. Zenon was kind of the star of the show, I think, before Unleash was uh, made its debut in Expedition. And if you look at uh, a lot of the core strategies of the format, the Unleash stuff... Individual spot removal has moments of being good against it, but sort of structurally, it's not really what you want to be doing. Against the Argent Poor deck, they have so much card advantage, and it's really risky to sit back on removal spells because Black Book's summon effect will take something out of the hand. You kind of, as far as playing spells goes, you want to be a little bit more proactive if Black Book is a feature of the format. What that means is these decks are kind of light on removal, and for all of the powerful stuff going on in the format, an uncontested Huntmaster Vikram still might be just one of the best things you could possibly do. So that could be an interesting card to kind of to look out for from a metagame perspective, because if people are shaving removal spells out of their deck because of Argent Port, because of Unleash, uh, Huntmaster Vikram could be a star. Yeah, one of the nastiest interactions with Vikram that we'll get to see today is that the typically it's played to steal an enemy unit, and when you do so, you exhaust the enemy unit first, then steal it. Now, if it's an enemy endurance unit, you can't exhaust that unit. So when you steal it, it's up and ready to attack. And the biggest blowouts that you'll see is Solox Blinding Radiance. If you steal that one after it's been pumped up by an Ageless Mentor and it's picked up Killer, you could get off a really sick two-for-one where you steal the dragon and you get to Killer attack. And if, it's, if the enemy unit is large enough, bam, you're just trading them off and now you still have the Vikram left over. Right, Vikram is still very high on the list. Uh, definitely when I was playing the Justice deck, because there's a lot of endurance there. But even with the Felm deck I've been playing, where if you took a snapshot where you said, where, where I would say, oh, I feel like I'm 80 to 85% to win this game. What's happening in the 15 to 20 that I lose? Hummaster Vikram is involved in a lot of them. So I'm uh, curious to see how that card shakes out, even though... It doesn't necessarily play very well with any of the core mechanics in Unleash. You know, it, 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 it itself doesn't have Unleash. It doesn't play particularly well with the Unleash incentives. Um, obviously, it has nothing to do with Frenzy. And so it's kind of out on an island a little bit. But there's still so much power there. And in other Zenin cards that are available, that, that deck could still be part of the show. Yeah, one of the things that's great about Vikram is you can play with it in both controlling strategies where maybe you're trying to... to set up turns where you can steal the unit and then sacrifice it immediately to Inahid's Faithful, the Rat King, those sorts of things. It also works quite well in aggressive game plans. Because you're exhausting that enemy unit, you're getting a hit in with the rest of your units if you've built up a board advantage first. And then if they on their turn, if they just have slow removal to kill the Vikram, that unit you stole is still going to be exhausted because it didn't ready at the start of their turn. And so because of that, you get into this spot where that unit... Ev at a baseline against some against some decks will be locked out for two turns about being able to interact either way. And the Zenon incentives already kind of line up very well with that sort of a game plan. If you look at cards like Nahid's Faithful and Rat King, obviously there's the combo potential of I take your unit with a Vikram, I sacrifice it for profit, and there's no risk of the Vikram getting killed. But also what those cards allow you to do is just have a generally proactive game plan so even if the stars don't align where you line up your Vikram with the Sacrifice Outlet, as you mentioned, those, you know, remove a blocker, now you're kind of two turns off of being able to race, that can be as game-winning of a play as the more flashy Sacrifice your unit and then my Vikram's uh, it, just in the clear. Yep. 
And uh, there is one deck in the field this weekend that is playing with the most recent promo card. I thought I'd just shout that out. We'll see if we see mm. Puk Puka's uh, deck, their Xenon control deck, has four copies of Leave Behind. So it'd be, it'd be, you know, that's a card that only just came out a couple of days ago, but uh, maybe it will make its mark this weekend. It's um, Shizu Silver Hilt. We're seeing it this weekend mm -hmm. in some of the Rakano decks. Uh, it's also showing up in some of the Frenzy decks. It's particularly nice to give um, either Felon Adept that first point of strength with that summon or giving Plunk Overwhelm because even if they were to block and trade with it, you're still getting that hit in and still getting that contract draw to. And even, the, even if they trade as well, you're also getting to draw another card because it was a unit wielding a weapon that died. Yeah, there, it's interesting that a lot of the Felon units, um, uh, as the Adept and Plunk, as you mentioned, but there's a couple others as, as well that are very, very sensitive to getting either one point of strength or getting Overwhelm, given the particulars of the card. And also, if your opponent's compelled to remove those cards because Plunk with Overwhelm is really good or Felon Adept just having a baseline one strength is really good, then you're drawing a card off of uh, uh, off the unit as well. So uh, interesting to see where that one lands. Yeah, and if with Toxic Wisp, which a lot of these decks are playing because, again, you're getting that point of strength. You get that Deadly Overwhelm Wombo where mm -hmm. you're just getting to push damage through, which those decks love with their Lethrite Gambits, their Serpent Squads, their Icicles, Stonebreaker Bows, and then some of them have some top uh, top decked Inferno Phoenixes. And this all sounds very subtle stuff, but when you're playing against the Unleashed stuff, often the inflection point, it's it's the game is not decided by, all right, it's turn six and they did something overwhelming. That is what eventually kills someone, but often the game is that inflection point on turn three or turn four of are you able to force a trade that's not profitable? Are you able to push through an additional point of damage? Are you able to draw one more card off of something? And so even those, even those these exchanges sound pretty subtle, on a tactical level, they're really important to be able to beat some of the decks like the Unleashed decks, like Arch Import, before they're able to uh, present an overwhelming advantage with their five or six cost cards or their flurry of Unleashed units. All right, Tim, how are we looking for getting into a match? Okay, so the round has begun, and as soon as our featured match is ready to go, uh, we'll be jumping down and checking that out. Um, you know, this is going to be uh, seven rounds of action today, Patrick, for the first round. Uh, you see that's top 128, the way that it works. We had over 70 players this weekend qualify with their 10-plus wins in a run. And so because of that, we give buys to the players who had the best records to round out that top 128 field. So a lot of the players this round will actually be off on their buys, um, but that's and then we'll be picking them all up next round to get started. Um, and it's a nice little way of rewarding players who do better than uh, – who do better if you get 12, 13 wins in a run? That's fantastic. You might get a buy to start off Sunday, but it's not an advantage that isn't undone and by speaking, just the first round. Right, and speaking to that prize slide over there, every round matters for the purposes of uh, accumulating more prizes, but it really gets nice for players once they reach the top eight. That's the money round you've locked in cash. Third and fourth place, also important. Not only is it additional money, but if you receive two top fours, in our opens over the season, that qualifies you for Worlds, even if you don't win one of these things outright. All right, so at the bottom of your screen, we've got Roshi. Uh, Roshi brought an Arjun Port Hero of the People deck this weekend. So they've got Hero of the People with Blood Sucking Skeeter, Off Book Officer to potentially give it double damage in Aegis. And it's really nice with Black Book because, you know, Taunt, Warcry, Endurance, just a ton of skills to pile up on that Hero of the People. And, you know, sometimes Black Book can be kind of modest because it's only got the one strength, and so it's a, a slow burn to leverage uh, the taunt aspect. But Hero of the People is picking up stats along the way in the ideal universe, and then getting that huge taunt unit can pretty easily lock someone out. All right, there it is, the blood-sucking Skeeter. So we'll see how Roshi wants to uh, sequence it. Do you just run out the Hero of the People? They're going to sandbag it a bit and get the Skeeter going. So this one can't be uh can't have spells played on it and so this is going to be a tricky one for thighs to deal with looking at their hand i really love this line a lot from roshi it, now it's easy to get hung up on hero of the people and start going wild but since turn three and turn sorry turn four and turn five are already rolled up with being able to play units and playing and, and leveraging your scale swarm patrol there's no reason to risk playing the hero of the people into to open power where it's going to die to a lot of removal or to a slay the following turn. 
maybe the hero of the people doesn't really show up this game. Maybe Roshi has to wait until somewhere down the line where they can make two plays in one turn. But I think that's a really sharp sort of order of operations here. So that first Scale Sworn Patrol and Power got the Blood Sucking Skeeter up to a 3-3. Three, three, and I mean, this is just going to do a ton of work for keeping Roshi's health total high and pecking away at Dayu's. Now Roshi got an interesting decision for this turn. Are they going to play out one of these three drops, or are they just going to sit back and wait? Because uh, you sit back and wait till power number six with Parliament Elder, and you get to have a really nice turn. Yeah, Roshi, combination, not under that much pressure. And also having a sweet burn hand means, well, if Theos plays a ton to the board, then maybe that's your turn. You have turn six rolled up of playing two Parliament Elder, so a little bit of patience here I think is, is called for. All right, so Light Hoof giving the other one unblockable. And for Roshi now, going to hit in with the Skeeter one more time. And now we're going to see our first Unleash card of the weekend played. So Parliament Elder, normally a 2-4, got buffed up by the Scale Sworn Patrol. Flying Unleash, when it hits the enemy player, stun it and play a Justice Sigil from your deck. So a ton of value from that bird. A ton of value, a ton of advantage. And also that extra power here it could be significant to try to set up a turn where uh, Roshi could play Hero of the People and something with some battle skills all in one shot. Through the Unknown is the draw for Roshi. And they're going to hit in with the Elder and the Skeeter. Thais has a Stormhall plating in hand that is one of the cards that can answer Bloodsucking Skeeter. So how can Roshi best get around that? They're going to play Here Are the People and Off-Book Officer. Off-Book Officer, 2-1 double damage, summon. You can either silence an enemy unit or play a 1-1 one, one Aegis. They play that 1-1 one, one Aegis, and that means all of those unit skills will also go on Here Are the People. It's now a 3-3 three, three double damage Aegis. Hidden Garut very nicely pops both the Aegis and could take out the Bloodsucking Skeeter. Hero of the People might be a little bit more pressing here because there's a lot that can go wrong if you allow Roshi to get to their turn with cards in hand and an unchecked Hero of the People. Yeah, and if and if Thayus had dealt with the Bloodsucking Skeeter, uh, Roshi could draw it back from their Void, play it, and I, it might just be game on the spot with the uh, Hero of the People. Yep. All right, so now drawn for Roshi is an Argentport Noble. A lot of signal there from Theos on the last turn by inscribing, because they inscribed a shadow card. The cards that could plausibly be here are eavesdrop or call the hit. Either one of those cards could be useful here. And so by inscribing, it's a lot of signal here that Stormhall plating is the last card in hand. It's interesting to see how Roshi wants to navigate this. All right, so it looks like Thayus is going to get to drop down the Stormhall plating. It's got eight armor, and it's going to first go after the Skeeter. It's going to take it out, and now I imagine we'll see the Parliament Elder drop next. Thayus is very low right now. They are at just uh, effective six with four health and two armor left. We're going to see through the unknown, draw back the Hero of the People. And Thayus is going to need to come up with something else right now as that 3-3 three, three Aegis double damage really threatening right now now it gets lifesteal it's up to 4-4 four, four, thanks to Arjun Port Noble I suppose right now Roshi can't get through I mean ostensibly you know Thyros has a block to make and then we play on Ooh. Yeah, Roshi could have attacked and forced the trade and then the Arjun Port Noble kills the Stormhall plating no, I, I do like sitting back, though, because if you're in the spot where you're basically drawing to any flyer and you have two copies of fall, the Fall of the Spire to sort of reset things if it gets uh, hairy like it is now. Yeah, so Fall of the Spire, new sweeper from Unleashed, kill all units. The enemy player can't play units from their void. Or, sorry, the enemy player and you cannot play cards that are in your void ne until the end of your next turn. So another Stormhall plating. That would just be a clean trade with the Hero of the People. Well, I'm not sure if... Uh, well, okay, we're going to go for it. I thought there was an argument with Roshi sitting on four cards in hand that they 
pretty clearly have, uh, or it's very likely at least that they have a sweeper, and it might be worth trying to push the game a little bit, induce a sweeper, and then have Stormhall playing as a follow-up. But I can also uh, respect just wanting to be a little bit cautious here because there's so many combo kills with an unchecked hero of the people that if you can get off the table, just get off the table. All right, so another fall of the Spire for Roshi. It's going to sweep away all of the Owls and the Minotaur. Mystic Shackles is the draw, so with a couple pieces of interaction in both players' hand, we could be here for a moment. Well, Black Book is going to take out one of them. So Black Book, Pit Enforcer, Summon. The enemy player discards a spell or attachment of your choice from their hand. It's going to get rid of the Mystic Shackles, but call the hit killed in response. And now we'll see another Black Book Pit boss. Taking out one of these Fall of the Spires, it'll be interesting for Roshi if they want to just go for it right away on this Fall. They are. Yeah, I think uh, I think drawing a 4-drop here uh, that's lethal means just, you know, play your hand out here. All right, so now we see a No Blade be picked up. Does that keep them alive? I guess it... I don't believe so. Oh, no, it's Xaxes. Wow. And that was pretty nice that the off-book officer got to get played immediately. You can't play cards on your next turn that share, share cards, names with cards in your void, but that turn you're good to go. Yep. Really uh, interesting sort of grind fest there. <laughs> um, but the hero of the people in the long game forced some trades there that were not profitable. Um, again, some of the best cards in the Argentport Mirror, and uh, Roshi's up a game. Yeah. Yeah, we saw the strength of here of the people there, and uh, it was pretty well uh, navigated by Roshi. They understood the matchup pretty well, where they didn't just run it out hoping that the hand of Slay, Slay, and Shrivel, as we knew, wouldn't have any answers. And went, by the way, of playing it a couple of turns later, where they could play it in the same turn as that off-book officer, they got it with Aegis, and it made it a lot harder for uh, for them to deal with on the other side. Right, and as far as sort of the rhythm against Stormhall plating goes, Hero of the People is a much stronger card later on in the game when that's what the game is about. And Bloodsucking Skeeter is much, much weaker. So all other things being equal, you kind of want to err on the side of play my Skeeter early when it's going to just be pretty hard to kill and get some good trades and whatever, and leave Hero of the People back. So when the game becomes about Stormhall plating, um, you have something that can provide a little bit more lift than the Skeeter can. Yep. All right, so Thayus will be on the play in game number two here. It seems like uh, one of the best cards that they can draw is just Black Book, especially when you look at some of the units on the other side. It makes life a lot harder um, to play things like Off Book Officer if there's a Black Book on the other side. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the Black Book is also just really good at attacking some of the best cards in the matchup, too. Um, often you're stuck with one removal spell in your hand, you can't play profitably, and then Black Book takes it, and then you start grinding these advantages, whether it's the war cry stuff, whether it's facilitating attacks, even uh, picking off some one health units that are here. So, huge All right. card in the matchup. Here we are in game number two. Thayus on the play. They've got Shrivel. they got Black Book, so they're keeping this. Uh, Feroshi with one power to inscribe, thanks to Stormwell Plating. I think they feel like they can get to the to sort of the mid-game. We see blood sucking Skeeter once again, but without the uh, the influence requirements in hand right now to be able to play it. True, they're going to need that second shadow. We'll see if they can get it before turn three. A, a real interesting decision for players is always whether or not they want to throw out that Parliament Elder on turn three. Because it can lead to some of your best draws, but of course. You give up a lot of value if it gets killed before you unleash it. Well, with no additional power in hand and a second Elder in, in hand, I think it's pretty straightforward for uh, Roshi to play it next turn if they don't draw something that really changes the equation. All right. So back to Roshi. Didn't hit the second Shadow. We will see a Parliament Elder get dropped down. There's the unleashed copy that's drawn. It'll get discarded end of turn. All right. Uh, looks like we may have a technical issue here. Any word, Tim, on what we should be expecting?
So I think we're going to take a, a short break here while we kind of sort out our, our tech issues. So stand tight, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, sounds good. All right, we're back here. Um, looks like just a brief little issue here. Black books are squaring off now, and Slay is going to take out this black book. So we're going to have two black books maybe in a second here for Thayus, uh, along with a Lunar Claw, it looks like. And so we're going to see a lot of War Cry triggers. So I will say, Bloodsucking Skeeter looks like it does a fantastic job against black books. Yeah, this is a this is not a bad setup necessarily. I mean, obviously the war cry triggers could become problematic, and uh, Theos is definitely drawing uh, if they could find power number eight to a huge storm hall plating. But uh, it's possible that the uh, Skeeter will be something of a reprieve here. Well, that's got to be a big draw here for Roshi, is they don't have the shadow influence for Naya, but now they can go here are the people plus blood sucking Skeeter. So now they're going to have a four four flying deadly life steal and a two two flying deadly life steal. For Thayus, you could just go for double attack and then nothing remains. Yep, I think that that's a fine play here. I'm a little surprised that Thayus is not playing their uh, power the previous turn. The combination of you have inscribed cards and eight drop cards, so it could maybe muck up playing Stormhall playing on time. Also, Roshi's deck has Zito. Um, I, I would err on the side, I think, of just getting your, your hand empty um, over maybe bluffing something by having a power back in your hand. Yeah. I think Thayus just figured if Thayus attacks with Lunar Claw first onto a Bloodsucking Skeeter, they'll get to draw a card. But I guess this keeps the Lunar Claw up at four armor. Okay, so we're not immediately going to be killing uh, the the world with nothing remains. A little bit of a risk with uh, Black Book and the other me deck. Definitely. So now we'll see Zito come down. It's going to give revenge to both of these Hero of the Peoples. And now that first Hero of the Peoples, 5-5 five, five, Flying Lifesteal Deadly Revenge. The good news for Thayus is Nothing Remains is the best answer to revenge units. It kills them and it gives them Void Bound. So we're going to play on here. And at a certain point, Thayus is going to draw something with a ton, a ton of Warcry procs on it a 15 13 unblockable relic weapon in this hidden garut i don't know if roshi has any minotaur light hoofs this weekend but man they could really use one now yeah it would be an interesting card for them to have in their deck because it doesn't play very well with hero of the people but all right the garut is going to knock roshi down to 19 now, Renai is going to come down end of turn for Thai, who's just going to try to put some pressure on that Relic Weapon. It's going to get slayed. 
So now Roshi's got a fantastic, um, or sorry, rather, Thayus has got a fantastic chance to just win this game just by attacking two more times. 22 armor is a lot to work through. Drop base Roshi down to four. A Minotaur Light Hoof is also lethal if it could connect. Would be surprised if Roshi's got anything in the void for this one. Yeah, I mean, it would have to be their own light hoof. Yeah. Though I think Roshi's mostly uh, skewed playing with that card in units that don't give out battle skills or buffs this right, weekend. Right. Um, just, you know, it's so nice if your units can work together with Hero of the People. And Light Hoof, while it's summon, gives unblockable, uh, it itself not having unblockable means that it doesn't proc Hero of the People. All right, so through the unknown is going to be able to draw Renaya, and Renaya is going to buy Thayu's a turn or Roshi a turn just through chumping here. Light Huff is going to force the trade with the Scale Swarm Patrol. How many turns in a row does Roshi need to draw through the unknown? Hidden. All right, well, Archid Port Noble can silence the Groot, so now it's going to lose unblockable. But Mystic Shackles will take mm. out the Argent Port Noble, and Thayus is going to tie this up at one game apiece. Yeah, Roshi almost wiggled her way back into that one. Okay, so for Thayus, we saw a real nice game plan come together of get a lot of Warcry procs and get them on the right place, and an unblockable Relic Weapon, a great place for them. Yeah, we saw Roshi have some power stumbles there. I mean, we, we missed a couple of turns there, but, you know, the, the, the double shadow requirements alongside a lot of Justice cards and Parliament and Ultra have meant they were a little slow coming out of the gate. Obviously, a lot happened after the fact there, but often those early turns missing something like being able to play Skeeter on turn three rather than Parliament Elder and make your opponent not be able to play a removal spell. Uh, often there's sort of cascading consequences for that sort of stumble early on. Yep, so uh, nicely done by Thayus here. They're going to force a game three against Roshi. For Roshi, uh, I think it'll be a good advantage for them being on the play in this last game because it seems like the way that they're trying to sequence these games is don't play Hero of the People until the same turn as you can play with some other impactful battle skill like Revenge or Aegis, um, something of that nature. All right, so Roshi redrawing. They've got a Zito. They got an Arjun Port Noble, so a nice early curve for them if they can get their influence together. Yeah, Roshi's deck definitely taking some liberties with the influence requirements. <laughs> this is not an easy thing to cobble together. Yep. So we will see a Zito get contracted on turn one. The enemy player must discard a card from their hand. Parliament Elder Nullblade is also, you know, not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. No, definitely not. All right, there's a Nothing Remains. Roshi has found a blood-sucking Skeeter. They'll be able to play that one on next turn if they want. So for Thayu's, uh that eavesdrop will be pretty nice uh, in the game as it goes long if they can play it. Really messes up through the unknown and no blade. So these these void and revenge uh, strategies from Roshi are going to be pretty hard to pull off this game. Yeah, but the eavesdrop might be priced in here to be inscribed. So Thayu's has the sec the third excuse me shadow influence required to play no blade in the first place. So Thayu's is trying to buy themselves some time before they have to commit any of their inscribed cards. Uh, because you might want to play Storm Hall play in this game. You might want to play Eavesdrop this game, but you also might need to inscribe them depending on how the follow-up draws sort of go. All right, so we're going to see Call the Hit get inscribed. That's a tough one. It doesn't kill Bloodsucking Skeeter. It does kill Zito, but not exactly the way that you want to interact with Zito. And so now we'll see. Will Roshi throw out a Bloodsucking Skeeter? 
No, they're just going to hold back. I think they want to maybe get a delay of the land with the Black Book first before doing anything else. Yeah, the, the argument for playing uh, Bloodsucking Skeeter was it would have done a lot of work um, against a turn four Noblade because you would have at least been able to attack back and get rid of it. Now it looks likely that it's going to get a second card here at least in some form or fashion. Another Zito drawn for Roshi, but this is the turn for Black Book. So they're going to get a look at four of the five cards in hand. All of those non-unit cards will be potential choices to be taken. And the standouts, really, nothing remains. It's the only card in hand that can interact quickly with, uh, with Black Book. And so now that Noblade is in a precarious spot, are we going to see a Light Hoof come out to try to protect it? No, be, I, I think you can wait one more turn on that because your no blade going down to one armor versus two is not that significant, and the light hoof might have more value in a in a following turn. So, um, yeah, I, I like playing the eavesdrop here. I think that makes sense. So discard two for Roshi. They're going to get rid of blood sucking Skeeter and the Argent Port Noble, and then the void's going to get stolen. Keeping the Thruly Unknown here is ambitious against a Noblade and Knees Drop. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah, and the Stormhall Plating being inscribed this turn brings the the Noblade up to a 5-2. So when it comes back to Roshi's turn, they'll get to Warcry too. They'll get to peck away at that Relic Weapon. And they drew an Argentport Noble. But... For right now, looks like they might be holding off on playing any of that. Now, a black book on the other side is drawn. Is that a better play than Gift of the Arc Bank? No, because Gift of the Arc Bank gives your weapons plus two, plus one, and your Minotaurs plus two, one. That critically buffs Noblade up to seven strength, and now that kills Black Book, and now Roshi's in a mess of trouble. <laughs> they just drew a negative 4-2 black book. Yeah, not great against these taunt units. I mean, maybe getting the, you know, a sabotage for your efforts is worth it here, but... And the Warcry 2 went onto a Stormhall plating, which will be great, but, man, Roshi is quite a few power away from that. And, you know, there's pros and cons for taking all these lines, but... You know, Roshi just hanging back here on Azito for so many turns, not playing any additional units, has made it. Uh, this Null Blade, instead of just kind of getting rid of a unit or two, has now completely dominated the game. Yeah, and things are going from bad to worse. Black Book just took care of that Stormhall plating. So now Roshi can play Zito, get one of the last cards in hand, but they're going to be dead really fast to this draw. Silencing one of those Minotaurs with Taunt. Black Book is going to taunt one of these units. Um, potentially, yeah, the Argent Port Noble looks like. All right, Black Book. Taunts in the Archiport Noble, forces it to block, it's down, and now we'll see Gift of the Arc Bank buffing up the weapons and the Minotaurs even more. Roshi's got one turn, and they're still paying off contract, so that's going to do it. Thayus takes it down, Gift of the Arc Bank plus Noble takes out Black Book, and that's a hard combo to set up, of course, because Black Book uh, discards a spell or attachment from any player's hand, and so you'll oftentimes be able to see that coming, but... If you if if it gets ripped and it gets assembled in the mid game, man, all of a sudden you've got a seven four relic weapon lines up so nicely against Black Book. Yeah, I think there was a a, a fair bit of you know uh, ostensibly patience trying to be exercised there by Roshi. You know the the opposing draw was a little slow and a little weird, and I think you mentioned kind of wanting to wait until turn five to Black Book kind of see what's going on before deciding what to deploy from there. But uh, that line left Roshi extremely vulnerable to Null Blade. And uh, that Null Blade was played on turn four and was there at the end of the game. Uh, totally dominating presence. All right, Tim, did I hear you right? Was that the end of the round one? All right, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. We'll check out 
uh, our winner's interview with a recent world champion qualifier with Patrick Sullivan. And we'll be back with the start of round two in 10 minutes. Stay tuned and come back for more open action. Coming to you from Denver, Colorado, I am Patrick Sullivan, one of the designers on Eternal, and it is my pleasure to be joined by the recent winner of our Throne Open, Tony Portolan, aka Portich. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Oh, thank you for taking the time. Um, first question I, I always like to ask our players is how they sort of got started with playing Eternal. And then, you know, for obviously players like yourself who have won opens and have acquitted themselves very well in competitive play, if you started from a position of, oh, yeah, I want to play in tournaments, I want to try to qualify for Worlds, or if there was a different progression that got you here. Yeah. So my eternal path, I think, started a couple of years ago. I don't think, I don't remember exactly when, but basically uh, Gurga PM who is a friend uh, and maybe familiar name to Eternal players, uh, invited me to start playing. So we, we met during our Magic times. Uh, so I previously played Magic since high school. And uh, over the years, uh, I kind of stopped due to life, everyday, uh, you know, uh, work. So Eternal made the like a cool switch just because of the digital space where you could play and the uh, mechanics and the design of the gameplay that was improved. So basically that's how my eternal day started a couple of, a couple of years ago. And then, uh, but initially it was always about competitive for me. So yeah, when I started playing Magic, it was casual, but then I progressed to competitive and then I was always looking for a competitive card game where, where I can basically play tournaments, try to qualify for the worlds, because that's what what makes card games uh, uh, alluring to me. So you're talking a little bit about the sort of transition from casual to competitive. Would you say you're sort of by nature a competitive person or was it one of those things where, oh, it actually turns out I'm pretty good at these sort of games and maybe it's uh, worth my time to try to uh, get to the highest levels? I mean, uh, it was a bit of a natural progression that I always liked the feeling of playing at tournaments. So that's the biggest lure for me, you know, that feeling of stress. I mean, it's especially maybe in live tournaments emphasized uh, just before the first round starts before the tournament starts and that's something that I'm, I'm always looking forward so that was my progression i was good at the card games and yeah i think there's like always a learning curve or number of hours you invest initially but yeah i, I had some experience from magic and then initially i, I yeah uh, those type of um thinking games because yeah my other hobbies is basically playing board games so you know it fits all uh together so i have experience in board games where you can you develop strategies and then it transits to card games as well yeah i i totally feel that i for me the experience and it's the same if it's in live or online of it's round one and i'm going second and i'm waiting my for my opponent to play their first card to see like what they're going to be up to or whatever that i mean i've been doing that for like 25 years and i still get the the butterflies waiting for that first card to come down and seeing what they're up to yeah yeah that, that that's the ba that's the feeling why i'm playing card games and especially competitive playing card games so so uh, you mentioned you know uh, eternal as a digital game and some of the design space there was there um an initial card or deck when you first started playing that sort of highlighted to you oh this is like really different there's a very different there's different design space um the possibility space is different and just anything that made it feel like oh wow this is this is a totally new experience yeah i mean for i mean for me like the the i don't dislike maybe card players dislike the mana or system or the influence system in magic and on the land system but i feel that's a huge design space that's basically makes magic and internal what it is and i don't like card games that limit that design space so uh for me one of the like uh sets that's most interesting internal i'm not 
good with names, but the, the set with all the legends with four pips in an influence, six influence pips, four costs. Yep. Yeah, so the redesign of mana system where you can actually have more influence than the actual mana cost is something really interesting. And I mean, the digital aspect where you can, the, like the mechanics like plunder, uh, which, you know, you can make them work in, in, in yeah, but you have so, so digital mechanics that make sense than uh, uh, more than in a card game. So, and uh, last thing, I think the buff system because, or the nerf system of balancing basically the game, uh, which can be done in a more uh, granular way, buffing and nerfing cards is something that I think uh, it's really good. And I think it's something that, for example, magic, would benefit from but it's hard to in a card game to really implement it so so yeah uh, something that I, I come back to a lot when i'm working on on this stuff and I've, I've worked on a variety of of card games over my um professional career is there's a lot of stuff that's fun for three months that's not fun for three years and so you're often like you have in these debates about well we could send this out as like a top 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 card and know for sure it's gonna land and it plays pretty well but there's always that risk of like what if even if this thing plays pretty well what if it's just boring over time and having that sort of release valve in the back pocket means that we can send things out the door the way that we think is going to be fun in the short term without being married to the card in perpetuity which you know as you mentioned is a really nice tool that you you don't get in paper <clears throat> yeah and, and i like your point about plunder there's a lot of things uh, there's a lot of mechanics i describe as like you can do it in paper, but it's really sloppy. And Plunder is a great example of like, yeah, you could kind of do it a little bit, but it would it would not be pleasant.
All right, welcome back, Patrick uh, and viewers. <laughs> we got round two here of the Open, our top thirty, our top sixty-four round, rather. And we're going to be checking out Collector in action with their Praxis deck in just a few minutes. Uh, they've got Exodus, they've got Ageless Mentor, so they're going to be pumping up the jam and and charging in with some big old units. They got Battlefront Dasher, so we'll be looking for some fun action with them in just a bit. Uh, before we get to that, though, let's talk about the Direwolf Digital Summer Sale. And so, as you might know, Eternal's not the only game that we make here. Uh, we do a lot of great board game adaptations. And so we've got a summer sale going on right now through the 7th of July. So you could check this out on Steam. And so 50% off Sagrada, 50% off Raiders of the North Sea, 50% off Yellows and Yangtze, 30% off the Fox in the Forest, and then 50% off Root and its expansion. So there's a ton of great value going on right now. Um, the sale is going on on Steam and Switch right now and just for until the 30th on iOS and Android. And so these are all games that were originally real life physical board games that we worked with. And many of these have won awards for uh, in both their physical incarnations and for the work that the team here has done as a phenomenal team that's really dedicated. In fact, our studio here is built into a, a section of our giant board game library here at Dire Wolf Digital. As you can see, we're surrounded by copies of Clank and Dune. So uh, no bigger board game fans on the planet than those here at Dire Wolf Digital. And so we are absolutely thrilled to continue to bring amazing board game experiences to you. If you've never tried any of our games, or if you haven't tried some of those games on that list, uh, make sure you check out the summer sale going on right now. Particularly the Fox in the Forest. So sick, we could only give you 30% off. <laughs> the rest of them, 50% off, and that, that sale is up and running right now on Steam, so go check it out. And as Andrew mentioned, uh, these are all adaptations of, of, of physical games, um, and I, I think that's really uh, Dire Wolf's like, where are we the best? And it's the combination of we make physical games, we also make digital games, and so we are particularly uh, well-equipped to make adaptations of physical games into digital products. These these games are overwhelmingly well-reviewed, award-winning, either for their physical or uh, digital adaptations or both in some cases. So, uh, and, and most of them are, are very, very simple to get into. So you can over Steam right now and take advantage of 50% of off all of those listings except for the Fox and the Forest. And uh, so f my favorite is Sagrada. Um, Sagrada, love the ability, just getting like a fun, simple, like tile matching game. A um, lot more strategy than you're used to in like some of the ones that you see in like the typical app store. And so uh, it's got a lot more strategic depth than you get from just like those very simple, like, oh, look at this. If you match three, cool things happen. So definitely check out Sagrada. If you're, if you're, I mean, if you play Eternal, you like a good challenge and Sagrada's got, all the fun elements of like a puzzle tile matching game, but with a lot more depth. Yeah, we are, I would say, ideologically committed to making games that are uh, stimulating and engaging and deep rather than uh, having fireworks uh, pop up on the screen and then asking for your credit card number. <laughs> so if that sounds like a thing that you could be into, head over to Steam right now, take advantage of that summer sale. All right, so... We'll be getting started here with Collector in just a minute. Um, one of, it was a pretty fast round one, but I think that's uh, kind of in line with what we've seen from this expedition format where there's not a ton of, I would say, blistering fast aggressive strategies, but all of the decks that I think we're going to see this weekend, with few exceptions, have cards that really can take over the game once they get going. Even something like a 1-7 like Black Book, you let that go for a couple of turns and now you got a 13-11 Hidden Garut coming down at you. Right. I would say Black Book is p kind of the one card uh, that's very heavily played that's like, okay, the game's kind of grinding down a little bit and now it's about something else. But as you mentioned... Uh, if that card's unchecked for a period of time, eventually a storm halt plating or hidden groove or just some large unit is going to take the game over. Um, people do attack in the format, but there is a lack of quality critical mass uh, one drops. Uh, Battlefront Dasher is definitely the one doing the most heavy lifting, and uh, the collector has gotten the memo about that as we see turn number one. All right, so Collector coming in with that 3-2 charge, and now Scuffle on the other side is looking to be playing... Another Arjunport mid-range control list, you know, definitely slowing things down with these Hidden Garoots and Mystic Shackles and Nothing Remains. But Collector, they got some nice options uh, if that if it goes that way. Inferno Phoenix is probably the best follow-up to a sweeper in the format. 
So we will see the Hidden Guru take out the Battlefront Dasher. And now for Collector, they're missing on Power Drops here. So they're going to go ahead and inscribe that Exodus. Will we see Waystone Igniter? We will. And it's going to get contracted to become a 4-3. Definitely a, a liability if you make it uh, make a couple of X ones against a Black Book. Uh, yeah, and also uh, Augmentation, pretty punishing there. Uh, as we know, there's not really a good answer here, as Mystical Shackles and Nothing Remains also strong against the 4-3 version. Uh, but I think the Collector is right that the 4-3 has the best chance of doing something. All right, so Scuffle may be deciding on what they want to do here. They actually elect to not play anything, so maybe hoping to lull in a little bit more interaction or a little bit more presence to the board first. And they're just going to shrink it down to a 3-2. If they get a stolen augmentation off their stolen augmentation, Collector's going to play into it, though. They're going to throw out another Waystone Igniter, make another 4-3. And for Scuffle, is this a juicy enough board for a Nothing Remains? Yep. You would play stolen augmentation there under two circumstances. Your hand's extremely bad, or your hand's extremely good. And Scuffles is the latter. <laughs> All right, so now Scuffle drawing another Stolen Augmentation. They're going to get the throw down to Gift of the Auric Bank, and that was one of the reasons why they wanted to kind of set up to get the Sweeper out of their hand, is now with Mystic Shackles still in hand, you're much better set up to deal with the aftermath of a, of a Sweeper. All right, so no plays from Collector. They could have fired off some Searing Fist at these Minotaurs. But instead, we're going to see Scuffle attack in for six. Yeah, I think the argument there for hanging back on the Searing Fist is that if you play Riva, that you're going to be able to sort of rebate your power and be able to play them anyway. So Scuffle is could use a Stolen Limitation to keep this Minotaur alive, Patrick. Love it. Yeah, and we're going to see that. Shrink down Riva to a 1-4. I mean, this is a catastrophe for the Collector, too, because now all that you're getting on the way back is one power, and I think this play was sort of predicated on the notion that worse comes to worse, I get two power on the way back, I can cast a Searing Fist. Now the, the turn's basically burnt off, and um, the Collector is under a ton of pressure. So Scuffle going to be attacking in with the Minotaur Muscles in a moment. 4-3 three, and 3-2 three, Taunts. And will we see a Black Book follow up? Mm. Uh, it's a 3. Yeah, okay. I was into the Spirit Drain, uh, an even <laughs> mid Superstar. But, uh, yeah, I think Black Book's probably better this turn. All right, so Black Book comes down, gets rid of one of those Searing Fists. And now Collector missing the second time influence. Not going to be able to play either Solux or... Or Krogar. Inferno Phoenix is going to come down. Drop Scuffle down to seven. And you really got to think about how you want to play this if you're Scuffle. Because Stolana... All right. So we're going to see Mystical Shackles take out the Inferno Phoenix. That means there's some really... Um, oh, well, right. The Silence first from the Shackle stops the Inferno Phoenix in Tomb. Now Collector is just going to have to block one of these Minotaurs. We didn't see Stolen Augmentation there. Scuffle just, I assume, is wanting to leave that up for a potential follow-up Inferno Phoenix. Right. Yeah, no reason to do it. Uh, also, if something very weird happens, you just get a blind invoke, too. So, so Sindane Arcanum... Curator comes down. Riva's going to try to attack to gain some power here. Does Scuffle want to stop this? I don't see why not. I mean, it, there's what can Collector? I guess what can Collector play with one power? It's Waystone Igniter, and you have um, yeah. It doesn't really matter. It's all all right. <laughs> so Scuffle <laughs> takes down game number one here. Uh, so the Praxis deck, we saw the inability of them to get out to those five drops in a timely manner. Uh, one thing about the Praxis deck this weekend that I noticed is kind of they're not playing a lot in the way to, of ways to jump up the curve. You don't see a ton of things like Praxis Adepts 
or endangered Kirins or apprentice mages, things that could allow you to play those five drops sooner. So when they stumble for a turn or two there, um, it really sets back their game plan. Right. Uh, you're sort of leaning on the fact that you have enough interaction to just buy time to naturally make your power drops. And Sedane is a star for the thing that you're talking about mm. because it's just more resources. And if it happens to go unchecked, you're getting all these power bursts and then everything's going smoothly. But you are right that there are units that you could play a deck like this to try to accelerate your power. And I think Collector is eschewing this in part because of Ageless Mentor that we see in their opening hand. Uh, Ageless Mentor and the uh, power accelerating units don't play that well together. So you kind of have to pick between one or the other. And the Collector is gone with Ageless Mentor. Yeah, a bunch of players are playing with Biding Time this weekend as a way to ensure that they don't die um, because it just it's also nice that that's a fast piece of interaction. Yeah, and it also has some backdoor combo potential with some of your own units too if the game happens to go that way. Definitely. All right, so are we gonna? Is it Ageless Mentor time? No, we're gonna waste on Igniter first. So potentially trying to bait out some interaction by getting down this four-three threat. I suppose there's no rush for Collector right now. Is there still two power away from getting to any of these five drops, Patrick? Yeah, all other things being equal, one, uh, it's better. It, it's more likely to be able to interact with a Relic weapon. And two, you give yourself an additional draw step to potentially draw another five strength unit. <laughs> or five uh, cost unit, rather. Excuse me. Yeah. So a very, a very juicy hand right now for Collector. But if they don't get to play those five drops, they're going to be in trouble. I mean, the hand's good against Black Book, I'll say that. <laughs> Another Inferno <laughs> Phoenix is drawn. Six five drops now for Scuffle. Here's Black Book. Krogar is a really nice answer for it. The seventh five, five, five drop. Come on. We're not laughing at you, Collector. We're laughing with you as uh, this, is, this has gone from being unfortunate to comical, I would say. You know what we call a collector's hand in the business? What do we call it? Heavy. It is That's heavy. That's a heavy holding right there. <laughs> heavy, <laughs> heavy hand. Uh, I do love doing this, I gotta say. Ooh. <laughs> Enough power to pay off the contract all in one shot. That's not bad. Yeah, if you make it a 4-3, it can both stop the Lunar Claw and stop the Black Book. Is this enough for a slay from Scuffle? Yeah, it's it's right on the line of, like, ugh, whatever. I, it, it, what Scuffle's in right now is the spot of, like, I probably can't lose, but it's really embarrassing if I do. So I should actually think about this pretty hard. Ooh, a four drop. That was That's what we call a bridge. <laughs> we can bridge over to the next turn here. <laughs> Max hand size is uh, 10, so we're, we're, yeah, still, we're, we're still good for now. Yeah. Do we have an achievement like like lose with 60 uh power worth of units in your hand? I guess we'll find out or collector will find out. 15 19 26 29 32 37. <laughs> they got work for it. If they draw an ageless mentor though, if they had drawn an ageless mentor that's 8 times 2. That would only get them up to 53. Ooh, that, 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 <laughs> that's some weight in it, you know? A lot of people, I want to emphasize, a lot of people got 10 wins this weekend with a Praxis deck that looked like that. Oh, I know. I'm not, you know, that's just part of the range or whatever. Yeah. You know, that, that also, that hand might very well be set aside power for a second. If you had to add up the most shift stone anyone has ever had in their hand, that might have been the hand. That was like a, that was like a 30k tab right there. Yeah. <laughs> we got another match? Tim, where are we at? <laughs> All right. We'll check out another match here in a moment. Um, I, I just – not much to say about that one. Oh, I have a lot to say about it. It's just not that interesting right now. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get a first look at one of our FPS decks. Uh, D-Dub was our top-ranked player after the – uh, after the first uh, runs of the weekend. And so I assume they got either like 13 or 14 wins. Um, Black Book is putting a number on this hand, though. Yeah, I've been here. 
I have been here. This is not. This is not. The, these are not the cards you want against Black Book. But that one is. So, oh, that was a great draw. Yeah, Inferno Phoenix, one of the best cards you can have against Black Book. Not directly, but sort of about making the game about something else. Mm. So we're gonna see Gift of the Arc Bank. Black Book's coming in for three. At some point, D-Dub can use Stonebreaker Bow to push a little damage. <laughs> right. Actually, the, the Minotaurs are weirdly useful in terms of uh, burning out here because um, you can go ahead and do this. You have a Lethride Gambit that now, you know, you can play and gain a little bit of health. So the uh, the Gift of the Orc Bank, uh, a little helpful for D-Dub here. Yeah. I mean, uh, Minotaur Lighthoof is not going to do the trick. I think D-Dub's got this one, Patrick. And with D-Dub up a game, looks like they're going to be moving on to our top 32. So coming off their bye to start the day, they are uh, well on their way. Yeah, go ahead and give that Inferno Phoenix unblockable. Just one more skill. It has three. Well, yeah. now it has four. Right. Left, right, Gambit. Stun and deal three damage. If the unit was attacking, you gain three health. Fantastic job there from D-Dub, showing off uh, FPS Frenzy. So, yeah, that deck's really strong at just continuing to push damage. Though the Argent Port deck, I will say, um, has some nice tools to gain some health back if you want to. If you want, you can play with Black Maw Carnosaur. But we'll see Lunar Claws, Storm Hall Platings, um, generally gaining armor, a pretty good uh, strategy against these FPS decks. But first of all, you got to make sure you contain the Flyers. And, uh, you know, sometimes we'll see Renaya's in the Arjun Port decks. As we've seen this weekend, the five-drop slot, heavily contested by many of these decks. <laughs> and some people have answered with play all of them, as we've seen. Although one yeah. of them is no longer in the tournament. Um, yeah, I think flying is a really important tool against these Arjun Port decks. Uh, Plunk can be that. Now, Plunk lines up very, very poorly against Lunar Claw if you're going second. So it's not like that card is just a panacea in the matchup. But ways of accruing uh, advantages early and then flyers, particularly Inferno Phoenix, pretty solid recipe against Arjaport. It's not for sure going to get the job done. But once they start doing Gift of the Ore Bank and, and Black Book, it's really hard to make any progress on the ground. That's typically shut off. And so you have uh, spells or unblockable effects that can go directly at the player or flying units can be very good there as well. All right. So we ready to jump into our next one? All right. Let's see what we got. So, Phoenix, with that lovely Inferno Phoenix avatar from their spot in the World Championship, up against Paradox, who's playing just a s straight Stone Scar aggro build, Display of Passion in hand. What's the, uh, oh, the Arjaport Soldier's got to be from the Shackles. I've never, just never seen it get destroyed before. <laughs> you got to play with that Barbarian Gorilla. Right, yeah, yeah. I was like, where, where did that come from? Oh, right. It's the first time I've ever seen that card get blown up. So there you go. Yep. So uh, for Phoenix, they're playing, as I mentioned, uh, the straight sort of um, just two-faction build. Um, saw all of the displays this weekend in players' decks. Display of Passion on display there. Um, we'll see there's a little bit of Display of Realities floating around. Heavy Primal Strategies. Display of Survival, a great one to take advantage of. Particularly a good answer to some of the relics that are going around. Mm -hmm. Very nice against Stormwall Plating. Stormwall Plating goes from being a 6 8 to a Scaly Gron. And so it can block, but it's kind of confusing as to whether which is better there. Yeah, exactly. It kind of cuts both ways. Are there any display of laws out there? That's my jam. Yeah. Saw a few people playing with display of law plus resonance wave. I know you like mm. that combo. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I play a lot of Mono Justice. Um, the biggest issue with display of law and expedition, in my experience, is almost all of the marquee units have at least one battle skill. It doesn't kill a lot of stuff. The stuff it does kill. Extremely important. Scale Swarm Patrol, that's a big one. And Hotmaster Vikram, if they're taking something. Um, so, And those are two of the cards that are the best against you. But most of what the card is about is setting up these sort of combo kill flourishes with cards like Helena, Furious Magnaventress, Resonance Wave, as you mentioned. Um, the ramp effect can be nice, too, especially for getting to things like Stormhall Plating. But um, the double damage mode, I have found, is the thing that comes up the most. All right. So for Phoenix, they – oh, I'm sorry. Did we misunderstand? Was Phoenix up a game there? Are we heading to a game three? Oh, okay. So maybe, a, you know, we got PX names. We, so. didn't, we did not – we didn't miss uh, – well, whatever. 
it's not important. We'll, we can we, we can didn't miss any out. action. We can air this out after. We're gonna get to see another game of break. action. I wonder what's going on in that JPS deck. Um, JPS is definitely a fact three faction combination where when I see it, I'm always like, wait, why are you doing that in expedition? Not right. you know. There's sometimes good answers, but I'm always confused. <laughs> oh, it's always I once I, I'm always sort of underwhelmed when the mystery is revealed to me. It's like, oh, okay, you're playing Argent Port, splashing Wisdom of the Elders. Now I understand what your deck is. Yeah, influence is very easy. You don't have to worry about it. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's there's never any cost to not being able to play your cards on time. That's like trading card game 101. Just play it whenever you get around to it, you know? Tinker Unionist. <laughs> Taunt Warcry 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, this this is this card's my jam. Love this one. Really good with Hour of Kodash for those of for uh, all, all you other uh mono justice fans of ex in expedition like I am. Why wouldn't they be? Because it's a relic and you can also give a taunt unit plus three plus three and it works with Furious Magna Ventress. Bless the wild? Ones. Ooh. Yeah, plus th yeah, that's another great Argent. That's another great Argent board splash. Yeah. Hashtag blessed. Well, uh, bless the wild is actually kind of sweet with uh, Tinker Unionist. You talk me into that. That's a nice card to protect, and um, also a nice card to pump. <laughs> All right, so Stonebreaker Bow is going to take out the Parliament Elder. Phoenix is going to Warcry in once again. So we got plus two, plus two to the top unit of the, or weapon of the deck right now. And Paradox is getting closer to getting out one of these Rivas, but still another power away. Maybe we'll see that Jiring Yeti get inscribed. We will. So no other plays this turn for Paradox. You know, people talk a lot about, like, just broadly pessimism in the public space and in the public discourse. And here's Phoenix playing with Stormhall plating in their three-faction deck. Yeah. Don't, tell, don't tell me that optimism is dead. Look, they're getting two armor. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just it's really awkward when your inscribed <laughs> card that is very speculative to play in a game picks up the uh, the war cry buffs. <laughs> that is tough. Oh yeah, uh, that uh, you know. Again, the evolution of Mono Justice was not just for the sake of doing it. It was all these interactions coming up once and me going, never again. Wow, look at this. Hashtag blessed for the Tinker Unionists. Mm -hmm. Getting it up to three three range, and now maybe a call to hit will take out the Riva and. Uh, the Union and Eternal remain strong. Yep. More blessings. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. Oh yeah. That's a that's a line from that from that song. Now Sill's stronghold. Victimless crime, kill an enemy non hero unit. On way up. But once again, the Tinker Unionist has been blessed. Mm -hmm. Battlefront Dasher coming in, getting the buff from the Stronghold. When you attack with just one unit, it gets plus two strength and overwhelm this turn. And now the Unionist will take out Sill's Stronghold. And uh, this little game of Protect the Tinker has been working out for Phoenix. At some point, we're going to draw something really big with with all these Warcry buffs and maybe even be able to play it. All, yeah, almost certainly a card with Inscribe. <laughs> I think the idea will be Parliament Elder right now. Yeah, Parliament Elder would be a nice one. All right, here's Reva. Here's Battlefront Dasher. And now we got Display O Passion up. Gonna inscribe another jeering yeti. Look at that big old toxic wisp. Six seven. It's not bad. No. Playable, you know. Eminently. I think for Phoenix, the just the question is, where do you want all these buffs to get? Because you, with Lunar Claw, you're able to maybe remove a blocker. The Toxic Wisp taunt the buffs from Blessing Wild. You, you might be able to finish this game off in just two turns, but you're going to need to be careful about how you sequence all of this. Yeah, my intuition here is that the Wisp bonus is better on the Unionist. One, because 
it spreads out your stats a little bit more. And two, it just blocks Paradox out of blocking for the entire game. And you get the point up front, so all other things being equal, that's the way to do it. Um, but, you know, depending on sort of the uh, granular elements of Paradox list, maybe it's supposed to go the other way. So Display of Passion is going to go on Reva, and this game... Oh, that's Is that lethal? That's a, I mean, it's a ton. It's a lot. So you're up to 11. So we can play Soulfire three times. Yeah, you just lock up the ground with this, and then your Soulfire is ready for next turn. That makes sense. So the Barbarian Gorillas, or Gorillas. Three of them come down thanks to Unleash. For Phoenix, they can make an attack here and do a little bit of trading. The problem is even Lunar Claw right now can't really effectively lock out Soulfire thanks to Reva. Right, and it's also not even worth another turn because the Reva gets Paradox up to 12 power and then that's 12 damage coming back. Yeah, the only way that... um. Phoenix would get out of this is if the first Soulfire was played on a unit, then you could bless the wild to negate it, and it wouldn't get they wouldn't get the unleash copies. But that is not going to happen. Phoenix is going to be very close to finishing this one off. They're going to play out Lunar Claw, take out a Barbarian Gorilla, and as it stands, they would be alive as it's only ten coming across, and they're at an effective twelve. But we're going to see Soulfire do its thing. Only you're going to need the first copy. Bless the Wild close to being the negate that Phoenix needed, but doesn't really do no. it. So, Phoenix is, takes it down. Or, sorry, rather, Paradox takes it down with their Stone Scar uh, build of aggro. And, uh, yeah, kind of a different looking Stone Scar deck than we're seeing. You know, it's got the, some of those explosive unleash elements in the mid game. Yeah, but it's not really hubbed around trying to reduce the cost. It's just these cards are more or less fine to play sort of as they are. Um, obviously, the deck is pr capable of producing some bursty power sequences with Riva and some pump effects, but it's not really an Unleashed deck as such, but those Unleashed cards were spectacular that game all the same. All right. Where are we at, Tim? Is that it for the round? No, we got more matches coming your way, so as soon as we got the next one, we'll be heading down. All right, we got WSG Ron. Up against Gozu. Congratulations to Gozu. We understand, uh, you know, not the most reliable source, but Twitch chat earlier was telling us birth of a child this weekend. So Yeah, if, to, if Twitch chat is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, talk about hitching your wagon. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, Lunar Claw is going to come down, and then we're going to see Saloon Massacre. But uh, Gozu's got some uh, heavies in reserve. We're going to see Krogar gain some health. <laughs> Saloon Massacre plus the Lunar Claw could take out this Krogar. Yeah, not even hard. It's not even, it's not even hard. <laughs> and uh, Gozu is down a game to WSG Ron. All right, here we go. The Rat King with WSG Ron at 7. The Hidden Garut's going to take out the Rat King. They're down to five. Evelina, Valley Champion, off the top. Charge. Ties it up. One game apiece. All right, Gozu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recent uh, winner of an Open qualified for the World Championships. Uh, got to do an interview with them recently. I don't know if it's ready or not, but, you know, I did it. It's just me bragging, basically. Uh, and uh, as we uh, have heard from Twitch chat, in addition to the family, so congratulations. Yeah, assuming that's true. Assuming assuming Twitch chat can be trusted in 2022. Mm -hmm. If they can, who can? All right. Uh, I love Evelina in uh, in time decks. I find it's one of the best cards that helps you um, turn the matchup against a control deck. In particular, I mean, you see there, like even if um, Gozu hadn't straight won the game. I mean, getting another threat that's hitting for four immediately and drawing you a 5-5 five, five dinosaur on just that first turn. 4-3, maybe not the perfect size when you're up against somebody who's faster than you, but man, in a game that goes long, it does a ton. Right, and the floor is pretty high, too, because man, these, these the power bases of these decks, just, just uh -oh. do, they just do anything. 
<laughs> so the last hand didn't have any shadow. This one's got display of will, so it was a good redraw. Yeah, Parliament Elder uh, display of will. Did we have that one in testing? Uh, <laughs> no, no, you know, no, co no comment. Okay. All right, so a nice little turn one Waystone Igniter for Gozo gives them a 4-3 beatdown. I mean, Waystone Igniter is just a, one of the best time one drops we've ever seen, and when it's both got great long game flexibility, but when, when you just drop it down on turn one and there isn't very cheap removal or blockers, it just hits so hard. Yep, and a lot of these matchups are about sort of just grinding these small advantages over time, but... Um, uh, Waystone Igniter can provide this different dimension where suddenly you're under... Uh, a lot of pressure and cards like Evelina Hunt and Huntmaster Vikram now take on a different dimension too. So it's only one slot in the deck. You obviously don't draw out every game, and sometimes you still want to play kind of a controlling game with it. But the times where it shows up, uh, it, it can look a lot like this, where uh, WSG Ron just doesn't have a lot of defense against this sort of opening. So Gozu dropped the field medic into last turn. It hits for three, and now we'll see Evelina inscribed. And are we going to see more pressure come down? I mean, the, the Slay would suggest that there's not a sweeper or at least not one that WSG Rod wants to play. So I like following up here. Um, saying go just seems so modest here. So Gozu's going to go for the Spiteling. It's a better hedge against the potential sweeper. And with a Huntmaster Vikram in hand, it feels like you can manage any larger blockers on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely a tricky spot here for WSG Ron. They're going to go for maybe a looks like a Lunar Claw. And it's going to take out the Field Medic. So shrinks the board a little bit. They're really trying to give the impression that they have a Sweeper right now. Yeah, but it's, it's just not uh, believable because you probably would have seen it. I mean, the, the turn with the Slay was sort of the giveaway. Right. At that point... Uh, I mean, maybe there's some chance that's what's going on, but I think Gozu, not that Gozu's done anything particularly aggressive or risky, but um, is definitely not bending over backwards to try to play around a potential sweeper. I'll say that much. All right, so we're going to see Hidden Guru take out the Waystone Igniter, and then I, it looks like Display of Will here is ready to go against Vikram, but a follow-up Vikram, another 5-3 charge. And uh, Gozu's going to take this down. So this scene and deck is a really, really strong choice. I mean, the ability for that deck to both have units like the Rat King, Field Medic, and Krogar, which can give you some good buffers against very aggressive strategies. Um, but then Huntmaster Vikram's ability to just get charged. And I love pairing it with Through the Unknown, because if you ever get to draw it back once it has charge, it might get a second burst of plus three strength, or it could remove a blocker. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, in a match, when a deck like Argentport, when you're playing against another mid-range unit deck, you're sort of, uh, broadly speaking, your game plan is, okay, well, I have some spot removal to pick off the clean, the, the, the early stuff, or the individually good stuff. If things get out of control, I have sweepers to reset. And then I have my own big stuff that's either hard to kill or generates an advantage no matter what happens. And on Master Vikram really does a number on that sort of paradigm because you can't really stabilize very easily with just a single unit. Um, spot removal doesn't necessarily work because the deck can set up sacrifice sequences that totally get out from under it. And then the last thing that you mentioned is if you're not playing to the board at all, if you're only playing removal, playing Vikram with charge and then the ability to get it back is just, you know, it's one more dimension. It's, it's hard to play around all of it at the same time. All right. So how are we looking for matches? All right. We got one more still out in the field. Evericed versus DQD AW Goo. The, the, these players not doing us any favors and yeah. making this easy to pronounce. Mm -hmm. And we're all tied up in games at one apiece. So this is the decider, Patrick. And for Everest, looks like it'll be a very um, important decision about when to drop this Nothing Remains this game. This board is, you're definitely behind right now, but maybe not so far behind that you're going to get enough value if you just drop it. I mean, you can just attack and see where it goes. You know, you might get another card for your trouble. That would be ideal. 
So, I'm, but impending doom is just going to take it safe. Is going to block the Parliament Elder. Everest is very close to setting up a win here with uh, with Stormhall plating. But man, Evelina and Field Medic are great follow-ups. So we'll see Evelina com come down. Drops Everest down to 18. Now we're going to get to draw a Rhinarch, 5-5 five, five, a Rome Dinosaur. Do you take a turn off here to Magnaventris? Nope, let's go to the plating. So we're going to see Field Medic, I assume, save on the first attack. Well, maybe on the second one. We'll see. All right. So now Field Medic comes down and vulnerable to damage. And then it's going to get to finish off the uh, the plating on this next attack. So... Pretty juicy. Yeah, and with Vikram as a leftover here against only Mind of Ventress, very good spot for Zenon. Right. Now, the game's not over because a top deck sweeper would be could be enough to pull Everace back, but they're running out of times where they can have bad draws. And I think it might literally be this if they brick on their next one, they might be dead. Well, they're going to go down to 14. It's pretty close. I guess it's only 13 on board, Patrick, so... Yeah, there's still potentially a draw, a sweeper into... I mean, not impossible, I guess, is where we're at. Gift of the Auric Bank. Not going to be enough for Everest. DQD... Gets it done. They advance to our top 32. So a strong showing this round from Zine. And, um, and we'll see if they have what it takes against the Praxis decks maybe. Or the Frenzy decks next. But against uh, against the controlling strategies. Looked great with uh, how Evelina and those ambush units like Field Medic and Vic were more able to handle things. You know they play a really multi-dimensional game on the table. Um, they have a lot of response to taunt units. Um, they have a lot of ways to like just sort of blow out uh, contested or neutral or sort of choppy boards. And um, that's what the game against Arjaport is going to look like. So it's looked very, very strong against Arjaport. Hopefully we'll get an opportunity to see how it looks against the rest of the field. All right. Another great round. All right. We'll be back with our top 32 in 10 minutes. See you then. So, uh, were you sort of playing in our uh, opens kind of from basically the point where they started or were you not quite on that competitive arc yet? So when I started playing Eternal, I mean, there was like a month where I needed to play a bit more just to get the cards necessary to actually participate in tournaments. But from the start, I, I tried to uh, qualify for the open through ladder uh, and then play... play um, in the I, I can't remember I think my first one was like three year three years ago and then I I think I played like two that I didn't day two so the first two I didn't uh, day two and after that I think I day two like ninety five percent of them which I played yeah so, I remember I remember knowing your name so <laughs> it's been yeah. around the block for a few times for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I think I had like, uh, previously, I, I think I had two chances to qualify for the Worlds, and this was my third chance. So I was really happy that I finally managed because, yeah. Um, so I mentioned Gurga PM. So we have a clan, small clan called, um, we, the abbreviation is, is stand CSB. Which means consistently second best because we cannot qualify for. <laughs> yeah, it's basically Zach, Hill, Gerga, and myself and a couple of other guys. So we had this curse of not qualifying for a tournament. Zach is a long time friend of mine. So yeah, I, 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 I've heard some stories. Are you going to have to change the team name now, though? Yeah, or they're going to have a council. Should I be kicked out? Or we'll see at the end of the season. <laughs> 
Awesome. So yeah. uh, pivoting to pivoting to the tournament a little bit, what was your um, testing process like? Were were you sort of locked in on Xenon Reanimator ahead of time, or was it closer to like a last minute decision? Uh, it was definitely a last minute decision. So I I, I actually prefer Expedition uh, to Throne just for the card pool, but due to the changes you guys put in the couple of past months, so the pool changed in the throne a bit so there was i would say uh uncertainties or or some of the strategy that have been changed a bit so yeah so i prefer smaller card pools just because there's i think there's more uh longer turns longer games uh just because of the slightly nerfed power of the cards so for me throne is never a uh, an amazing, uh, I'm not really amazing at, uh, at that uh, environment. So I was testing actually a couple of new decks uh, a week, like two weeks ago. Uh, I had Kira as my backup plan, but Kira has been nerfed uh, uh, a couple of times. So I was looking at the community tournament and the list from there to understand the, the feeling of the meta game. And we have a clan, so we discussed a bit what, what seems to be the meta game. Uh, so we understood there's an aggro and a mid range, and the actually uh, a teammate Lion Tonsin actually built a reanimator list with the new cards. So there was some of the adjustments from the previous lists. Uh, so, for example, Brand Insight was a new card, as well as the uh, Xen and Tome, which also made the deck tick a little better. And additionally, there were some cards from previous set, like Fear, that we recognized as the potential uh, players. And yeah, so I decided to gamble a bit because uh, I played in a couple of tournaments when I play, let's say, a level one deck, uh, the best deck, and you don't really have an edge maybe in that metagame. So I decided to maybe plan, uh, play something different like Reanimator, which has a, like more loop sided matchups. Like, you know, you will not probably beat aggro consistently, but you still have a game plan against aggro, but you'll basically prey on the mid range decks that prey on the aggro. And then that was my plan for the tournament. So something that really struck me about your list watching it in action was um, it was capable of playing both short and long. Um, as you mentioned, against someone who's uh, playing an aggressive deck, maybe that matchup's not great, but like you can just rush to dump as many things into your void and, and mark it up a grasp as soon as possible. It's a coherent game plan. And then against the bigger, slower decks, you can actually start just playing the stuff out of your hand if the game goes on a little bit longer. Um, was there any particular... I know you mentioned aggro as not being a great matchup. Was there any particular matchup or individual card even that you were really worried about? Or uh, was it really just, I hope to avoid aggro and as long as I'm playing against mid-range strategies, I should be fine? I mean, so so I think Reanimator has its own game plan. So you, you, you know how to mulligan. I mean, it depends. So definitely a day two open deck list helps a bit, but you consistently know how to mulligan with a deck because you know which hands you're looking for, which have your own game plan. Uh, but you don't have that many interactions, so you can interact. So you 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 try to get the turn for you know, board presence in a way to uh, Katra or to Xen and Hourglass. So Arc and Hourglass, so yeah. And uh, so, I mean, there's cards like, uh, there, I don't think there's a single card that was problematic, but more if the, 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 if there's a couple of cards in the list, for example, like a mid-range deck, like Argentport could have a couple of Null Blades, a couple of uh, um, the Valkyries that have the Gable on them. So the mm -hmm. two drop. So if they have enough hate cards, it could be problematic. That was one uh take i think control pure control like horror control is not a good matchup uh for the deck because they can basically if especially if they have like eight rats or something like that but i didn't think uh who was in a good spot for the tournament and then aggro like cards like sill uh which basically would uh, have 10 damage to you if you cast any of the spells from the <laughs> market. I, I actually at day one, I went 10 4, and my last match was against also a known player, and I had to cast the 
I survived at I think two life and then a couple of turns later <laughs> Kacha gave me 20 but yeah so like those those cards like still is problematic because if you don't have that game plan of going uh, with Kacha just playing units and you rely on the graveyard or you rely, rely on the mass removal you're in a problem or world of hurt so did it come up when your team was testing about I think that reanimator is better in this tournament than maybe it would be on the ladder because once you have open deck lists, uh, your mulligan decision for a deck that like yours, where like, as you mentioned, there's so much pressure on having the right cards, the right matchup, the mulligans is a lot of what's going on there. How much of an advantage you get just having your opponent's deck list? I, I, again, I think it has some influence, but I think Reanimator has its own uh, proactive game plan, so it's not maybe emphasized as much for some other decks. But I do think a day two meta game is more uh, like uh, more advantageous for decks like Reanimator because usually there's more aggro in, especially on ladder. I believe because people want to rank as fast as possible, they'll play uh, Yetis or they play some other aggro list like Stone Scar. And then for the tournament, I mean, I, from my, like, I try to remember how many uh, opens have been won by pre-or aggro decks, and it's not as much, I think. Uh, there's the meta games where aggro really shines, but usually, uh, Yetis are, I think I can remember a couple of tournaments won by Yetis and, and like, uh, fire aggros, but yeah. So I do tend to avoid those type of decks uh in the i'm more a controller mid-range player so yeah uh i think reanimator definitely has a better just because of the expected meta game we expected a lot of of uh winchester uh, mid-range and uh yeah but and we also expected maybe that some of the other teams would break the new unleash cards and have something like uh, eclipse combo deck which also has a huge board presence and again, that reanimator can uh, raise that board present and or have an even bigger board present than them uh, with the uh, reanimating Icarius and stuff like that. All right, top 32 here at the Open. Andrew Beckstrom and Patrick Sullivan back for another round of action. And, uh, you know, we've gotten to see all all kinds of things go wrong with uh, with the practice deck so far. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see a good game from them this round, I bet. Maybe. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, multidimensional how... Uh... You say that whenever you want to sound smart. And it's because you are well, smart. Well, you know, it's... Everything that's good is the good in the same way, and everything that's bad is bad in its own unique way. <laughs> that's that's the draws that we've seen. <laughs> and what did what what did the other fortune cookie say last night? Uh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> All right. Little little feisty Bradyquotes here this morning. com. Check it out. You can find all your Brady quotes there. <laughs> all right. So when we get started here with our top 32, uh, these players are now just uh, five wins away from getting to that coveted spot in the world championships, you know, but for, you know, just even just winning a tournament is a huge accomplishment. Lots of successful card game players throughout the years have never won a tournament. Mm -hmm. I took, and so if you ever can be that last person standing, it's fantastic. And, for we'll see if one of our next two competitors can be that person, but only one of them is going to merge out of this round. We're going to be checking out Trogdor and Sir Jordy. Uh, were you a Homestar Runner fan back in the day? So I was definitely in the right place at the right time in terms of sort of age and uh, as a part of the cultural zeitgeist. I found some of it to be amusing, but it wasn't. I wasn't like into it like that. You know yeah. what I mean? How about yourself? That must have come out. Yeah, I mean, I was in, like, sixth grade when I first encountered it. And if you're talking about, like, a sweet spot for 
for that. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the greatest dragons of all time, Trogdor the Burninator. So mm -hmm. we'll see them in action in just a moment. Uh, t uh, do you remember, Tim, what, uh, what deck Trogdor is on? I sent it to you earlier. If you have it in front of you. Yeah, don't worry about it. But we'll get to see that deck in action. Um, but, you know, I think uh, I remember he's liking the, the cut of their jib with their deck. So we'll get yeah. to see it in action. Yeah, the request for deck list is really like low yield here relative to the amount of time before we actually go to the match. <laughs> this is just to stress out Tim, who was already, <laughs> I would say, up to his I know. neck in stress. I know. I no, know. I'm not saying you're wrong to do it. I'm saying that's what the practical results are. That's all. Yeah, our usual uh, producer uh, Tom, uh, Tom uh, taking the not not around be with more relaxed right now. <laughs> not with us this weekend. Yo, Tim, what's going on with the matches? We man? appreciate Tim for Ooh. for pitching in. So we'll be checking out this <clears throat> match as soon as it's ready. Chair so comfortable. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, Tim's 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 chair sucks. Let's see from here. <laughs> He's got a terrible chair. Oh, wonderful. All what right. a time. Yep. Well. What a time. Speaking of times, we got a uh, <laughs> – it's not quite time to check out our next match. Uh, but stuff to stuff coming up, we got a new chapter starting up at the mm -hmm. start of July. We've also got a casual event in the works for July 4th weekend, so be on the lookout for that. We'll be announcing that this week. Oh, that's right. Yep. Yeah, there'll be good action there. Um, and, yeah. Got a pretty sweet little rule cooked up, but not ready to fully unveil that one. But look out for the post on that one this week. And then next month, we'll be continuing and telling some more cool stories in our eternal chapters. Next month, we've got a draft open. It'll be our first draft open with Unleashed. So very excited to see that one. Yes, definitely. Yeah. What have, uh, what what What's among your favorite stuff to do in this draft format? Hmm. Just just a just a, a ta just attack with with two two flyers same same strategy I like in every format. I don't yeah. know. I've been focusing a lot more on uh, on constructed lately, so I've been playing a lot of throne and a lot of expedition. Um, yeah, I don't really have strong sentiments or feelings about the format at this point. Um, but as we get closer to the open, I'll dive back in and then I'll have an answer for that. I like drafting Ricano taunt. You just draft every bad taunt unit you can and every like pump spell or weapon and just suit them up and just try to build uh, some removal spells out of that and mm -hmm. it's surprising like how good it'll be when if you just get even just something like the um, the midnight apprentice down mm -hmm. and just uh just get a two plus two plus two weapon on it that thing is a house right yeah all right so trogdor is going to be on stone scar they got one of the uh the more aggressive uh, decks this weekend so we'll be checking them out um but you said they haven't joined yet tim all right what else is happening i don't know i think it's um you know it's it's pretty unprofessional and distracting for tim to be talking in our headset while we're trying to work you know <laughs> <laughs> no it's funny because we're to the joke is we're doing that to him while he's trying to work but uh he has no recourse here because uh our talking gets sent to you at home and his does not. So, yeah, that's true. What's going on? I don't know. Um, nothing really. I don't like I, I, You got to narrow down the question a little bit. Yeah, it's always on? tricky because we always like to talk about the stuff that we're working on, but then that would be spoiling things from the future. Right. Yeah. So do you have another a way you want to ask that question? <laughs> we got sweet new direwolf hoodies. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, these I things like are it. nice. Yeah. Let me see. Do we uh, we do actually have a hood on these things, right? Yeah, this is sick with it. Yeah, we're doing this now. <laughs> uh, we could stay here, Tim, or we could jump to another match if these players aren't ready. Um, how much? How long has it been since we started the round? Yeah, we give players. So the way that it works, if you've never made it to the finals, is when each round is up. We give players five minutes to join the match because um, it's, you know, it the, sure. the matches will kind of start as soon as we can. And so if somebody needs to step away from their computer for a second or their device, we want to make sure that they have time to get back and still play and not miss a critical turn. So if a player wasn't ready, um, it seems like maybe wasn't for our feature match, it could take up to five minutes after we yeah. start the round. This is sweltering. Okay. All right. <laughs> we got action. 
All right, so Trogdor up against Sir Jordy. Sir Jordy's on Praxis. Oh, so Trogdor is actually one of our FPS players, mind me. Um, and they're up against a Waystone Igniter on turn one. I'm choosing to not play out that Battlefront Dasher. Yeah, I think that plays great. Because um, you have a bunch of really good two drops in your hand, and the Dasher also plays well on turn three, alongside whatever two drop you didn't play on turn two. So the signal there from Trogdor is playing a Shadow Sigil on turn one because they want to have the option of playing either the Stone Scar or Found two drop, depending on sort of what happens. So, Sir Jordy, they got some endangered Curans for us this weekend. They've also got some Ageless Mentors. They could Searing Fist, the Stone Scar Adept, so a lot of directions that they could go on this next turn. Yeah, the hand's a little unwieldy here. I kind of like playing Endangered Curan this turn, giving yourself another draw step to a, to a big unit and maybe setting up you know two cards in one turn down the line, but looks like Sir Jordy wants to go with Ageless Mentor instead. All right, so the Felon Adept is going to get in thanks to the Battlefront Dasher. So a nice little turn three combo, though. They are down to debt, picking up a Reva. And now Sir Jordy draws an Exodus. So that is useful for inscribing, getting you that second fire influence. And man, if they can get down another Reva next turn, or another power next turn and get Reva down. Oh, yeah. So we're going to see the Waystone Igniter trade off with the Adept and the Battlefront Dasher and now Endangered Kirin. Going to try to set up enough power for Reva next turn. And what does Falna Adept find? Looking at the top three cards of the deck, another Battlefront Dasher. So they're just going to play out a couple of two ones here. And if Sir Jordy wants, they can get things rolling with Reva. So Reva summon, deal two damage. They're going to hit the Felon Adept. And then look at this. By hitting with Reva, they're going to get four power back. They're going to Searing Fist to finish off the Felon Adept. And that's a pretty big blowout now for Trogdor because they had put in a lot of work into getting that Battlefront Dasher going. Yeah, and the Ageless Mentor on the ground here is also a, a pretty big problem against these two ones. Sure is. So does Reva sit back to block the other one? It is. Great turn for Exodus. Yeah. So buffs up Reva, gets even more power back. No Ageless Mentor yet. They're going to hold on to that second one, maybe trying to get some more big drops in case they need to rebuild a game plan. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, if, if nothing dramatic happens from Trogdor's side, Sir Jordy's in a great position because, you know, the Reva is going to have to chump block next turn and then you have lethal. So you might as well lead back as much as possible if something were to go wrong such that you could rebuild. So Shizu played that weapon on the Reva because they knew they were going to have to chump block. So now they get a card out of it. It's just a seed of cunning. Ageless Mentor is going to buff up the Praxis Duster and the Evelina. But if they, if Trigger doesn't top deck some way to slow down this Reva on the other side, the game's going to end. And Plunk is not going to do it. So we see Praxis getting it done. Yeah. And uh, a really big turn with Reva, and that's kind of what these Ageless Mentor decks are about. I mean, that's where you get the biggest bang for your buck because you give that one extra strength. It comes down, hits something, and then it hits face, gets you almost all the power back, if not more. Yeah, I was a big fan of uh, Sir Jordy there playing, you know, cards on their first few turns and then playing some powerful cards afterwards, which is not a thing we've seen the Praxis deck do yet. So very nicely done. <laughs> All right, so Sir Jordy's up up a game now, and yeah, it's definitely an issue for some of these uh, these Felon and FPS decks is that they have a limited number of ways of dealing with bigger units. They you'll see Sill Stronghold, which can kill an enemy non-hero unit, but beyond that, you know, if you're not playing with something like Permafrost or Lethray Gambit, um, it can be a it can be a challenge to take down a hero. Yeah, no question. Yeah, they're a little. Especially the larger ones can get pretty shaky. Yeah, and both of those stun options 
Uh, they don't exactly do the work against Exodus, which is uh, such an important card for these Praxis decks, both allowing them to have really explosive turns when games go long, but also allowing them to just fix their influence and break stuns. Yeah, and, and against a lot of these aggressive decks with, um, you know, with, with Plunk and some of that frenzy stuff going on, with something that Exodus really helps with is just shortening the length of the game. You get in these spots all the time where it's like, okay, this attack is safe for me to make, but if they go to their turn, they, you know, kill the block or I left back and now all this is bad. Being able to just go A, space bar, and have a ton of agency on the blocks can shrink in the length of the game while also reducing your risk profile to, you know, cards like Plunk and Feladep hitting you multiple times. So it does a lot of lifting against the uh, aggressive decks has spots against some of the slower decks, and, you know, it's also just a depleted um, multi-faction sigil at the worst. Yeah, yeah, one of the, the first ever multi-faction inscribe card, and uh, does a lot to help shore up, um, when it's drawn, some of the power issues for these Praxis decks. Uh, wasn't enough earlier, but <laughs> the one with, the, you know, we saw the first copy get inscribed, I uh, believe, this game, and then the second copy got played on a pretty impactful way just to uh, get that first Reva bigger than the enemy's Reva. And uh, yeah, did a nice job. Yeah, some critical tactical work there for uh, getting that fifth point of, of strength such that uh, the Rivas went from a stalemate to a jump block. Yeah, and that's something we've seen uh, that you'll see in the different decks that um, in some of the heavier fire builds, we see Display of Passion playing mm -hmm. an Ornate Katana on Reva. Uh, Sil's Stronghold is a really nice combo where you get to first um, get that bonus from attacking alone, and then if you threaten the Reva, you're now get talking up in the sixth strength range. Right, yep. Yeah, a lot of, uh, and all those cards are also things that just do work on their own in terms of rate and modality, but you can have some just. Really, really, really strong sequences with Riva if everything breaks the right way. All right. So game number two here, Trogdor will be on the play. Um, their deck goes all the way up to Zhou, Conqueror of Stone Scar. That's a pretty nice one if you can get to it, but that hand wasn't working. So now we see draw number two. No undepleted sources of power. That will be something I'll have to work through. Cost of doing business with the three faction decks. You can't be mulligan for undepleted power and all three factions because it's just too unlikely that it comes together like that. All right, Waystone Igniter. It's going to be making a 1 1, which is huge for Trogdor with that Thicket Trap in hand. That Inscribe Cursed Relic has summon deal one damage to the cursed player in each of their units. Yeah, it's possible that Sir Jory's perspective here is that with so many copies of Endangered Curin in hand, they actually wouldn't mind sort of inducing a Thicket Trap now to hopefully free up things for some of their other one health units down the line. So Stone Scar Adept, 2-2 two, two, Warcry Overwhelm. It has Frenzy and it gets plus one, plus one. No blocks there. And now Endangered Curin comes down. And we're going to see a huge turn here for Trogdor if they thick a trap. And I imagine the allure of getting a max power unit off the board is just so great. Yeah, me too. <laughs> this, seems, this looks really good. <laughs> now we'll see Battlefront Dasher giving itself charge. So an attack for six. Big moves here for Sir, for Trogdor. All right, Endangered Kieran plus Searing Fist is going to take out that Stone Scar Adept. Plunk is coming down. Battlefront Dasher is going to buff up Plunk. So already down two debt. Are we going to contract? We are. Mm -hmm. So Trogdor had a nice turn, but they're going to be paying off debt for a while here. And they don't inscribe the call to hit. So well, there's no really reason yeah. to do it. It's not like it provides power the next turn, or I guess it provides one the next turn. But if you draw undepleted power, the call to hit's such a good play against a follow-up Riva or the, just the endangered Kieran that's already out there. So it looks a little funny, but I actually like that play quite a bit. Okay. So Sir Jordy got up to four power thanks to Riva, and that means they're going to be able to play Praxis Duster here. It's a 3-3 charge ambush unit that has summon, get plus three, plus three this turn. 
That means it's going to trade with Plunk. The rest of the units got through, though. So for, for Trogdor, can they find a way to get these last points across? Both units are going to come in. This is going to drop Trogdor down to 9. Now the question is, how much respect here do you give to another copy of Praxis Duster? Because you could play this kind of soft, where you just play Victimless Crime here on the Endangered Kirin. You have a call to hit here for, uh, for the Riva, and you can just say, all right, your turn. <coughs> so Trogdor uses Victimless Crime, kills the Endangered Kirin. Praxis Duster is going to eat one of these Battlefront Dashers. Sir Jordy drops down to three. And this is a very tight game now. Call the Hit's going to take out Riva. Sir Jordy has seven attack right now. So maybe you just kill the Stronghold and leave the other unit back to block? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing nothing wrong with that line, right? I mean, you're... You got another turn. I guess there's a question of whether you would want to try to block with the Duster versus the Evelina, but this is a, you know, you you lose to a lot of things here if you're. Yeah, the struggling. risk of this is you left back the non-hero, so another Sil Stronghold is going to kill you. Right. But instead, we're just going to see some barbarian gorillas get in the ring. Nothing wrong with this again, you know, the, to go back to the Exodus thing. It's a lot about being able to play offense and defense at the same time. And if, if Trogdor makes it prohibitive for Sir Jordy to attack, then that's more draws to a variety of cards that can finish off the game here. So Evelina is going to attack. Can Trogdor block? I think you just got to chump this. I don't. Oh, okay. All right. So we double block to take care of the Evelina. So now we're going to see Waystone Igniter come down, and it's going to be. A 4-3. Two more Barbarian Gorillas, though. Yeah, we'll see. Trade off with the Duster. And now two more Gorillas is once again going to put Sir Jordy in a spot where they need to top deck. And they do an Inferno Phoenix. Wow. Oh, wow. So that you can't... It's not a lethal attack. You can block ostensibly trade off everything and fall to one and then have some Inferno Phoenix triggers floating in your deck. Right. Oh, you have to hold back. This is, uh, this is scary. No, Trogdor is going to go for it. So they're going to be hoping for direct damage off the top to get them the win. Meanwhile, the top of the deck is very flying charge and double damage. An exodus off the top, and Riva is drawn for Trogdor. They are taking this one down. Wow. Super close game. Super. And what was interesting there, I was thinking, you know, everything happened so fast about Trogdor's attack there. And I was like, okay, my issue with attacking with both is, uh, so you get the game down to neutral, and... Um, now there's the Inferno Phoenix triggers floating around in your opponent's deck, right? So if the top card of their deck is a unit, it's pretty bad for you. Whereas if you don't attack and the top card of their deck is a unit, you're still drawing to still Stronghold and maybe some other stuff that can finish off the game there. Um, and if they're drawing, if they draw power, then it's like, okay, then it's back to your turn and you're back at neutral again. But the one card but that making that attack definitely played around was Exodus. Clearing things out made things a lot safer and a lot more stable. And um, uh, Trogdor was definitely rewarded for making that attack there. Yeah. Well, I mean, and there are cards on the top of the deck. Like, if you, I guess, if there's another Inferno Phoenix on the top and you don't make that attack, yeah. you die. Oh, it, it yeah. cuts the other way, too. It's not, you know. Uh, Trogdor, I'm, I don't know about this hand. What are we thinking? I, Meanwhile, Sir Jordy on the play has kept a hand with no cheap plays. Oh, my goodness. All right. Both of these draws are going to take a minute. 
Settle in. Yeah, I, yeah, I would, uh, I would inscribe there. <laughs> Seed of Cunning. So Jordy's hitting their power drops. So they got no early plays. All right, so now we're going to get down either Plunk or Felnadept. It's going to be Plunk. Now we're cooking with gas. Ooh. That is going to be... Field Medic is going to be annoying. Now, is Trogdor going to play into the Duster? They are not. And the Field Medic doesn't even come down. So now for Sir Jordy, you got your choice of five drops to play. It's going to be Solux Blinding Radiance to start. Yeah, this is a nice one here. It's going to pick up Killer in a moment when it hits. So, But Trogdor's got a big draw to fire influence next turn. Be enormous. They didn't get it. So now you could attack with Plunk. So I guess you're still alive to get to fire. They're going to contract here. And they did. Seed of Fury. So we'll see Stonebreaker Bow, I imagine, taking out Solux before it could start Killer attacking these Felna Depths. Yeah, I don't know if it's too little too late, but it, it had to be right there. So Sir Jordy's they, they got some options here. If you play Riva, you'll be able to get back to power if you if you uh hit the enemy face. They're gonna wait a second though, and now a miner's musket hitting face would be pretty great, though I guess the field medic disrupts that. Yeah, but at least you kinda tease it out, right? If you go if if the turn is here's field medic, okay, you can dash her up your your adept and you're not losing anything else in combat. It's not not that bad. So both adepts are going to get Battlefront Dashered. So we're going to see an attack for two. But Trogdor is going to get to draw two cards here. So they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with this bigger Praxis deck. Picking up now a Sill Stronghold. And a Call the Hit. Field Medic's going to show up. No Contract. We'll see a Dinosaur. And where's Riva going? Riva's going to go face. We're going to get three power back. We're going to Exodus. Everything's got charge and endurance. And this this is not a small attack. No, not at all. And, and you know, uh, between the flying units and the units with Valor, um, this is doing a lot of work. Again, um, Exodus is allowing this act to play offense and defense. You can see exactly why it's important for Sir Jordy to both put pressure while leaving stuff back to defend. And uh, there's no other card that can do that in their deck nearly as effectively as Exodus can. Well, uh, we, it looks like we got a triple block queued up. Takes a lot to take down a Valor unit with a multi-block. I don't mind trying to knock this off, though, because uh, now that everything is so big and has endurance, it's not like these units on the ground have a lot of value coming back anyway. I guess there's a question of if you would prefer to just chump or put everything in front. Um, but you, it's important not to just to overrate the value of your uh, ground units at this point because it's kind of getting away from you a little bit. So we're going to see a shrivel on the Riva, and then is it going to be Miner's Musket? Or it's going to be Call the Hit? Will we see an attack by both Felna Depths? One would get through, presumably. It's worth noting that Trogdor is not that high. They're only at nine right now. So if you were attacked with both, what beats you on the way back? Is there any one card that beats you? I don't think so. It would have to be two. I think once you're at the point where it's two cards to be you, you gotta get you gotta get your card here because it's not like you're winning the game right now. You need some help. 
All right, so one fell adept connects. Draw one of the top three. They hit Zoltan Conclave, so now you could play a Miner's Musket, and they're gonna take and take out one of the that flying dinosaur. So they're now at eight. I hit a flyer again. And every flying unit here is really nice because it's just another card you can cut off if you're feeling so inclined. Wow. All right. There is Joe Conqueror of Stone Scar. 5-5 five, five Flying Revenge. When it hits the enemy player, you get to deal five damage to an enemy unit. So in theory, still Stronghold's pretty nice here because it does a couple things. It allows you to Vigilance Carm the Phoenix. It allows you to attack with just one copy of Falm Adapt, which would then get Overwhelm. So you hit no matter what, and you get to leave another flying unit back. It also gives you a draw and an undepleted power, which will allow you to play show. Unfortunately, we know that all this is kind of for not from uh, Sergiorius' perspective because the Riva in hand is going to mop this one up. So we're sitting back now for Trogdor. The last dinosaur came out, and we're going to see... Wow, just a Bullseye plus a Reva. Trogdor was too low, and uh, Reva finished him off. So Sir Jordy squeaks out a very close Game 3, advancing to our top 16. And uh, very, very tight plays. I mean, the sequencing for both players of whether when you're contracting, when you're going to Exodus to pump your units, when Reva's going to come down... It's oftentimes like when you need that extra burst to pull yourself ahead with the Praxis deck. But you want to make sure you don't miss your window because, you know, you saw Joe there. Joe does a very nice job of blocking Rivas. Yep. No, I mean, there's a lot of cards um, but call the hit and Joe that are sort of informed by, you know, they're strong and they're good against a variety of things. But you can see how much on the margins these decks are trying to win Riva mirrors because the card is so strong. And uh, if one goes unchecked, it's very hard to beat that advantage. Yeah. It does a nice job of giving you some uh, some value. It, it, it takes less from you because it gives you so much power back and it removes something. It seems like a bit of a response to Krogar in the sense that Inferno Phoenix last expedition season dominated Reva in, ter in what five drops were being played out of fire decks. But Krogar does such a nice job of answering Inferno Phoenix and taking away basically all the work you've done. That uh, Reva killing something um, oftentimes is going to be a better deal. Right, because when we see um, Inferno Phoenix materialize in these fire decks, it's a lot in, in decks that are, they're not like going one, two, three, four, and just trying to kill you on turn five or turn six. Inferno Phoenix is a strong mid range play that sort of suggests um, that you can keep playing if maybe the game slows down a little bit. If you're not really in the market for the six damage, silencing an Inferno Phoenix is is a brutal exchange, especially because you're also gaining five health on the way back too. So even though silencing Riva is also useful, so much of what you're getting up front is stuff that you're interested in anyway, that even though both cards can be silenced, uh, Riva has become a lot more popular. And then Solux has really risen up because right. we saw more Rivas than Soluxes uh, before, but now we're seeing a ton more Soluxes than we ever have. Uh, so Tim, what? break it down for us. All right, let's check out another game in action. <sighs> so, Dark Revenger, top of your screen, playing a Xenon deck. Looks like they're playing through Fall of the... S oh, Combray Law Mage right now, sure. Krogar is silencing that Combray Law Mage. We're all tied up at one game apiece here with Cuthbert Katz at the bottom of your screen. This is one of those Mono Justice players, Patrick, and uh, they're looking to find a way across... Um, <coughs> I, I don't um I don't endorse this list. They're playing they're playing a lot of cards I don't. Oh okay. It's different. Mono, there's so many ways to build mono justice. You could write an article about mono justice and expedition. <laughs> cards I like, cards I don't like. So looks like we got a flipped dinosaur nest, and now we're going to see a mystic shackles hitting those. Hitting the Krogar, maybe a double block on one of these units by the remaining three threes. We are going to see Furious Magnaventures. It's a smaller unit right now, but you got to re respect the threat of that card. 
Oh, invulnerable to damage here. Spectral armor. I mean, that's another reason to do this block too, right? In the event that that's the trick, it's like not really that bad. You're down to one unit you would have been down anyway. Yeah. I suppose you could argue that maybe you block the 4-4 four because four you're just going to take less damage. I mean, uh, there's it depends on the exact range of tricks, yeah. you know. And that was a f certainly a fine attack to make even with no trick in hand. And also, the 3-4 might actually be more valuable long-term than the 4-4 four four because Hojin is part of it. I don't, uh, there's just a lot of... Yep. There's a lot of variables. All right, so for Dark Revenger now, they've got a lot of options, as we see. They've drawn a lot of cards this game, and they've got everything plus Vikram, plus Sacrificing with Nahid's Faithful. You could get down a Black Maw Carnosaur. Man, Black Maw Carnosaur has been buffed up to an 8-8 thanks to the Flip Dinosaur Nest, which means Stormhall Plating can't take it out. And for Cuthbert Cats, I'm not sure how we're supposed to be dealing with this one. Well, you could start off with an attack here. But yeah, just a just a little chumperoo from the medic. And now look at that eight eight lifesteal taunt. Um so Black Maw Carnosaur is always deadly. Picks up taunt when you have fewer units and picks up lifesteal when you're at lower health. <laughs> the big wheel. Oh yeah. Just took five. Thanks to Krogar. <laughs> All right. Lots of like. Yes, indeed. So it looks like Black Maw Carnosaur is going to come in. Might we see a triple block here? Maybe just a chump by the Law Mage. All yeah, right. I don't think you can triple block because one, if anything goes wrong, that's it's it's over, and two, um, I, I just don't think you can afford to lose that much stuff. Like you kind of are assuming that you're going to draw really well for the rest of the game from here. Well, Cuthbert Cats didn't really. They drew a Justice Sigil for the turn. Stormhall Plating is going to go after Vikram to start. And Dark Revenger with a field medic in hand has got their options about how they want to respond to all this. And yeah, they're going to gain some health back. And now the plating gets blown up. Fortunately, the Black Maw Carnosaur doesn't have taunt anymore, but that's about all the good news you can say. Trade off with the Nahid's Faithful, and it's going to take a whole lot for Cuthbert Cats to come back. We played a second big wheel. Yeah. I hope we don't have multiple 12 drops in the deck and they're both not on top of the deck. <laughs> I hope so. Helena, I, mean, I, I want the plays to matter. <laughs> okay. Take five. Take two. Cloud Scraper. Mm. Going to tuck the Helena down. Dark <laughs> Revenger going for a perfect victory here. Nothing on board, nothing in hand for Cuthbert Cats. Mm -hmm. Xenon about to take down Mono Justice and advance to our top 16. Has a uh, are we is has Dark Revenger just not passed? <laughs> I don't have a devourer. Could, could be it could be could be anything. <laughs> yeah, right. just go, come on back here. <laughs> come on bring bring it on back. Bring it on back. <laughs> we got that one. <laughs> All right, so Dark Revenger wins that one. Not sure what the holdup was of those yeah. players, but you know you're on camera. You made it to the finals. Maybe maybe there's no, a little I bit think, of No, I think the play is you attack and you still have your devourer, right? So you like could do something, but you want your opponent to concede, so you just sit and wait until you time. You know, yeah. How Some we meta considerations? <laughs> All right, so we'll find out if we got many more matches outstanding for the round. One more after that one. Yep. All right, let's do it. Yeah, we Popatito. We got a Xenon Mirror here up against DQD Whatever. Agu. Devour. Going to devour the unit that the field medic was trying to eat. And lots of ways to gain health in these Xenon decks between 
Krogar, Black Maw, Carnosaur, Field Medic. So Popatito. Now they've got their Black Maw. It's an 8 8. Yeah, the dinosaur nest flipping and pumping up the, the Black Maw is <laughs> pretty nice. It's a dinosaur. Looks like Waystone Igniter is taking out the big wheel for mm -hmm. Popatito. Which means they're still going to be contending with this uh, dinosaur nest in the 8 8 as a result. Oh my, and there's another dinosaur nest that's getting ready to uh to flip over. That's that's frightening. Devour gonna take out the Waystone Igniter, draw Krogar, and a Huntmaster Vikram. What's through the unknown getting back? Another Black Maw. All right, DQD is uh, holding on right now by a, by a thread. And I really like Puppetito just sort of taking their time here, not trying to do anything before combat. Your position's really good. You have some form of reaction in your hand, so just attack kind of as the first order of business and put the burden on your opponent to clarify sort of what's going on. Being able to turn, you know, um, a devour instead of you know fizzling a removal spell or a better exchange was just used as a ability to chump block you know that's still a fine devour um but by popatito just attacking as the first order of business made sure that it wasn't going to be anything better than that Time's running short on this turn for DQD. It's tricky because if you play Vikram right now, you, it's almost certainly not going to work out. Yeah, but the alternatives are also not super appealing. No. So another dinosaur popping out of the nest. And I guess if you play Field Medic, you can start working your way through. Well, yeah, this isn't making much progress if all we're doing is just stopping one Carnosaur from getting through. Yeah, cards like Devour and the Field Medic are at their best when the game's sort of at parity and both players have a lot of units and you have a lot of agency on your block. When it's like this, it's just it's sort of just buying a turn tops. All right, so a Waystone Igniter for DQD um, can allow them to either pop a Dinosaur Nest or pop the Big Wheel. The problem is, is that if you pop the Nest, you are just getting avalanched by cards. And if you pop the Big Wheel, the second Dinosaur Nest flipping is going to end this game really fast. So we'll see. Krogar is going to hit the Flyer, gain some health back. And maybe if DQD can draw like another Saloon Massacre, you can sweep this board. But it's certainly asking a lot right now. And now with that nest flipping, not even that qualifies as now 9-9s nine and 10-10s ten are part of the equation. And again, really like this uh, play from Puppetito, First Order Business, just make your attack, put the burden on uh, uh, DQD to do whatever they're going to do first. Because it can only be so bad if they're reacting to you. All right. So we see the double block means a field medic trades with that little Carnosaur. Meanwhile, all the big stuff got through, dropping DQD down to 13. There is another Krogar. A Black Maw Carnosaur for DQD um, is is nice. You know, you're getting a Lifesteal Deadly unit, so you'll be able to trade with one of these bigger units, but 
there is a lot of problems to contend with right now. Right. And it's not that this is bad. It's just, you know, trading one for one, gaining some health is not really a long-term solution to the variety of problems being faced. So what does the Rat King do for us here? So we get to play the Rat King and shrink down that Black Maw Carnosaur to a 5-5. Five five. This means that you could attack with your 5-5s five and you know you're not getting eat them eaten by the Carnosaur. So a nice play uh, by Popatito, just continuing to apply maximum pressure. And we'll see a chump on one of the Carnosaurs. One of them's going to get traded with. So... This board is still pretty rough for DQD, especially with that through the unknown in hand for Popatito. The big question is, are they going to play it immediately? They're going to hold off for a moment. Yeah, no reason to do now. Again, you can just pass the turn, see what happens. Maybe you want to play two copies of Call to Hit. Maybe the Wasp comes up somehow. So you Yeah, just, and just wait. We, we've kind of run out of time on maybe playing this Vikram, waiting for a card to combo with it. So we're going to play out the Cloud Scraper, and even if that were to chump the Black Maw, you would still die, um, or close enough to, and we're going to see Call the Hit. It's going to take out Vikram, and DQD is going to drop, and uh, if we have that right, that was uh, game number two, which means we're going to be getting game three of that match. Is that right, Tim? All right. So, yeah, these Xenon Mirrors, they look like they can be pretty intense, and... Uh, you know, it seems like the big wheel was a pretty big card for Popatito. Not clear if DQD um, was also playing with that one. But when you got these units gaining health and trading off a lot, uh, you got to have a way of going over the top. And there, there's some cards in the format you could turn to, like Subversion of Nature, uh, Leave Behind, that can undo a big advantage. But if you don't have them, you don't have them. Right. And I, I think once you're playing with Dinosaur Nest to begin with, um, the incentive is actually to overload on your even cost relics. It's really rough to have five di four dinosaur nests versus four waystone igniters, but if you have four nests and some big wheels and maybe some other stuff, uh, you have an opportunity to, to overwhelm their ability to handle all of your relics. Makes sense. All right, so game number three here. DQD at the bottom of your screen, they got Dunehill clans and Krogars, but... They don't got power, so can they keep this? Meanwhile, Popatito's got a pretty smooth-looking draw. And it looks like they're pretty happy with what they got. Are we going to see a keep? Call the hit, Devour, Waste Sun Igniter, Krogar, and three power. I don't know what else you'd want, Patrick. Um, I mean, this is a, a oh. hand without much in the way of... Like, a lot of what's going on in this game is sort of trying to create uh, resources running downhill a little bit. And that hand is just kind of a dead end. Like, you have no sources of advantage. You know, are you priced into just playing your Waystone Igniter early, even though it's kind of mopey? So, uh, I actually like that redraw there. I think that hand looks fine, but um, is it doesn't really get you very far in this kind of matchup. All right. So, Popatito and DQD, here we are, game three of the Xenon Mirror. Popatito has got a racking for kind of their first play of the game. Meanwhile, DQD is just kind of building up to this Black Maw at some point. There we go with the Rat King. 3-2, bring along two 1-1 one, one dirty rats that can't block. And you can pay one and sacrifice a unit once per turn with the Rat King to shrink an enemy unit minus one, minus one. So, no no Zito for DQD not wanting it to get eaten up by the rats. Popatito not playing into a field medic potentially, just going to attack with those 1-1 one, one dirty rats. And do they want to put more into this board? Oh, I suppose they're still a power away from good old Cloud Scraper. So they'll be holding off for now. And for DQD, the question is, how do you want to uh, to get your game started? Because right now, if you play Black Maw, it might just get shrunk down a bunch by the Black Maw. That's not ideal. 
Well, also Vikram plus sack outlet is a, a consideration too. This will be an interesting choice here for DQD. If you just go ahead and play Saloon Massacre, you both get to get your Zito into your deck and you don't have to worry about the Rat King. Or we could just be setting up for maybe like a little Devour. How will Puppetito play this? Because if they were to go for this uh, Rat King line, it gets just so blown out by the Devourer, and they can't play a 5-drop Cloud Scraper. Yeah, this is a great attack, because if it's Devourer, you don't really get blown out. And it's possible if you set in the 1-1 one, one Rat that it's, it's actually still good enough for DQD to just trade off the Zito, put it back in, and, you know, keep grinding advantages. Makes sense. So, weirdly, DQD hasn't taken any damage yet, despite kind of being behind the first couple of turns. So, the Black Maws got Taunt, but it doesn't have Life Steal. And if you're Popatito... It looks like you are happy to trade off Cloud Scraper for the Black Maw. And now for DQD, drawing that Dune Hill Clan. Getting close to the range where you can unleash that one and play two five fives. Krogar is coming down and is going to silence the Rat King. And if you're DQD, you've probably, you've, you know, you're in game three of this match. You're probably guessing that there's something like a field medic or a scorpion wasp coming. If it's a field medic, it's pretty annoying because all you would do is trade off with maybe the Rat King in a double block scenario. Right, yeah. You wouldn't get a whole lot out of it. It is important to silence the Rat King, though, as we see that top deck Taunt Master Vikram. If uh, if DQD hadn't done that, that Vikram would have maybe taken the, the Black Maw Carnosaur and then sacked it to the Rat King. So a little bit of a stalemate here. Popatito really doing a nice job representing with all that power up, though. They're going to go shields down a little bit now, playing out that Cloud Scraper. Well, the the interesting thing here is that Popatito has a lot of very strong tools when they're blocking between the Wasp and the Field Medic, but um, nothing that a much lower range of things that can actually do anything about the Maw while it's just back on defense. And so unless the attack is very clearly profitable for DQD, there's an incentive just to kind of wait and see what's going on here. Another Vikram off the top for Popatito. I mean, you're, you're talking about they could try to unlock a pretty sizable attack. But so much trickiness to the Xena decks. Call the hit, Field Medic, Scorpion Wasp, Devour. You really got to be prepared. I mean, even Praxis Duster could be in the range. So now the Revenging Zito comes back, and DQD is just kind of munching away at that hand of Popatito. Yeah, no real rush to do anything. Just sort of hang back, you know, grind some cards. You know, you have some pretty big draws potentially, and uh, power is even the fine thing to be drawing here because of the Dune Hill clan. Thought about attacking with Zito just to get it back into the deck. Popatito drawn power number seven. So now for DQD is the quest the question is do you want to play start do you want to unleash this Dune Hill clan? You'd be able to play out two five fives and maybe you'd be able to have a wide enough board that even if there was something like a field medic, you'd still be able to get off a good attack. So we will see a pair of those giants come down. 
Well, here's the window because, you know, I think Publitito has been not playing Vikram for multiple turns here out of respect for call to hit. But now with uh, DQD having no power available, this is a shot where it's actually pretty clean. Now, what can you do with the follow-up here? You know, I think part of the reason that DQD was willing to put the shields down is because Puppetito doesn't have a sack outlet. So the the uh, line at Vikram and do something bad with it um, would take a lot. And if it's just Vikram and pass, then your call to hit unwinds all of that when when it gets back to your turn. All right, so there's Vikram. Going to steal the Black Maw Carnosaur. End of an error is the draw for DQD. That's a fun one. Kill all units and relics that cost three or less. And if you kill six or more cards this way, you get to draw a Crate and Draw at Diesel's office. So Popatito really understanding what um, DQD is afraid of is holding up sort of that five power um, or sorry that three power that could represent scorpion wasp or field medic so by stealing Vikram back we get back the black maw carnosaur and now we're actually going to see that dune hill clan get into the mix yep the coast is pretty clear one is going to trade off with the cloud scraper the nice thing about handling the Vikram this way is that you didn't put it into the enemy void. So look at all those uh, through the unknowns in the enemy player's hands. Right. Uh, uh, DQD, is, uh, this is an extremely sharp game that they're, they are playing right now. Um, they've been really mindful about not uh, running headfirst into a potential Vikram. And uh, you can see this with, with Pobatino responding with a Huntmaster Vikram and just how uh, not relevant it really is in the scheme of things. So Krogar comes down, silences the Vikram, gives the Vikram back to the other side, but it's uh, it already had lost its uh, its control of that Carnosaur, so it's going to stay with DQD. And yeah, we, we could see another nice-sized attack here from uh, from DQD. 5-5 five, five, and 6-6 six, six coming in now. Oh, cats. The cats are feeling frisky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we will see Krogar trade off with a member of the Dune Hill clan. Rest of the units get on through. And do we is it time for another Krogar? How much more do we want to put into this board? Let's get a Krogar down. So it is going to hit that Huntmaster Vikram. Silence it. Yep, just it's more pressure plus um in the event that that Vikram dies and then gets brought back somehow, it just doesn't do anything. All right, so Vikram's going to go ahead and try to steal the Carnosaur. Is now the time we're going to see Call the Hit? We are. This is going to kill Vikram, and that's going to be big because the Carnosaur is going to stick around, and DQD is getting ready for another big attack here. Everything's looking to be coming in. Shrivels stands in the way of blocking, breaking up a double block on Krogar. We'll see through the unknown. Is this getting back Scorpion Wasp? Yeah, it is. There's that flying deadly ambush. And that's going to go on the Carnosaur. So if you shrivel that, there's no overwhelm there. Yep. Curious how much you even really want to fight this fight, right? Because if you assume puppetito has got more um, Void Recursion ruled up, then it's just a long ways away from that uh, thing hitting. But also, I guess, Shrivel's probably not getting a whole lot better than what we just saw. Field Medic, a big draw for puppetito It's really going to help them stick around. First, we're going to start off with Through the Unknown. This is going to get back on Master Vikram once more. It's going to steal that Black Maw Carnosaur. Oh, we've opened up an attack. Nice. Well, we've opened up an attack for a Dirty Rat.
It's not the most alluring to be killing uh, a 1-1 one, one camp block when you're a 34 and you have an end of an era in hand. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the uh, TQD did a nice job of surveying the land there and saying, you know what, I'll go to the 33. I mean, this Krogar, even just on the board, it's not the most attractive spot to attack into. So now we're going to see Saloon Massacre is going to kill a whole bunch of Vikrams. It's going to bring back um, Black Mark Carnosaur. And this attack into a Field Medic is not going to be great. But at least you stopped Popatito from gaining a bunch of health. Interestingly, holding off on that Devour... Um, yeah, that, that exchange is just so modest. Um, the Devour being able to be an answer to Vikram or to be used alongside your own Vikram. Like, it's twenty, it's 33 to 13. You have the best union play. Your leftovers are very, very strong. There's just no reason to uh, try to grind out really small exchanges when the Devourer has so much upside with your best cards and against Popatito's best cards. So Popatito, I guess, debating right now if they want to expose the big wheel to a Waystone Igniter or if they want to have access to Through the Unknown. And yeah, here's Black Maw Carnosaur coming in. So for Popatito, they're gonna they're not going to Through the Unknown for Scorpion Wasp. We are going to see Krogar is going to hit the Field Medic. Try to gain 5 health. They're up to 38. So what is Popatito up to? They're going to throw the unknown now. They're going to get back Vikram, so they're setting it up so they can go Vikram plus Devour. And I do like that play from Popatito of not getting the Wasp. You're so far behind here that you have to hit a home run. Just a small, even exchange like that's not going to get you anywhere. All right, so Field Medic comes down end of turn. And, yeah, DQD is trying to threaten an, a, a pretty big attack here, I suppose. Because, yeah, you, you did have to block with something, and it's just a chump block by that Field Medic. So now Waystone Igniter, wow. I mean, Popatito is only a two. The Spiteling drops him down to one. So this makes it much harder to attack with Black Maw Carnosaur because you just devour. Right. And now they're getting nothing out of it. Field Medic, a big draw. So, yeah, Popatito's making this attack knowing it's not exactly going to work just on the promise of the field medic being really good for them next turn. So then the next turn they get a, off a better attack with the Carnosaur. Right. Zito's going after the hand. And there's Vikram. Threatens to steal that Vikram to uh, to mess this up. And now we devour the Black Maw Carnosaur. Drawing another Vikram. So if you play Field Medic, you're gaining what? You're going up to 10 and you're taking like 6 here. All right, drops Popatito all the way down to four. And now with the Rat King, if you want, you could sacrifice that Vikram you stole to shrink something. A couple copies of the Big Wheel in hand for Popatito, and it, it feels like it's kind of backfired a little bit, never dropping one of them down. But yeah. maybe you were just low enough it was going to be bad for you even if it survived. And with, with the 
TQD just sitting there the entire time, it also seemed reasonable to assume that Waystone Igniter was part of the range. So Popatito falls to DQD, who uh, wins a very, a very uh, skill testing Zine and Mirror. I mean, you could see like being prepared for the combinations that are coming your way, knowing when to attack into open power, when not to. Um, a lot on the line for those players, and uh, you know, congratulations DQD and Popatito. They've been in Worlds before, but they won't be qualifying through this event. Yeah, I, I think the the really critical turn was there around eight or nine when. Uh, DQD made the decision that now is a good time to unleash the Dune Hill clan in, in terms of both these will be profitable attackers and also if Popatito responds with Hunt Master Vikram, it's not really that bad because they can't sacrifice my thing or they need a second card to do it and uh, I have a call to hit to get it on the leftovers. Um, obviously it took a lot of time from there, but the amount of just sort of forward momentum that DQD was able to make on those two turns eventually got converted into a win. Yeah, and you sometimes you let, you let your opponent have a good turn because they're going to have a good turn maybe at some point, and the cost otherwise is to spend the entire game never using your power on your own turn to the fullest. Right, and Popatito spent a lot of those turns just sort of jammed up. Couldn't play anything proactive, but needed to leave power up to respond to Vikram or something else, and... Um, being able to just make a really good proactive play there around that time was um, was really important for DQD in that match. All right. So we are going to take a break and come back with the top 16. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Stay tuned. So speaking of the, the new combos, uh, did your team do any exploration around – uh, auto tread plus deco. Yeah, we did, but um, it was a known thing, so we didn't really break it to the next level. So we had it, we seen the deck list, but we didn't know how to actually break it further. Like, uh, and again, I was also worried because that was one of the ways because you don't have an easy way to interact. You don't have a spot uh, single removal spell that can deal with it. You have a mass removal like end of an era at the marketplace. Yeah, so we definitely understood the power level of that combo. But again, we couldn't find how to really break it because there was some cute synergies. There was like a menace deck with um, a red cage and discard and throne, but yeah, it seemed like it had an engine, but the engine couldn't go anywhere. Uh, you know what, what I mean? It seemed like you had all the pieces, but in the end, the power level or actually winning from there wasn't that, uh, as easy. So, yeah. Yeah, I've um, uh, basically, I've, I've encountered it kind of in two ways. One is like, they're just playing a stone scar deck and they have these cards and they're okay on their own. And if you happen to draw both of them together, maybe it's sweet. And then... Uh, all the way up to, you know, like Skycry decks with no one to hold them and no shadow influence that are just trying to kind of combo out, maybe discard it to various things. And yeah, I had the same experience of like, this is good, but I feel like I'm just coming up a, a little bit short all the time, or there's always something that feels a little bit off about my draw. And yeah, so um, we were wondering about that too coming in the tournament because obviously, like, we just put the set out and we're, we haven't seen thrown in action. And um, I w my prediction going in was like, I think people are going to do it. And I wouldn't be shocked if there was a deck that was good, but like, I can't figure it out. And it doesn't seem like anyone I played against figured it out either. So, yeah, yeah. It, we had a very similar experience there, I think. I definitely think it's not appropriate for power level of expedition. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but for Tron, <laughs> yeah, but for Tron, I, 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 for my understanding of Tron, Tron decks should be able to, you know, uh, find a way to uh, work around it or beat it or something like that. So yeah, I, 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 we couldn't like really make it work in a way that's broken. Yeah, I, I like your point about expedition too. I mean, that's a conversation we have all the time about like, is Throne supposed to feel like just a more powerful version of expedition, or should it feel like different stuff is going on? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff, I think, in, in the most recent set that's sort of experimenting with what if it felt like a really like materially different game and not just slightly better threads or slightly better removal. There's a market, you know, to, and I don't know if we got it right yet or what that means long term. But, yeah, there was some interest in seeing, you know, what would it look like if Throne an Expedition really felt like different formats? Yeah, I agree. 
crypto i do like markets so i hope that you guys bring markets as soon as possible but yeah yeah it's one of those things where you know uh we you know we're doing in scribe you know with in, in cold hunt and it's like well that gets some of the experience of you can play a dismantle and you know if it's not the right matchup you can play it as a resource it's a little bit of that flexibility um and we can always come back to it if we think it's appropriate. And we're sort of, again, uh, like I'm a big fan of experimenting. So let's see what this feels like. Um, and if we want to do it again, we can absolutely do it again. And if we think things are going well without it, then we can put a pin in it. We don't have to make a decision now. And, you know, so we're yeah. still just trying to see how things go. You know, we're doing a lot of different things in the last nine months. So we're just trying to learn from it. Yeah. So to the tournament itself, um, how did you feel about your deck once you got to Sunday? It sounded like you said you went eleven and three through the qualification. No, game. no, ten four, and I 10, went four. Like, yeah, and it was like uh, I was uh, I didn't have uh, the medallion for the two buys, so I had to do mm. it manually. Yeah, I didn't rank <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, so so I had to, and I was like four four. It was my first run. I was 4-4, so I need to up my game a bit. And I managed to score four wins. And I was happy with the deck choice based on the when you guys sent out the deck list. And I was hoping for a good, you know, uh, good bracket of the tournament where I would avoid the aggro or the aggro players would lose to the mid-range decks. And yeah, so my first matchup was uh i was confident i would beat it because it was uh, like a mid-range stone scar deck but for yeah my opponent didn't show up so i started with a buy round one so i was feeling good and then i was looking at the bracket and like trying to understand what's happening and i i saw like a couple of good matchups for the couple of rounds so i was like yeah i think this I can have a deep run this tournament. Like I was pretty happy with my choice of the deck and the gamble of having a, you know, uh, more more like 70, 30 matchups than 50 all across place. Yeah, I mean, whenever we had you on camera, it seemed like you were just just trucking people. <laughs> so yeah, your your yeah. metagame call seemed pretty excellent um, throughout the day. Um, how was there a, a t particular point where you were sort of getting the butterflies of oh? Like, like qualify for worlds right now it, it, it's right on the doorstep or did it not really sink in until after the tournament was done no so i think in top eight i played against doc 28 she's a former teammate of us of ours so yeah and she was playing a, a poor matchup for us i think like the aggro deck so i um uh i'm not sure what the deck name like a b c d or something like that so yeah it's it's a tradition style of aggro deck with one drops and you know uh, flying spells that can basically uh easily race your having an ls turn one and then just give it flying and egg is it's basically game over but luckily they mulliganed both games and after i won that game 2-0 i was confident I think I can win this, like seeing the matchups in the semifinals and uh, potential rest of the decks in the bracket, the butterflies were coming in. So I was, yeah, at that time, it's thinking I can win this. What time was it your time when the tournament ended? I, it ended at midnight, so like 10 oh, p.m. Okay. It, it's fine, it's fine, yeah. Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Yeah, yeah.
Welcome back. Top 16 time here at the Open. Andrew and Patrick joining you for another round. And uh, this round we're going to be checking out D-Dub and Paradox. D-Dub, our top seeded player going into this event uh, on FPS. Uh, they're, they're playing that old mix of, you know, they got Chu, they got Felon Adept, they've got Inferno Phoenix. So they're going all the way up and down the curve. And then against them we're going to see Paradox, who's playing sort of the straightforward... Uh, Stone Scar version of uh, aggro this weekend where display of passion um, at their center fold. So, you know, for these players, I think the, the big thing is going to be how aggressive is D-Dub about drawing cards? How much do you make your focus on trying to buff up the Felon Adepts, get your plunk throughs when you're up against a deck that might just kill you before you come close to using all your cards? Definitely. I mean, but you also typically need to be drawing a little bit to have enough of the extra material to get to your more expensive play. So you can't totally uh, punt the card drawing element of the matchup as well. You just got to be sort of responsive to what's happening on the table, what the draws are looking like, you know, going first versus going second is a big difference for how you align some of these sequences and your opening contract plays and such. So you just got to be really sharp tactically in this sort of matchup. All right. For these players, uh, this is an important round because if you make it to the top eight, you are going to win a share of the $5,000 prize pool we have available this weekend. So uh, be pretty nice to get to uh, get to take home some cash in addition to all those sweet packs you're getting. All right, getting started here. We've got D-Dub at the bottom of your screen. They're going to be keeping this hand with Nico and choose Shizuki Silverhilt. Up against Paradox, who's got a pretty power-heavy draw, but they're going to keep it with a lot of Zoltan Conclaves. That's a dangerous thing against so much direct damage on the other side. But you have a hand where you can actually play your stuff. It's, uh, you know, undepleted. I mean, it's it's kind of like right on the line of a hand that maybe you should go down to six with, but, um, you know, I, I, I respect keeping it here. All right, so D-Dub's drawn a Plunk now. So Plunk... Plus that new Oni Hero. Potent combo for drawing cards, but can you just afford to be taking all these hits back from the Battlefront Dasher? They're going to go with Nico to kick things off. What do you make of that choice? Um, I mean, I, I suppose if you are not interested in contracting next turn with Plunk, it's better to get Nico out of the way um, because you always have the option to block with Plunk somewhere else down the line. Also, if your opponent is playing with cards like Stonebreaker Bow uh, or Hidden Guru or anything like that, that can um, attack a unit for two power, you're better off having the Nico die than a Plunk. Makes sense. All right, so for Paradox, they're going to attack with the Battlefront Dasher, and we're going to see no blocks there from D-Dub. So we, we got a race on our hands here. Not a lot in the way of attachments. Um, so for Barbarian Gorillas, killing this Overwhelm plus one strength weapon might be as good as it gets. But we're going to see Soulfire taking out the Oni. And now Nico hitting for four. Plunk coming down and Stonebreaker Bow contracted, bringing Battlefront Dasher. So... The tempo swings in these games are real. Yep, and, um, you know, Paradox is low enough at this point that D-Dub is willing to spend the contract, even though it wasn't necessary to uh, get over the battle for Dasher because, you know, opponent's at 11, you've got two attackers, a left right gamut in hand, uh, D-Dub willing to pay the two power here to uh, get the extra two points of damage across. And a tricky spot for Paradox. They're going to go with Sill holding up that call to hit. We'll see Felon Adept and then an attack. So not using the Lethray Gambit to push the damage through. We are going to see a block. And now with Paradox at 7... This game is getting very close to being over. Um, if Paradox just drops down Inferno Phoenix, Lethroy Gambit, I guess, wins the game for D-Dub. But... Yep, and um, there's no other, there's no route that this hand has towards making two plays in a turn. So, Right, it would take a ton of guts to be like, to just play the Barbarian Gorillas here. Wow, and they do it. So 
Mm. Very much still in this game. Um, the Gambit is going to push Paradox down to one if D-Dub wants to go for it. Well, alternatively, you could just uh, attack, assume that you're getting a trade, and use the Gambit to get it back on the way. So now we'll see Sill. But that's going to get called a hit. Sill will deal one to D-Dub, and Nico is going to squeak across the finish mm. here. So D-Dub takes down game number one, a close game. I mean, that that's a sequencing of that game. Paradox had some moments where they were trying to push the advantage attacking it, getting in there with the Battlefront Dasher turn after turn. Maybe you could sit back and try to block and trade a little more there. It certainly doesn't feel great when you lose the game with a card like Inferno Phoenix in your hand. Um, if just due to running out of like blockers on board. Right. It, it, it is one of those, uh, you know, uh, bird in the hand worth two in the bush sort of situations comes up a lot in this matchup because both decks are really good at removing things. So um, by attacking, if your opponent wants to follow up with a removal spell, at least you've gotten your two or three points of damage in when you sit back on defense and your blocker gets killed, um, then you're sort of losing on every single front. So, not to say that there's no argument for sitting back, but often you get into the spot where it's like it feels close. And the fact that you definitely get your three points of damage in versus maybe not being able to block if you hang back tilts it towards just get your attack in. All right. So Battlefront Dasher, once again, for Paradox, going to come in fast and early. For D-Dub, they didn't have uh, a cheap unit to play, but they picked up a fell in the depth with their first draw of the game. So now Paradox paying off the contract from the Dasher. And D-Dub is going to get a Fell and Adept down. So call the hit. We'll clear the way for Battlefront Dasher once more. Dropping D-Dub all the way down to 16. I think I would have preferred an inscribed call the hit that turn rather than uh, um, playing the power. Uh, because having power number four rolled up for next turn would be really, really powerful with uh, Sil Stronghold. Right. So we'll see. Paradox does get power number four, and so they will drop down Sil Stronghold. Threatening with the Battlefront Dasher, plus the bonus from the site, all the way down to nine. And if you're D-Dub, it's going to be Sahin Stateless. But... Paradox I mean, is getting close here. Guns blazing ain't bad this turn. <laughs> right. <laughs> and this would be a chump block and not even a particularly good one. The display of passion is going to finish things off. And wow. I mean, that was not a bad draw from D-Dub. They, uh, they had a play on two. They had a play on three. And then they just died before they took their fifth turn. Yeah, I, I mean, these games are so different when you are going second and the opponent has a dasher on turn one. Uh, and I, I really think in this sort of matchup, when you're on going first versus second, your mulligan decision tree has to be so different because the threat of dasher on turn one when you're going second is so much scarier than when your opponent is going second. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they lost with that left right gambit in hand, and that was... Yeah, it's like it's tough because you both want to stop the attacks in that spot where you play Sahin stateless. But by playing Sahin, you're giving yourself the possibility of being able to get the site off the board. And sooner or later, you're going to want to do that. So sometimes uh, what you'll see from really strong players is they'll make plays which make it less likely they survive the next turn, but are substantially increasing their chances of ultimately winning the game. Especially with, you know, two call the hits being played from Paradox. Very strong signal that uh, they were maybe heavy on power. And so the, the play of, well, I can't beat anything anyway. How do I, you know, beat what's on the table? It's definitely just playing Sahin and hoping for the best. All right. So both players had to go down to six this game. For D-Dub, they have a question of how do they want to start things off with which of these one drops. It's going to be Battlefront Dash or Kraken in for three. For the first time this game, uh, this matchup, Paradox doesn't have a Battlefront Dash of their own. So they're going to be the one playing the game a bit on the back foot. 
and it'll be ankle cutter going to attempt to slow down the dasher but look at this terry x mount is moving in on the dasher and if you're paradox do you need to fire off this soul fire right away to ensure it doesn't get buffed up further they do and for d-dub if it would be really great if they could draw power here and get down a sill stronghold they do mm. It's not like they're they're flush with that much undepleted shadow in that spot, so that's a huge draw. And we're gonna see a bit of a site of a face off between these sites here as could see another stronghold. Or it could be call the hit plus jeering yeti. A couple of ways to treat take this one. Yeah, I, I I personally like playing the removal spell in the unit because if you play the stronghold then you're just in a holding pattern for two turns, and then you're behind the eight ball when Sill comes out of D-Dub site. This way is like, well, they might play another blocker. You you might it, you know you might be, have an opportunity to play your own stronghold and actually take out theirs, which is just much stronger, uh, much higher upside than playing your own and just sort of being slightly a, a you know a half step behind. Wow. All right, so a torque for D-Dub. The problem is if they play that they won't necessarily and they had to play guns blazing on the enemy unit <laughs> well they if they didn't want to just dump the threaten right yeah so now paradox can use sill stronghold to if they if they were to use something like the uh, the guns blazing or the threaten they could really put a lot of pressure on the site if they use the threaten, they're definitely going to get through, but this one keeps the unit alive. All right, so this line also helps ensure that we got the enemy site off the board. I'm a little surprised by that, that play in the first place, though, because it seems like attacking just first, getting a chump block from the torque if they want to keep the site around, and holding your stronghold back for the you know, myriad of non-hero units in D-Dubs' deck is better than what you got out of this. All right, here's Toxic Wisp. Still no regrets. So if you contract this, it doesn't necessarily force a chump block or anything, but... It does make blocking a lot less attractive. And so we're just going to sit back and Paradox is going to hope to draw out of this because right now the board's even-ish. They're down 10 health. But in terms of hands, I mean, it's just power bursts in hands for them. Right. All right. So a victimless crime is going to hit the Jeering Yeti. Four damage coming across with Toxic Wisp. Stone Scar Depth plus Sill is a nice combo. Paradox's hand is known from D Dub's perspective, right? Nothing got yeah. swapped here, yeah. so it's it's known that it's just the three copies. That's true. So uh can just yeah. go for it here. Looks like it. So D dub's gonna contract up, take out Sill, Lethry Gambit, the Stone Scar Adept, and attack in with those units and they get it done here in uh in game number three, advancing to our top eight. And yeah, I mean it the Sill Stronghold mirror there, I suppose, and uh that, that site does a great job of putting you to the test about how cheap you can get onto the board and then how quickly you can maybe produce a charge threat. And we saw um, a D-Dub able to get a little bit more value about it, you know, getting to go through their second one uh, quite a few times. Right. D-Dub was able to more effectively leverage the victimless crime, the turn of actually got a little bit of juice out of um, some of the more modest modes and was able to use the uh, plus two attack bonus to, to great effect as well. So uh, both players had a still stronghold there, but D-Dubs was able to leverage theirs a little bit better, and now they are in the money. All right. 
So congrats to D-Dub, and for Paradox, we'll see them potentially at a future one. Uh, we'll look around. That was a pretty fast three-game set, so I imagine we're going to get to check out another game here in just a moment. All right. <laughs> just a little holding pattern, you know, trying to find an act, a game in progress here. Yep. It'll be a little tricky sometime. All right, so here we go. We got Black Ice. Look at that. Beyond Fear in hand. They're cooking with Fountain Depth. They're up against Gozu. And they've drawn a call to hit. So lots of good things happening for them. Gozu picked up a fifth power in Zen and Tome, so they can Krogar to silence and bring down the uh, the Fountain Depth. But they're probably plotting out what they might want to do about that site first. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be an attack with both of these units. It looks like victim uh, Threaten was taken last turn off of the site, so Victimless Crime still maybe queued up for next turn. All right, so Krogar <coughs> silences the Felon Adept. And we're going to see Reva. Oh, boy. Go face. Going to get a mess of power from it as it's going to get plus four strength. And does Black Ice want to play another Reva here? Because you could wait till next turn. Yeah, I guess there's a question of if you would be doing anything with the power rebate next turn. And if not, then you might as well play it now. Free up your hand a little bit. So they're going to take out the Dirty Rat. A hidden Garut for Gozu. Maybe not the ideal draw right now. We'll, well, we'll track that uh, two damage that went on the Dirty Rat. So Krogar is going to go after the site with just the quick draw mode left and maybe wanting to attack with both Rivas. We're certainly going to see Black Ice consider just letting it go, I think. Right. I could also just try. I could see blocking with the 2-4 and also just using a defensive beyond fear. Seems like a fine line, too. But, yeah, the site's... Definitely done most of the work already. No no huge burden to keep it around here. Yeah, I suppose if next turn it's really threatening, um, and so even if you, you're you going to tie up an, uh, maybe even an even bigger attack next turn by chumping this turn. Right. So now for Gozu, they're going to go into the Void. And they're going to get back the Rat King. So it looks like they're trying to set up for Huntmaster Vikram plus the Rat King. And they're even going to get to shrink down one of these Rivas here. Uh, no, no good draw off the top for Black Ice. So the best attack is just with a single Reva. Yeah, you get a blocker back and it's actually more damage. Right. Black Ice is being very careful. I mean, with that Beyond Fear in hand and that Sill coming into play next turn, there's a lot of potential <clears throat> if you can keep the site around. Right, and the other side of it is, is this, you know, it, your one window to cash in Beyond Fear. I think the upside here of maybe being able to um, uh, combo kill if things go the right way is so high that it's worth holding off, but it's not a solved thing, whether or not you just take your money and run right there versus hoping that next turn goes a certain way. So there's Vikram. Call the hit is going to take out the Vikram.
And now for Gozu, they're going to shrink down Riva again. And I imagine they're attacking with both. Yep. They are. And so no no real point in, in chumping with this Riva. So Gozu is, is definitely pulling ahead on board, but a strong possibility um, Black Ice can find a way to get 12 points across first. Jeering Yeti, not exactly the way. They're going to play it out. A second Rat King kills, deals with the Jeering Yeti pretty easily. But I think you've got to consider whether shrinking the, the other Reva is a better way to go. Definitely. I mean, if you're playing against a deck like this where, you know, you're aware that there's a lot of, you know, ways to burn you out and kill you from a pretty um, high base, that these two points of damage from Riva turn after turn really adds up. And if you can knock that out, lock down the ground, now all of a sudden it, it's it's pretty hard for, for Black Eyes to make any sort of attacks in the air. you got a lot of time to, to draw out. Can't do it this turn, unfortunately, because that sequence requires five power. Three to play the second copy of the Rack Hang, and then two activations across each. So is the calculus a little bit different this turn if you can only do one thing anyway? All right, so there's Rack King number two. So we're going to see it use its sacrifice ability. We are. It's going to go after Jiren Yeti. So uh, Gozu is just trying to put the most damage through possible. They're definitely putting themselves in a chance where they might die on the next turn. Because right now, uh, Black Ice is gonna ha has two in play and another plus four in hand. It's just a Seed of Chaos, though. And keep in mind, Gozu can kind of gain one health when they need it. I mean, I, I suppose Gozu is also potentially going to have lethal next turn if Black Ice doesn't use this Beyond Fear. Yeah. I mean, now there's a question of, okay, so if you uh, Beyond Fear your river and hit for six, knock Gozu down to four... Are there any cards in your deck that can, like, that you could still win the game from that spot? Right. If you have something like Inferno Phoenix in deck, it's very tempting to want to hold Beyond Fear as long as possible. All right. So, Black Ice hits down to four. So, if you play Vikram and. I mean, playing Vikram, taking their Riva. Using it on their river and attacking with everything is super safe. Cuts out a lot of the potential draws. The question is, is there a way to have coverage against Inferno Phoenix off the top? If you can find that, wow. maybe that line's preferable. So just Vikram plus Garut going face is 18. If you take the undepleted one. So this is the line that that leaves uh, exposure to Inferno Phoenix. You actually have Beyond Fear covered. Is there anything else? <laughs> so a, a pretty conservative attack, all things considered here. And now we'll see. So... Felon Adept is the draw, but I got to imagine Gozu, well, the f field medic gains a ton of health here. Yeah, that's going to push, that's going to push Gozu out of anything, out of range of anything threatening now. I mean, you have like 16 on board, so if you can remove one blocker, Keep in mind, Rat King sacrificing a Spite Link also can deal an extra point. So this 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 was cute. So the way that Gozu set it up, that Black Ice thought they were 
blocking to stay alive without risking the Fountain Adept. But now just a hidden Garut um, can just attack three unblockable. So yeah, but, uh, you know, again, there's a what could the last two cards be and how do you sequence against all of this the best is, you know, Gozu wants to take their time with it. All right, so Gozu gets it done, advancing to our top eight. So very, very close there. I mean, it felt like uh, Black Ice was just a draw away for a while. Had it kind of had a couple of turns where they couldn't quite top deck what they needed, and uh, Black Ice falls to Gozu two nothing. Um, how are we looking for our rounds, Tim? We got one more. All right, we'll check that one out in just a moment. But yeah, good for good for Gozu. That was a tough one. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that did not look like they had the tools necessarily to stabilize there, but was able to find enough Rat Kings to shrink down the river and. Uh, Take things over from there. All right. One game apiece here between Thufir, Hawad, and Portich. We got Terry X Mount and Field Medic coming in. So options that look somewhat appealing here. You can still stronghold and knock out the field medic and get a reasonable attack in. Um, the problem here is that it's hard to play two cards efficiently in one turn. With an extra power, you could do this plus Stonebreaker Bow and really get something going. Um, this way is fine, but you know the uh, the Terry Axe is going to threaten the. Stronghold on the way back, and if you make an attack here and Portage has field mech, it's, you know, you don't really get very far. So, um, not as bad turn for Thifir, given that there's another still Stronghold in hand to kind of set up with. But, um, you know, a power or another cheap card short of really being able to do something good. And if you're Portage, you're at 30. You certainly have to consider ignoring this first sill stronghold now that it's gotten its removal spell out of the way because i mean it's pretty hard right now for thufir to block the field medic they can't block the terry x mount so are you really willing to give up a six point attack uh just to kill this site a lot of it depends on if you think you're just so favored if the game goes long that why risk anything even if it's a little vague what could go wrong sure I mean, the attack is really appealing because with an opponent at 15, you know, and you're hitting in multiples of three. I guess there's also the question of in the event that you want to send in um, uh, the Terry Axe, you also want to send in the field medic. Like, do you send only the flyer at the site or do you send two units at uh, Thufir? It's another question. Right. All right. So Terry Axe mount is going to take out Sil's stronghold and... Otherwise, just going to pass. Now, they do have that through the unknown with the field medic in the void. So, they, they can make a play here, and they're still holding up Devour. The fear drew power number five. It is depleted in that seat of cunning. Yeah, this hand is just a little jammed up here for Thufir. There's some stuff to do, but pretty much everything strong involves spending all their power on their own turn and then attacking. And there's so many ways for the Zen and deck to make that kind of line uh, really, really poor. Mm. All right, so Stonebreaker Bow is going to go at Vikram, and Thufir couldn't find a way around this. They kind of had to recognize that this looks like maybe a bit of a setup, but, you know, at the very least, if you devour 
um, the the Terry X mount it's not too bad all things considered all right so we drew a Zito on the way back that's gonna get rid of the snowball and now these units can actually attack will field medic block Yeah, you've got so much um, health to play with here if you're Portage. The attack from these uh, units goes, you know, 14 down to 10. Uh, and your leftovers are really strong for playing a game that's short or long. So I like not blocking there. Just try to pressure advantage a little bit. Fafir's deck is not really equipped to play a defensive game very well. And so if you make it into a race... Uh, Fluffier can really only play the one way, which is offense. All right, so Waystone Igniter comes down along with the Rat King. So Portage just added nine more points of strength to this board. Not only is there a lot of pressure here, but with the leftovers of Through the Unknown plus a Sigil, they also have... Uh, Rebuy and replay Hot Master Vikram as part of the range, plus uh, dealing a point of damage to Thuffir. So it's one of those spots where if Thuffir is attacking and racing, just the nature of the board and the health tolls make that really hard. And if you try to hang back on defense, then the array of units that Porters can get back is going to break that up in some form or fashion. All right, so we see. Sills Stronghold to kill the field medic. We got a charge dinosaur. And so you mentioned Portage has this line involving through the unknown to get back on Master Vikram. If you do that though, you don't have the power to sacrifice the unit you steal this turn. So Right. It would just be a push of damage. You would be you would be forcing a block here, um with with whatever um on your uh waystone igniter. And Thuffir has a power left. You know, you also have to consider if um, if call the hits in Thuffir's deck, then that's uh, really punishing if you go down that road. So you also got to check the jack deck list here, see if that card's there, and maybe do something like getting field medic back, or at least having the the threat of getting field medic back instead. So we are going to see through the unknown. It's going to get Terriax mount. So this Terriax mount hit itself earlier, so it already has flying. And now it looks like we are going to hit the Waystone Igniter, and we're going to see a pretty big attack. Everything but the Rat King is coming through. So this, if this was all going at the face, would drop Thuffir down to three. And with two flyers still left... It's putting Thuffir in a hard spot. Portage has got nothing left. Oh, wow. And we even get the Rat King to finish off one of these units. So Thuffir is going to play through the unknown. It's going to get back Battlefront Dasher. Treachery. I think Thuffier was hoping they were going to get to um, Battlefront Dasher, the Inferno Phoenix, to make it so they had a large enough flyer. But as it stands, if they play out Inferno Phoenix, that's the only thing they can do this turn, and then the Rat King can finish off the Phoenix. Yeah, we're, we're, we're only able to make one play here that can respond to a flying unit. Um, I mean, I guess, in theory, the most bored impactful line involves... Stonebringer Bow and Dasher, but then you're just kind of dead to the flying units, so there's no way out. All right, so Portage advances to our top eight, and we're going to be seeing that round in 10 more minutes here as we're going to take another break and get ready as we've just got eight players left. All those players are now in the money. They will be taking home cash prizes for this weekend. How much and who will be going to the World Championships? Well, we'll see that on the other side.
I, I like to open up a, a round of questioning from you to me. Uh, this is, of course, as you know, being in the position of a, authority over these matters, I reserve the right to edit out anything that like makes <laughs> me look bad or that I don't want my bosses to see. But anything sort of design related or game related that you want to ask, I like to give our our players an opportunity to sort of to throw one or two at me. I mean, uh, I think the community had a blast with the Valkyrie Warp video or or uh, <laughs> the, that part where, where we discussed it. And yeah, so um, I think, but. I do think it opens a good design space. You know, you cannot do that in in uh, card games, live card games. So, uh, what's your um, design thinking about doing those mechanics that basically cannot be replicated in in uh, non uh, virtual car card games? No, I, I'm sort of in the middle. Um, uh, uh, I guess there's two. There's two tent poles. One is it's digital. We should be really digital only. And the other is just make the stuff that seems good. And if it happens to be digital, um, that's great. But we don't go out of our way to explore it. And I'm somewhere in the middle of, I do think we should be actively celebrating the fact that we're digital. And that can mean a lot of different things. Like, for example, I think Nightfall is pretty awesome. It's it's mechanically simple. You could kind of do it in paper or it would be a little annoying to, to track but the fact that the play map changes during nightfall that to me is digital only like that that it, it doesn't have to be just like war cry or warp or whatever to to pass that line for me but ultimately i think the game has to stand on its own two feet as a fun experience independent of being digital so i i, I guess the short version is we should be going out of our way to try to find stuff that's cool and digital because that's the game that we have and we should celebrate it. But that isn't a blank check to just do anything because it happens to be digital. Okay, cool. And for example, for Expedition, uh, do you actively limit the influence that's available to players just to have that decision space of being greedy uh, and playing three faction decks with and losing to your influence more than you know being consistent and playing like is that a, a decision point you have or oh that's a great question because this is actually coming up a lot in uh our conversations a little bit and i'll i'll give you a little bit of my perspective um so we have done historically a lot of um influence that makes it, it, a lot of power that does that makes two influence and uh comes into play depleted under condition and a lot of those have a habit of stacking up. So like, let's say you're playing with uh, seats, for example, and you wanna play a third faction. Okay, well now those are gonna come into play depleted all the time. If you start having those come into play depleted all the time, now your banners are coming in depleted all the time because you can't play your units on time. And then we have, um, I forget the, uh, the names of them off the top of my head, but um, depleted if you're uh, on the first three turns. Don't. Um, the tones, right, thank you. And so I'm having this experience of like, it feels like I have a lot of cards that are supposed to be different, but they're all the same. Um, and once you start playing with a lot of them and your three faction decks have to do that. So a card that I really advocated for early and wanted to get out the door was Sultan Conclave of, it's always undepleted and it makes anything that you want, but there's a cost associated with it. And is it good for three faction decks or not? Well, if you're playing with a lot of pips across three, a, a lot of influence across three factions, maybe not. Maybe you'd still rather do the uh, the traditional seats and banners and such. But if you're playing like uh, just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, Zoltan Conclave might be better for you than the seats and banners because it's always undepleted. And uh, if your pips are already lined up, you don't even have to take the two. You just play it as a uh, just an undepleted power. So for me, a lot of what I'm interested in is doing stuff that's different. I don't, uh, whether or not one faction versus two faction versus three faction is the right way to build a deck. For me, ideally, it's just a mix of it. I would like to see kind of all of it around. But I, I really would like to try to explore more space of the power feeling like it's for some decks and not for others. And I think that's opportunity that we have not, not because we had like a purpose, just the way that it went. We have not mined very much historically. And so for me, Zoltan Conclave is sort of 
the first step towards trying to do it a little bit different and seeing what that looks like. But, you know, we have a lot of different needs and like, we don't want the power to be super complicated to play with. Um, like Zoltan Conclave is a pretty complicated card to play with for what it is, but also when you're in three power, three faction, all my power is depleted. Maybe if I top deck the sigil, then I want to hold this one versus if I top deck this certain unit, then I can play my banner and depleted. Like that stuff's complicated too. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to approach it from like a bunch of different angles, but you are correct that, or what you suggested is correct. That like, um, we, there's a little bit of homogeneity with some of the incentives and the way the cards work. And we're trying to do things a little bit different to just see what it looks like and see if people latch onto it. And it's nice to see like Sultan Conclave is showing up a lot in Sultan decks because like casting Huntmaster Vikram on time is really important and you're willing to take some damage to make sure that that's a little bit reliable. So even the two faction decks, or like I'm playing, for example, um, I'm playing a Stone Scar deck in Expedition um, that's all fire and, uh, you know, basically splashing like Sill and a couple of the Stone Sprig, bro, you know, the stuff you'd imagine. And uh, the Mark of Shavka, that if you go to the player, turns into the, uh, the six cross unit. So I'm playing Sultan Conclave in that deck because, well, it's an undepleted fixer, but I really can't play with Shadow Sigils because if I want to uh, deal to damage to my opponent, the Shadow Sigil doesn't help me cast the six drop. It's like, oh, that's interesting, different, and new. And I don't have to play it that way, but I'm doing it because whatever, right? <laughs> so there's something cool about that card kind of enabling even some two-faction decks in a way that's a little bit different from how our uh, tomes and sigil uh, uh, and banners and such have done it historically. Cool. Yeah, I really like the the untapped or the undepleted uh, the uh, come into play effect of of Xena, of the card.
All right, welcome back. It's quarterfinals time here now at the Open. We've got eight players left vying for the title of Open Champion and trying to make it to the World Championship. Though we do have a couple of World Championship competitors here in our top eight, both Portage and Gozu. Um, they crushed the last thrown open, and they're once again back here in our top eight. And so, you know, we've got a stacked field of players, but, you know, still some who are looking to make their mark and book their entry this weekend. We're going to start things off this round by checking out Iron Man. I believe they're playing against D-Dub, and uh, I think they're one of the players on Xenon. And it does seem like Xenon has been the real success story of the weekend. Yeah, I don't know about where we're at. When we started Sunday's play, it looked like there was a lot of practices in the room, but uh, as the field has narrowed down to our final eight, we have uh, a lot of Zen in left. Yep, so we'll see where things move in the metagame over the next uh, few weeks as players move on from this uh, event. But uh, yeah, I mean, Xenon, it's, it's got a little bit of a different feel to it than the last format Xenon deck, which had a lot more in the way of small go-wide strategies. This Xenon deck definitely is can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some bigger units, playing with Krogar, um, and it doesn't really, it seems like most of these players are not playing too much in the way of sweepers, but are largely looking to manage the field with Field Medic and Krogar. Yeah, the deck plays a lot better on the opposing turn than it used to. The uh, Through the Unknown, in conjunction with Field Medic, Scorpion Wasp, if you want to play that sort of thing, etc. Um, just a lot of ability to hold up all of their power and then respond accordingly, which was not something this deck really was doing in the previous expedition format. All right, we got a fast start here for D-Dub. They got a turn one battlefront dasher. Um, that did come at the expense of they had they used their only their Zoltan Conclave to get that, and their deck does have shadow in it, so we'll see how that comes up. Um, but with just depleted power to start, it's gonna be a little bit slow out of the gates. Now on turn three, they can play another seat and they can Terry X mount to get this Battlefront Dasher into the skies. So we're going to see uh, D-Dub try to sort of take this game down with one singular threat, which isn't the worst strategy against uh, Xenon, provided they don't have a Huntmaster Vikram in hand. Yeah, but D-Dub's hand doesn't really have any playback against Huntmaster Vikram anyway, so you might as well try to optimize for beating the other cards, and I think this is the, the start to do it. <laughs> Copy number four of Torque, and there it is, Huntmaster Vikram. The only question for Iron Man is that if you play it this turn and it gets killed, that could cost you the entire game, um, whereas next turn you can potentially use it with the Rat King. But they're going to go for it right here. At the very least, it does stop an attack, but now just drawing a Shadow Sigil... We're going to see Torque make a snowball, but if uh, if Iron Man wants the insurance, they can sacrifice this Battlefront Dasher, maybe after getting an attack through the air with it. Yeah, I guess a consideration here from Iron Man's side, I do think that's that's the, the wise thing to do here, is um, they actually are not that good on the ground right now uh, once we no longer have this Dasher. So interesting, they're going another direction here and saying, put another, putting something more on the ground here. Even if you're able to kill the Vikram, there's so much coming across next turn. All right, so Iron Man didn't just throw out the Krogar. They figured, hey, if you didn't have the answer for, for um, the Rat King and Vikram and all of that. A turn ago, you probably don't have anything now. It did work out. Um, we see Krogar silence Torque and Is this lethal if you attack with everything, Patrick? How's it looking to so you? So your best block for saving damage is you can save five, either by double blocking the Krogar or... I guess the most you can save damage is Rat King and Chump block Krogar, but that's something of a dead end. Um... And that puts you at two if you do that, at which point the Through the Unknown kills you. The ostensibly fine blocks, which are put it on Rat King and Vikram or double block Krogar, leave you, I believe, dead to uh, the Through the Unknown regardless. Yep. All right. So pretty fast game number one there. Uh, D-Dub was kind of stymied on early power, and we've definitely seen it come up with these three-faction decks. 
Um, just missing that third power, missing getting undepleted power, playing with a lot of seats in these power bases. You know, it doesn't get much better with tomes either because those aren't coming undepleted until like turn four. And so uh, certainly a lot of risk for these players when they're playing three factions and trying to play fast because the FPS deck is playing a bunch of one drops and two drops. It wants to play on curve. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, y you know, you get this opening hand like DW just have and you basically have two routes. One is... Play my power depleted, uh, 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 um, depleted. Don't play the battlefront dasher and just sort of, you know, play my stuff on turn three or four. Start doing that. The other is play the dasher and risk not being able to play something for for many more turns. Uh, especially on the play and in this matchup, I think the correct thing to do is what D Dub did, uh, trying to go toe to toe for this with this deck, the Zenin deck with your threes and fours is really really bad. Uh, whereas being a little risky with the dasher. And maybe you draw undepleted power, or maybe your Iron Man just doesn't have an answer for a dasher. I think that's strategically the the right thing to do, but all paths come with some sort of risk. All right, so game number two here. D-Dub is going to get things rolling with Plunk. And Iron Man has a dinosaur nest, so Plunk is going to get in. The question for D-Dub is, do you play a Felnadept first? They are going to. And now we'll get an attack from Plunk. Are we going to see a contract to draw a card? Critical decision. With that Sill Stronghold in hand, they instead are just going to inscribe and set up for that on the following turn. Zito goes after the hand. We will we'll see Felnadept go away. And now with Sill Stronghold... We're going to threaten up the Felnadep, maybe? Love yeah. it. So this is, a, this is a nice play. We get in a bunch of damage. We get to draw a card. And this is, could induce those blockers to get out of the way in a moment. So both units going at the Stronghold. And Iron Man is going to play Waystone Igniter, and they're going to make a Spiteling with it. So Victimless Crime is potentially the play. It's going after the Flyer. Stop it from maybe chump blocking in the future. Belnadep's going to crack in for another four. Iron Man did miss a power drop last turn, Patrick. That's keeping him away from Krogar, and they really could use that giant to get them back into this. And this hand just doesn't have a whole lot going on besides. So drawing the Heat's Faithful, that could be big. Could give them a way to get uh, get some health back in a few turns. They are going to need to attack with a lot of units if they want to ensure that the site goes down. They'll need to attack with three. They do. So, Sill's Stronghold is down. It's going to make it harder for the Felnadep to push as much damage through. And there goes Nahid's Faithful, sacrificing one of those dinosaurs. Or, yeah. Sorry, the... And now Zito's going to get rid of the Inferno Phoenix. That's pretty big. Yeah, I mean, you have Stonebreaker Bow plus Through the Unknown as something of a combo flourish here. And I guess with the Felna Depth, you, all the things being equal, you'd rather just be uh, drawing action. All right, so Plunk is going to trade with Waystone Igniter. Zito's going to block. And then the Felna Depth is going to get through. Draw one of the top three. They hit greater plan, so they got a power for the turn. That's going to allow them to pay off one of the debt. But Zito's coming back with Destiny, and if they pay contract, it's going to get the last card out of the hand. But Iron Man just still is missing power, so they're not getting closer to Krogar. And as the dinosaur nest flips over to Sheltered Valley, those dinosaurs are three threes, but D-Dub's got a pretty healthy uh, 19 points left. Another Felnadep. So the next way to proc Frenzy is going to be enormous. Yeah.
And for Iron Man, it could be Sahin this turn. But keep in mind, they got a Nahid's Faithful. That's a 4-4 four, four in that void. You bring that one back, it's gonna get. It could get up to a six-six lifesteal. Yeah, Sahin is so just kind of mopey this turn because it's you know doesn't have lifesteal. It's just four damage, and it's not doing um. Oh, excuse me, it does have lifesteal. The dinosaur buy, yeah, yeah, it has a nest. Then yeah. I'm into it. All right, Inferno Phoenix. Some big draws here from D Dub. Can they find a way to proc Frenzy with this next one? They do in Stonebreaker Bow. Hauntmaster Vikram. So just an attack from Sahin. And now Huntmaster Vikram going to take the Inferno Phoenix. And I think DW, yeah, it looks like I think they're going to get to lethal here, Patrick. Yeah, this is... Uh um, just a ton of damage. Yeah. Are yep. they short? No, it's exactly yeah, enough. Exactly. <laughs> Do you notice is that so fast that I'm like, they must have, right. they must that was... know. But then there was that, that pause right. for a second. I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> right. Because so that stone, the relic weapon has overwhelm. You attack Vikram, it gets over for one point. Right. You attack one of those X ones, you're getting across for three points, so two more. So... If it had turned out, that was only 11, but, you know, D-Dub -Dub was first place through the qualifying rounds. They've made it this far. I think we can assume that if they made a play that fast, they know what's up, and they did know that they had exactly lethal. Yeah, it was also interesting there because there was a turn where they could have attacked with a Nico where everything was just, you know, three health or less on the way back. Didn't attack with it, and I was like, that's weird. No attacks, no blocks. Like, why not do something or whatever? And then, because all they were uh, doing was attacking with Falna Depths, the uh, Terry X Bow actually unlocked four damage instead of one because they were able to make a right. non flyer to a flyer. So, very sharp play there from D Dubs. All right. So, D Dub took advantage of uh, some power stumbles from Iron Man, and they have gotten this to one game apiece here as we are now in the deciding game three. D Dub is keeping this hand. They only had two power, but they got a third. Question is, are we going to contract with that treachery in hand? And we are. So, D-Dub, a fan of the aggression. We'll see a dinosaur nest. Well, also, a lot of the prizes that um, are in um, Iron Man's deck as far as treachery goes cost four or five. So, no harm in waiting a little bit longer to maybe get something like Vikram. So Hidden Garud is going to take care of the Battlefront Dasher, and Nahid's Faithful is going to make a 4-4 four, four here. If you play She's... You get to put a weapon on itself. Now, keep in mind, Shizu uh, does not benefit from herself dying, wielding a weapon, so won't draw a card there, but does trade off... And big moment here for D-Dub. You could play out something like a Plunk or a Torque. Um, and they're going to just play out Plunk, but it's a little awkward as things stand. And look at this for D for Iron Man. Evelina. And Plunk can't effectively block that one down thanks to Valor. Maybe this is setting up through the unknown to get back Shizu, and then you can get Plunk into a good blocker for Evelina. It's really clunky hand here. Yeah. Oh, well, keep in mind as well, the dinosaurs are about to flip, so that wouldn't even block down Evelina that well. This is quite gutsy from uh, D-Dub. I'm not sure that you can win this race, but they're going to go for it. Well, I'm, I, I don't mind this play um, here by DW. You cannot win by blocking. Maybe attacking doesn't get you there because of all the reasons you mentioned, but you're certainly not going to be able to play defense with the cards that you have in your hand. So, Okay. I mean, that 7-7 seven, seven Rhine arc is so big. Looks like we are shifting to a blocking strategy, Patrick, but I agree. <laughs> Looks tenuous. 
Yeah, I don't think there's a way to block out of this. No, there wasn't. All right, so D-Dub falls in game number three to Iron Man. And, you know, Iron Man, it didn't really seem like their draw was anything particularly special, but D-Dub was – their deck likes to play ahead. They weren't the fastest coming out of the gate. I mean, you, you saw that game. I mean, how much – power worth of stuff that they have left to do when they lost there. I mean, that that the games that D-Dub lost, I would just say you could just chalk up to two factions versus three factions. Just stumbled out of the gate, powers were depleted, um, had to make certain concessions to make sure they had three factions online at the, the right time or whatever. And um, uh, on the other side, that player was just able to play their cards um, all three games. And um, two of the games, D-Dub's, I mean, their draw didn't fail, but it was so unwieldy that um, that's ultimately what did them in. All right. And uh, we're going to check out our next match in just a moment here. And we'll be seeing who else will be joining our players in the semis. We'll be doing both the semis at the same time this weekend. And for Portich up against Alex Fierro, we are in game number three. And, ooh, beautiful third power off the top for Alex Fierro. It's going to allow them to get down one of these. Oh, but they're going to inscribe Jiren Yeti and play out this Combray Law Mage. And uh, Combray Law Mage against Dinosaur Nest is pretty hilarious. Do you want to explain this to the viewers at home? Uh, you you already played a unit, and Combray Law Mage says you can't play more than one unit yeah. a turn. Yeah, sorry, bud. Um, you know, that's you have a unit. You, you have your dinosaur now. Uh, all right. What else would you like to do yeah. with your turn? <laughs> so, and what and Portage has got to really think about playing out this second dinosaur nest because the first one is going to turn off soon. But the, the, you got a second one down. You're not playing anything for a while from your hand. It's a slow burn. It's a yeah. very slow burn. Second nest. Law Mage also no uh, plays pretty good against the Rat King, um, because you know that's also a unit. Portage uh, is like, oh my gosh, I could... No, I can't block. <laughs> so the Law Mage gets down. There's old Sahin. Mm, I'm sorry, you already played a unit, though. Right. And so once again, I mean, if Portage could play another dinosaur nest, but then you're just committing to only playing those dinosaurs. Look. look. The rules are the rules. I Yes, the cards are clear in what they do. Second Scale Sworn Patrol... Yeah, I mean, you can really sort of just build up here. Um, you know, the, the the risk is you're taking a lot on the way back, and if you overextend without endurance, then Vikram could be uh, a big problem too. Mm. But uh, could definitely get a lot of pressure going here and try to set up, you know, the the whole Nine Adventures Helena style of um, uh, bursty kills here. So interesting to see how Alex wants to navigate this one. Yeah. You don't have to play the power from your hand, but it's certainly great to do so. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you play Olin f first and then play the power, the scales... Well, I guess it's about the same either way. <laughs> the big thing is, uh, I, I think from Alex's perspective, is is there a line with Olin here that gives some level of protection against Hum Master Vikram? If so, I think that's worth exploring and if not you might just sort of want to get as much stats out there kind of spread it around as wide as you can and um, take things from there all right so second scale sworn patrol plus a justice sigil so the scale sworn patrols are going to buff each other and now the top of the deck has something like plus three plus three on it we are going to see a chump from one of these dinosaurs Yeah, it's not like the dinosaurs are in a position to attack next turn because there's still a 5-4 back on defense. All right, so now for Portich, the dinosaur nest flips, and you can actually play one card from hand. Keep in mind, if you were to play something like the Rat King, you're not getting the extra rats. So Sahin's just going to drain for four. And so... Where does that leave us? 
if we were to make an attack here. I mean, I think the line that I like is just attack with everything. You have breached the defenses in hand, so there's no block that uh, can really be put on you here. I guess Magnaventress is also just a lot of offense this turn. I guess it's fine. Yeah, I guess the best double block is either against the Law Mage or against the 5-4 Scalesworn Patrol. It is interesting about what you would rather get off. It's going to be the Law Mage. So this will, this could potentially unlock Portage to getting to play multiple plays again. But you, this takes you the most damage. Now, Field Medic, that's something. Because you play maybe Nahid's Faithful and then Field Medic and Contract. And you're getting a lot of health. Now, Alex Fiera is getting some really big units. It was a pretty good, clever attack by Portich. Not sure it was necessarily in Portich's plans to finish off with the Hidden Garud if there had been a block. Yep. Although I think this is now lethal because of the Helena. Sure looks like it. But Portich, yeah, crafty play there for sure. Breach the defenses. A lot of the, you know. Just in case you thought it was close, it wasn't. Just running up the scoreboard, spinning the ball with my finger a little bit. Go ahead and give this one. Flying and negative six. Not All right, so Alex Fiera three. takes it down. and uh, I mean, I think you'd have to chalk that one up to a lot of um, Combray Law Mage plus Dinosaur Nest. The Dinosaur Nest just really backfiring on Portage. Yep. I mean, uh, Combray Raw Mage is not, you know, it's not been the most popular card this weekend by any stretch. You know, we haven't had a lot of aggressive justice decks, which is typically where you see that thing. But Zenon has, I, I mean, part of the range of their draw is they just cannot operate against that thing. Um, they have so much token generation. They have so many sequences that are built around, you know, play a Vikram and the Heath Faithful in the same turn, and all of that just gets so messy. Uh, they also don't block it very well. So um, that card at a very low opportunity cost has moments of being spectacular against Zenon, and we saw it right there. Yeah, so uh, the Alex Fierro will be advancing to our top four, and we're going to check out this match now between Dark Revenger and DQD. And... Uh, Dark Revenger is up a game. Looks like they're using the Rat King to permanently deal with a Zito. And, well, things are getting quite hairy here for DQD. And looks like uh, Dark Revenger is actually the one who's up a game. So, that means DQD's back is up against the wall here. Do they need to potentially go for the Devourer right now to help find more help? No, they're going to wait. Yeah, because they can if, if they want to block the Rat King and Devour, um, you know, they save themselves the three points in lieu of devouring right now. And also with end of an era, I guess it's possible, unlikely, but possible, something could happen that uh allows you to get the uh sort of the more uh powerful version of that card. So no attacks there by Dark Revenger, fearing the possibility of uh maybe a second field medic. And a double block taking down the Krogar. Now these Krogars are going to trade off. And it feels like DQD just is a whole new lease on life with that top deck giant. Definitely. Now has some cushion to play with a little bit. Uh, Dark Revenger's hand lines up very poorly against the Leftovers here. Saloon Massacre. Uh, end of an era might have a, a, an opportunity to shine here. All right. Here's the Igniter. It's going to go up to a 4-3. No Nahid's Faithful, so it looks like Dark Revenger's settling in to play a longer game where they can try to use these uh, cultists with a Vikram. Well, also, what you have on the on the board right now is enough to can do something. Got a block, or maybe get the Devourer out of the way, whatever. Um, so there's no real reason to just put some tutus down because those are just blocked by the field medic anyway. Setting aside the long-term value of having the Heat's Faithful for setting up some sort of Vikram related combo down the line. So DQD is going to take it, not making the trade. And now they draw Dune Hill Clan. 
So if they want, they can unleash this giant twice and get two five fives and be back in the lead on the board. And they are, so big stuff here. Dark Avenger is now the one who's just been breaking off with their draws. Man, when they were up with that Krogar, it seemed like they were on the verge, but... And this is the now the second time we've watched DQE on camera where uh, Dune Hill Clean in the mirror has just been awesome. Yeah. That is true. So with the Rat King, they're just going to play it. We are going to we're going to see a top deck Huntmaster Vikram now from Dark Revenger. And that's going to take one of the Dune Hill clan unless it gets devoured. So the upshot here is that Dark Revenger doesn't get any free fodder and you get to draw two cards. The downside is you didn't even make them sort of use their card. It'll be interesting to see how valuable much DQD values trying to get a end of an error. Because if they want, they could do it right now and they'll get the site. But how much do you care? I mean, that. well, the, to me, the real question is how much better is the end of an error getting? And do the, uh, uh, the cheap cards that you would be destroying of your own have really any value? I air towards I, I would I think that I would play it here because I just don't the other stuff you've got just doesn't have a whole lot of value and your hand's not got a ton going on. Um but it looks like DQD wants to give it a moment's pause. <laughs> yeah, these players are playing carefully, no doubt about it. Well um, the, the the major risk I guess of going for it is if there's um some sort of sacrifice and response, you have very little show for it. So the, it might be an issue of wanting to wait until there's a seventh card. So you have some coverage against Devour or something similar. That makes sense. Yep. Yeah, it's it's not just when you play End of an Era. It's also about when how many there are that it actually kills. And so something being sacrificed would swing it back. Now, bit of a bit of a development here as Dark Avenger has picked up the Rat King. A couple of ways you could use that. You could either... Try to use your rats to kill the Rat King, kill the other rats, shrink down the Dunehill clan into a better blocking range. But we're not going to play it, and now Dark Revenger finds another Huntmaster Vikram. I guess the question is how much do they even gain from using it right here? It's not like their health total is low or... Um, there's much progress being made on the board if you were to steal uh, Dune Hill Clan. So they're going to hold it. <laughs> Something's going to break this at some point, but well, I'm not sure what. Alright, there's Shrivel. <laughs> yeah, a lot of what's happening right now is uh, a function of the Dune Hill Clan not attacking. Because if you're in Dark Revenger's position, um, DQD is signaling to you the prospect of you blocking with the Rat King and uh, the Waystone Igniter is so bad that I'm not willing to attack with the 5-5. Five five. What's the card that could most that's most likely to make DQD feel that way if they have End of an Era? Okay, but now if I think they have End of an Era in their hand, now there's not a lot of value to be gained by playing the Rat King or trying to fire off the Huntmaster Vikram. And uh, there's not a whole lot of incentive for DQD to move because their holdings are so strong right now. And Dark Revenger really can't play very much stuff that, like, what's the rush, right? So now we have this weird holding pattern. Yeah, I mean, I guess if now if Dark Revenger were to use Vikram... Maybe your Krogar can attack, but <laughs> this is definitely one of the stranger games we've seen in a while, Patrick. Yeah, and I mean, DQD at this point also can set up just at a moment's notice, uh, end of an era fully kicked. So again, 
Dark Avengers eventually got to be doing something. Um, there could be another Dune Hill clan. There could just be um, a lot of ways for them to break open at this point. And DQD has a lot of ways to uh, punish Dark Avenger should they be committing more to the table. <laughs> so I think it's got to be a long time now since either player has played anything with the exception of that one Krogar which silenced the, the Rat King. We are getting to the point where one of these players is going to have to make a player. They're going to have to discard a card from their hand. Didn't didn't really anticipate the game going this way. It seemed like at one point Dark Revenger was close to winning. <laughs> All right, there's another Rat King. So two Needs Faithfuls, three Rat Kings, a Field Medic, and a Haunt Master Vikram on one side. And then a bit more variety on the other side, I suppose. All of the sort of like like – consistent removal effects are in DQD's hand. So it, it certainly makes sense for Dark Revenger's side why it's hard to envision like you can really make much progress when you can't even really do much to kill the things that you want to. Right. Now Cloud Scraper. Very few flyers. I'm not sh I don't think these Zenith decks we ever see them play a flyer either of them. I'm trying to think. Any, I mean, there's nest tokens, I suppose. Yeah, I guess nest tokens. Yeah, that's that's a good example. But yeah, wasp doesn't really count, I would say. Yes, right, scorpion wasp, sure. All right, well, DQD found it in them to play a cloud scraper. Actually, I mean, this is actually enough um, action now where it's possible DQD would want to attack with a 5-5 five, five and a 6-5 the next turn. This might for Stark Revenger to do something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have Shrivel and uh, Display of Will if you want to kill something, but... Not, not yet. <laughs> We we haven't asked for a, de a cards and deck count yet. Maybe maybe we'll just get a quick one. Just we got thirty five on one side and thirty four on the other. So could who's, be a few more turns of this, Patrick. Who's uh who's the one in trouble right now? Uh, From the decking perspective, a dark revenger. Okay. So we played a Krogar, and I guess we're going to use this on Vikram because because of that makes it harder to get a Vikram back with Through the Unknown. Right. All right. I mean, is this an issue with of open list means DQD knows that Dark Avenger actually can't break through from the spot, not in a way that doesn't just have them get blown out by End of an Era or Saloon Massacre. From Dark Revenger side, I'm saying from DQD side because we're we're in a spot here where like. There are some attacks that look fine, even if you assume Dark Revenger has something or other uh, to respond to the attack with. And if Dark Revenger is not attacking, does it mean that DQD feels like they literally can't break through this? Like, it's 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 solved? Because this is extremely passive play if you think your opponent has some way to get out. If they don't, then, like, then it makes sense. So I'm curious what the, uh, what the thinking is here. Uh, yeah. It's a good question. Because it sure looks like, uh, based on Dark Avenger's hand and, uh, and, uh, board, that they actually can't break through this. Like, that's a, th this may be correct. To say nothing of DQD actually being able to respond with, you know, removal spells and sweepers and what have you in the event that 
Revenger was to make the move. Yeah. And draw and, and a revenge unit doesn't really change any of the calculus. Um because right. you draw an extra card that turn, but the first card you drew was a card you put back into your deck. Right. It could matter if it gets very low for both players because it could give you some padding if it's the if it's like within the gap that you the edge that you have on someone, but largely it doesn't matter. Well, once it if it's the last card, it has to go to the literal bottom. If it's any higher, it undoes. No, the it gap. has to be in in the last n cards where n is the number of cards that they're ahead of you. By oh, sure. Okay. So, yeah. So, another Krogar Silence, that Rat King. Dinosaur Nest. Um, I mean, there's Waystone Igniter, so that's going to get answered. Right. I mean, this could be one of the, you know, oh, well, that could produce a flying unit, which could theoretically break out of this. Not in practice, but this might be enough to get something out of um, out of DQD. Again, I, 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 I'm now at the, I'm now the opinion that DQD just has to feel like Dark Revenger is is decked at this point. That they can't draw an extra card. That they they can't do anything about the the gap in the deck size, and they have no way to break out of the stalemate. So they didn't kill the Waystone Igniter. Uh, they didn't use Waystone Igniter to kill the Dinosaur Nest. Yeah, I mean, I guess you still have End of an Era, right? So right, you can always clean up a lot that that way. Um, Zito came back took, hit the waste on igniter I imagine both these players they can't have either one of them can't have much power left in their deck though I guess we don't know how many times they've inscribed this game neither of these play, neither of these decks play a ton of inscribed cards I guess call the hit is one of the most common but yeah and Cloud Scraper. <laughs> well, it feels like all of a very high percentage of the weirdest games we've ever had on an open have been Xenon. Yeah. I, it, it's weird. Like when we had the Cultist Mirrors um, back in like set Flame of Zalta Expedition. We've had Zine and Reanimator mirrors be really wonky. Um, something about them. Black Maw Carnosaur. <laughs> DQD just... Yeah, I, I think you're right, Patrick, about... DQD could be trying to take advantage of the fact that like they kind of have had more giants and be have been doing attackings and trading off in that area and like using shrivels to clear up double blocks and things like that. But I think they just think they can't lose. Yeah. Which bold, but you know. All right, so now Waste Zone Igniter comes down. So I mean it if a if the nest never flips, it takes so long for that one one to do anything because you got to keep in mind like every, every Krogar that's played is undoing like five attacks, <clears throat> and with a board like this, a single field medic is going to be equivalent to like half your remaining possible turns. Right. So yeah, gain twenty. And, yeah, I mean, there's Field Medic. And so think about this for Dark Avenger side. Let, let's say for the sake of, you know, speculation that what DKD is up, he is, they are literally trying to just time, um, force their opponent to lose due to not being able to win the game, even if they could draw all of the rest of their cards in their deck. Mm-hmm. 
how does that change things the way you play the game if you're Dark Revenger? Because, you know, you've been playing this Xena deck and really a fantastic deck in terms of being able to interact with a variety of card types, interact with units big and small. And you've got maybe been able to win just by through the leftovers a lot through this event. But now you're up against an opponent who's kind of said, I'm better at doing that than you are. Well, and they're also aware of it. I mean, it looked like DQD settled into this plan somewhere around 40 cards left in deck. Which means that it wasn't, you know, once you once you get down to, you know, 8, 9, 10 cards. It's pretty typical for players to take a look and start actually thinking about this. For DQD to do this at, at you know, 40 cards left means that they have essentially a checklist of when have I actually established a lock here. And uh, you have to play a little bit differently once your opponent signals that they have that level of awareness of what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of the differences in the deck list that we've observed is DQD has some sweepers like End of an Era and Saloon Massacre, which make it really punishing for Dark Revenger to an extended advantage. And they have maybe a little bit more in the way of spot removal with shrivels and display of wills that can kill key units. And that is kind of what's making a bit of the difference here. Um, now, we did see Dark Revenger on their last turn play out one of the Rat Kings. In the end. They've had Rat Kings forever. And what they've started doing with it is they've started shrinking down um, these giants first Duno clan and now Krogar and maybe that can make a difference because they're still going to live through end of an era oh my gosh Duno clan that's the other one yeah of course how could we not mention that one in terms of what is allowing DQD to play this atypical way yeah I mean it's the it's maybe the simplest card or unit in on either deck four cost five five endurance unleash but it does seem to be having a profound impact now DQD is making a big attack here, but that might just be because we've got this Dunehill clan plan ready to go. Right. Is there any sort of lifesteal on the way back? If not, any damage you get through, any trades is, you know, sensibly valuable. And yeah, it's interesting watching this in action because, okay, you have End of an Arrow, right? That's just a card you can play in your Zen mid-range deck. does some stuff. Dunehill clan, sure. No, that's, you know, again the removal spells, all this, you would look at the deck list and just go, yeah, sure, all these cards make sense. But the combination of all of them here in the in the mirror match or semi-mirror does sort of look like part of the range is you're hard locked, and once I have deck lists, I can identify when that moment is and just play that way. Yeah, and we've been talking about DQD trying to literally deck Dark Revenger, but it might not be the case that they need to literally deck them. What, we, what we're seeing here is that getting into a spot where you can just play out like all of the power in both players' decks means the Dunehill clan is an enormous source of advantage. Right. <laughs> all right, so we're going to see Dunehill clan get played five times, presumably. And if you are worried about running out of cards here, then you really can't play the Devourers. You sort of had to push the game into a place where DQD is forced to play their Devourer first. But again, if DQD is, is conscious of the decking thing, then that's just not going to happen. Right, yeah. I mean, do you think you're actually going to get... If, you, if you're Dark Revenger, it's very fine to make a decision that you just think you're not going to be able to win by, like, forcing DQD to lose the decking race. And so at that, that point, maybe you play the Devourers. Um, it seems like maybe Devourers and Through the Unknowns are the cards that Dark Revenger is playing a little more of. And so this very careful um, work with the, the Rat Kings just shrinking down these Giants into 4-4 four, four range, making it so the blocks are a little more viable. Uh, Dark Revenger has not played out this Black Maw Carnosaur they've had for a while. They've been pretty protective of that one. So Dark Revenger not going to play anything else out. 
So there's no Rack Kings in hand or active. So here we go. End of an era. That only kills five things? No, that's six. Seven. Because there's still the nest. Oh. So does the second devour? No, that it was exact. Sorry, it was exactly six things. Which, yeah, but I mean, again, if if DQD's perspective is again, you're you're locked, you're getting deck. Yeah, go ahead, play devour. Who cares? And again, a silence on the Vikram here, making sure that if it's getting recurred, it's not going to be with a text box. Interesting. So that whole play was not to set up an attack, and now we'll see Krogar. This isn't silencing anything. This is just to get some stuff down. Now we'll see another Rat King come down. And it's going to shrink another Giant down to 4-4 four, four range. So is DQD going to kind of settle in? Maybe just kill the Rat King and move on? Are you going to try to, you know, if you make a big attack and you get a bunch of 4-4 four, four giants running into X-5 giants, Saloon Massacre means they all trade off. Well, I can't imagine wanting to do anything that that's, that's sort of like that modest at this point. All the cards in hand, if I'm in DQD's position, all the cards in hand that act as like really powerful uh, insurance policies like Saloon Massacre, I'm not looking to just generate kind of a an okay exchange with it. It is a, you know, break glass in case of emergency uh, style effect. And so the the notion of, you know, push through damage and maybe there's some blocks that go a certain way and you can minus one, minus one to good effect, that could all be true, but that just doesn't seem to align with the game plan here that's being exercised. All right, what are we looking at for deck counts, Tim? Get an update here. Now we're at 20 for DQD and 18 for Dark Revenger. So another Krogar for Dark Revenger. They've got the big wheel, and it's just like you look at their hand, and it's like, man, they just have card after card where it's like, I don't know how they're going to take advantage of this. Though, if Dark Revenger has a Saloon Massacres, has a Saloon Massacre in their deck, it's a pretty different equation because right now it would be killing – Six giants, if you get some more material out, it could be killing even more. I, but I just, I have to assume at this point that, again, it's it, it, DQD's perspective is, is, is it's deterministic. We've seen too many turns at this point where there are an array of attacks that look fine, even if Dark Revenger has Devour, even if they have Field Magnet, even if they follow up with Highmaster Vikram. And to not avail yourselves of those attacks at any point, to me, is that the it's just the signal of, like, I do not believe you can win from here. And we have not seen Dark Adventure draw a card yet that would suggest otherwise. Everything is a unit on the ground, a removal spell, a way to draw cards, whatever. There's nothing that's giving them a different dimension in this game. Even something like Dunehill Clan could theoretically be, you know, Oh, I could imagine how this game would go in a certain way where if they drew it and made five of them and X, Y, and Z happen, then uh, that that could be concerning or whatever. So um, if, if DQD is playing so passively, it's it's got to be that even that range of things is not on the table. Yeah, I suppose one route for Dark Avenger is that if you were to successfully – even like an eavesdrop, if eavesdrop or Huntmaster Vikram could successfully steal and get a Dunehill clan into your void and then you threw the unknown it, that's a pretty big game. But it has not seemed – I don't think we've seen either of those cards out of Dark Adventure. Obviously, we've seen Vikram, sorry. I don't think we've seen eavesdrop. And with Vikram, it's just not going to be very plausible that Vikram will survive um, – long enough for the other unit to, for you to sacrifice the stolen unit right so black muck carnosaur does come down it is a six six um life uh, not life steal deadly taunt right now so there's no clean blocks against it but it does seem like dark avenger 
um, has the capabilities of throwing two units in front of it to just to trade with it that way. Yeah, it doesn't seem that threatening to me. No, I'll, I'll say that much. Well, Ooh. impending doom, um, not exactly a clock because... Because yeah. of what? Well, there's not enough turns left. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. So Huntmaster Vikram's going after the Rat King. Um, Dark Avenger can deal with it by devouring the Rat King or call the hitting the Vikram. Mm -hmm. So they're just going to call to hit the Vikram. And Waystone Igniter takes out the dinosaur nest. Is Impending Doom going to get in? Or was it played this turn? I think it was just played this turn. Yep. Yeah. There's another the big wheel drawn, but Dark Avenger. And so playing out this Waystone Igniter gives um, DQD the possibility of being able to double block. But this is where things get kind of hairy because it's like you're going to use – if you're going to use the Rat King to kill the Waystone Igniter, okay, what are you sacrificing? You only have big units. And if you do manage to find something good to sacrifice to it, maybe you play out a Field Medic and just gain a bunch of health. Well, what if they just have a Field Medic? Then you're not even getting that far. Right. Yeah, there's no... I mean, uh, DQD has so much... Basically, so much stuff laying around that there's no way to sort of, like make tactical progress by knocking out the weakest blocker and then forcing a different range of double blocks. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, that was a really terrible exchange for Dark Avenger. It um, traded with one-fifth of the Dunho clan and a Waystone Igniter that killed a dinosaur nest. But this is the spot that Dark Avengers found themselves in. DQD yeah. has has kind of said, I put you into effective checkmate. I mean, Impending Doom isn't even attacking. Right. And it's not like there's a ton of reason why, except for the fact that from DQD's perspective, once you've won the game on one axis, why risk that to try to win the game on a second axis? Love it. <laughs> All right, well, now we're going to get in there. I mean, I think getting that field medic was a big help just because it really removes the possibility that you're dying anytime soon. Right, it's a, it's a, it's the, I mean, I think it's been checkmate now for 20 turns, but it's... Yeah, and you just see all these saloon massacres. Dark Revenger can never pull that far ahead on board because it would just get all unwound. Like, if they were to just try to use everything through everything they had at that problem, it just wouldn't get for them anywhere. So now what are we at for decks? We'll have to we gotta just keep checking in on this because Dark Avenger is good at running yellow on time. Yeah, it's now the twelve to fourteen. Quick check to see if they want to inscribe anything or just sort of hold every uh, hold all their action. Yeah, it's weird. The Evelina. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what this is about. They're just gonna saloon massacre twice. Take that, the Rat King. I guess if you Saloon Massacre one more time, you don't kill anything of yours, but you get some stuff in to call the hit range. <laughs> yeah, I could not say exactly what's going on here. Okay, well, they just... So we... for, for 
just just so we're keeping score, DQD just used two saloon massacres to kill one the Rat King. Yeah. That had been in play for a while, but hadn't activated in many turns. You know. Can't take it with you, you know. Uh, apparently apparently not. not. Apparently not. Um And if you're Dark Revenger, this is uh, you're you're kind of hoping that maybe there's a mistake made. Yeah, like I, maybe something weird happens. I'm, I'm not getting that vibe. It doesn't seem like it. I mean, honestly, like DQD has used, I would say, a couple of cards now in the last ten turns, like not that effectively. The two saloon massacres <laughs> and the end of an era didn't do that much. Right. And it didn't seem ideal. There was a period of time where, like, Rat Kings were kind of going and were shrinking down our Dune Hill clans to make it so they couldn't attack into these things. But it just really hasn't mattered because it doesn't re- – it the, the, the Dune Hill clans were just so much equity. Right. And – these card draw cards in hand, like the Devours and the Big Wheels, you just can't play them. So we got a little bit of action getting across now as this 1-1 one, one Flyers come across. No Waystone Igniter at the moment. So there is a possibility of this Dinosaur Nest flipping, but if it doesn't produce a second Flyer, it's definitely got, it's really got no shot. <laughs> I mean, DQD is in range of falling below their starting health total. I mean, they're at 28, so. Yeah. Yeah, those on the ropes. <laughs> the deck is red for Dark Revenger. So, they're getting warned by the game. Like, if you want to go and win this one, you might want to do it soon. Right. There's also some – there's got to be some level of, like, do you know something I don't know? Like, TQD has put their cards on the table now for 20, 30 minutes or whatever. Yeah. You can't win. There, is Dark Revenger under the impression that they can win? Because it, it sure I, doesn't look like it, like, given this, the, the cards they have to work with. Yeah, it's 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 hard to say. Okay. So th- maybe this is a moment when something's happening because R- Dark Revenger is elected to use one of their cards. So somehow they did get their hands on a Dune Hill clan. I don't know when that happened, but that must have happened. It must have been through a Vikram a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And there is only one Saloon Massacre left in hand. Now... There's a lot of blocking that you can do to really mess this up. Yeah, I have. Uh, I the, the the defending player is definitely advantaged in the Dune Hill Clan mirror. Yeah. So we're gonna see six giants get made, filling up the board. Now one more point comes across mm-hmm. with this dinosaur. The dinosaur nest is flipping next turn. So if Dark Revenger was ever going to do something, it's going to be probably next turn. But you look at their hand, and it's they don't really have ways to bolster this attack. They can follow up with a Krogar. You know, the field medic would ins- definitely I mean, ensure that they're not losing on any kind of counterattack. But it's just... How much can this actually do for them? We'll see. There's a time I was, uh, this Dune Hill clan moment is taking me back. There was a time I was playing in a tournament for a different card game, and we were playing a reanimation style deck. Mm-hmm. And someone suggested a, uh, a particular unit for the mirror. In the you know in the in the market, and I was like that doesn't that doesn't sound really good, but whatever, uh, you know I'll try it. It's fine, you know. So the whole team has this card too, and um, we're huddling up after one of the rounds, and someone's like, "I played the mirror," 
and we're all like, oh, what happened? And it was like, I lost. And we're like, oh, was the card for the market any good? And our teammate goes, well, my opponent killed it and then reanimated it and then killed me with it, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's one way to go about business <laughs> where are we at uh, I guess this is DQD's turn they got 11 9 yeah that makes sense impending doom coming in sweet this this kind of reminds me a lot of the um of that game between the Raiders and the Chargers where it was like if there was a tie both teams would make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Alpha Attack by Dark Revenger. Interesting. So DQD is not playing Field Medic because if so you block you can't play Field Medic. Okay, now they're playing Field Medic. Yeah, I like playing Field Medic here. Yeah, gain 22. You have 12 units. I have 10 units. Contract 2. Field Medic is invulnerable to damage this turn, and you gain health equal to the number of units. Yeah, this is just, just so much double blocking going on right now. DQD's got to be careful here. You do not want a timeout on this block. No. They're working on it. 10, 20, the double 30, saloon massacre to kill the Rat King feels like might have been a... I don't know. I don't mind just sort of taking an action for the sake of it <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> I feel like they Was might... that play correct? I doubt it. Yeah. I mean, looking back on it now, where if you had another saloon massacre in your hand, you could never, ever lose. And now it's like yeah. you could... You could at least misclick through blocks and lose, but yeah. Do I mind? You know, I like showing the racking who's boss. I don't mind that. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Better hope you you don't uh, you don't die here. <laughs> okay, see how this washes out. <laughs> so right now we're waiting to see if Dark Revenger wants to play Devour, um, because... One of the units was getting eaten by the Black Maw Carnosaur. So how much damage we do here? 18. That's not shabby. That's, that's not shabby. No. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the lowest we've seen anybody in a very long time. Yeah. And uh, Impending Doom still just trucking along here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We are getting close uh, to the point where if DQD were to hit with Impending Doom every turn for the rest of the game, um, Dark Revenger would deck before they died. Mm -hmm. Good to be tracking at that. <laughs> we're not there yet, but we're, <laughs> we're not that far. I think one more field medic is basically means it's impending doom can't win the game. Now, obviously impending doom isn't the only unit capable of attacking, but oh, it is baseball. not the only unit uh, capable of attacking. But it seems like the only one uh, ideologically committed to attacking. I'll yeah. say that. Yeah. Here it comes. 
Just one more, one more shot. <laughs> one more shot. Nope. Got to wait. Yeah, I guess if once we're at the point where you literally can't win by attacking anymore, you might as well block. That makes some sense to me. Yeah. I mean, DQD doesn't have, like, infinite tools to keep themselves alive. They have no field medics in hand. They have call the hits, which do almost nothing. They have a display of will. Like, they they have run out of a lot of their keep me alive tools. Um, yeah, I mean, again, the, the Saloon Massacre, you know, I don't really know. You don't know about that one? Well, you know, the way it played out. I don't, it doesn't probably matter ultimately that much. But. It's Dark Revenger going to sacrifice here. It would have to be to devour. Yeah, why, why bother? Okay. They're in. So, I mean, I think Dark Revenger thinks that they might have a window here. Like, if they're going to win the game, it's going to be in the next. Like, it, it has to be pushing on the spot that they're in right now a right. little bit more. And at that point, is it going to be the number of attacks that limits you? Or might it be that you there's a good card, a couple of cards down, that could help push it over the finish line? The Black Maw Carnosaur on the other side is the really annoying one. And we're gonna see, and so they're gonna probably need to use Devour again to s maybe stop that one from getting life steal. But yeah, I guess we have at least gotten to the point to to Dark Revenger's credit that the game is within a mistake to win. Again, you know, it's uh, it's got to go a bunch of different ways. But like you said, if if uh, DQD blocks in such a way where you know, they're they're just banking on the sixth health from uh, their unit, and a devour breaks it up. Whatever, um, it is plausible for there to be you know a miss block. There's at least that much. Yeah. All right. So, field medic gonna try to eat that. I mean, not much is getting through. Right now, it's it's 11 is getting through. Um, but there is still a Krogar on DQD's side that hasn't blocked and could easily block a Cloud Scraper or a Krogar. The timer's on Dark Revenger, so it looks like these blocks are final. I guess the big question right now is whatever the Carnosaur is blocking... Is that going to get devoured? And it looks like yes, because if you don't, that's another um, six points of health back at DQD. Well, also, once you've committed yourself to the first devour, you're sort of committing yourself to the follow-up devour. Sure. Well, there's through the unknown. So how interesting thing do things get now? Because that means we're going to get another Dunho clan turn. The question is, is it right now? If no, it's they're gonna set it up for next turn, right? But what are they at now? Because they played a couple of devours, right? Yeah, they're at thirty nine. Three cards left. Th yeah. Which I guess means that DQD has the luxury to play their own devour if they're feeling so inclined. Yeah, I mean, there's the possibility there's still another saloon massacre in deck, and now, yeah, DQD can definitely play at least one devour. I mean, they. They're not even red, and they're the other person's at th and Dark Avengers have three cards left in deck. There's impending doom. The Evelina has just been there forever. It's it is now making an appearance. Okay. This is definitely got to set the record for the longest game we've ever covered. In any tournament ever, I'd be really surprised if um, it wasn't it, and I couldn't recall what the one actually yeah, was. This is this is really weird. Okay, um, right. And if TQD wins, we are going to see a game three. <laughs> well, 
thanks for joining us on your Sunday, everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. If, if you're just joining us, do you, you ever see that Joe Buck tweet where he's like, <laughs> "Welcome to the bottom of the 47th inning." <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, through the unknown, gets back Dune Hill clan. Mm-hmm. Field medic. Yep, a little more cushion. Why are they getting so much stuff on the board? If they want to play Dune Hill clan, they're going to need to sack stuff. I mean, I imagine they're just like, attack. are they attacking first? I don't Yeah, I, I guess. If they're going to do this, I don't know. Is this, does this attack do anything other than allow DQD to gain some health? Three, four, five, six, seven against seven. And yeah, I think this is, um, this is, a, I believe this is a chump attack. Well, what's happening with the two cloud scrapers? We're getting six, but then the two cloud scrapers. Yeah, okay. And I imagine we are seeing a devourer on front of that other carnosaur. So, in, in the end, I mean, we're going to see a giant trade for a giant. The rest is going to be eats, and then you're going to be gaining, be netting two, I guess. But we're it's going to be six giants. I mean, if DQD has another do no clan, just throw throw out the book. And we're not done making the blocks. Okay. So we're going to reconfigure the blocks. You're going to put Dune Hill Clan and I think the 3-3 three, three Field Medic or the Evelina in front of the Cloud Scraper. Mm-hmm. So now you're dealing with all of the biggins. You can even call the hit a, a Nahid's Faithful if you want. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense that you would want to devour first the Vikram, see what's coming. Shrivel. Ooh, well, that changes things. Sort of. No, it does not. It's just another thing that would cause you to consider. I mean, if you shrivel the the uh, the Cloud Scraper. Yeah, then you can call the hit. Yeah, that's why it's interesting, because now it's another thing to think about. So they took two here from the Nahid's Faithful. You know, keep that in mind. All right. Here, here they, here they come. So six more gigantes coming at you from Dune Hill. <laughs> All right, and it's back to DQD's turn. Huntmaster Vikram. Mm, that's a good one here. That is a good one. It's like two Dunehill clans. Also, an attack from the Black Maw Carnosaur is pretty spicy. Oh, they're taking a Black Maw Carnosaur. That shuts off Taunt. Mm-hmm. Or does it? No, it doesn't. Excuse me. They're still down on units. But if you attack with the Black Maw, they have to trade off two Giants for it. Oh, there's a Hunt Master Vicar. I mean, that's going to get called a hit. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. It doesn't do anything. You don't have a lot of decisions here if you're Dark Revenger. It does exhaust the unit, though. I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah, we got a a lot coming across. I'm also. It also seems like the Evelina should have attacked last turn, right? Because you either the they either block and attacked, trade, yeah. or you get a five-five. Yeah. And it, uh, as a blocker, it only chumps. I don't know. Some stuff's happening. Gotta say. Yeah. Strange I mean, day at Windswept Fields. <laughs> I mean, what, 
next turn, both Black Maws are going to be online. I also think the Black Maw should have attacked. You sure, yeah, I think that's at least like, oh, I can imagine the pros and cons yeah. of one thing versus the other. The Evelina is just a straight, like, it has no value as a blocker, and it has some value as an attacker. Who will be Isner? Who will be, was it Mahut? Was it the, do you remember that tennis match? It's the one that Wimbledon lasted like five uh, days or something. My, I, I refer to the match of uh, the tennis match in the Royal Tenet Bombs just now. <laughs> the, he's taking off his shoes and one of his socks. Down to three. Okay. Strange day is a windswept. Waystone igniter. <laughs> Multiple blockers. I think he's crying. It turned off taunt. Okay. Last card. <laughs> Is there any way that that's enough? Because that gets back a Vikram, right? Yeah, you get to exhaust something. It's not enough. Yeah, because you exhaust one of them. Yeah. And now it's four blockers against five attackers, but you do gain your six. And there's also a Devour in all of this, too, as a like additional cushion. So. <sighs> You, you know. get back Dune Hill Clan, go for another ride, but yeah, no, this is just not going to be enough for Dark Avenger. DQD is going to win this game and tie up this match. Oh, that removes two, but not really. Yeah, that doesn't even really work. But that was that would be a better play than stealing a, a Carnosaur. Right. That play. That yeah. That play is sick. If the game was bugged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the big wheels. Taking off his shoes and. You got to take two. One of his socks. What what faction points there, are you making? There we go. There we and go. And Dark Avenger has lost due to the rule that when a player ends a turn with no cards left in their deck, they lose the game. DQD has won, tied up this best of three game at a game apiece in the longest game in Eternal Tournament history. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and just say that. Without consulting the record books, but it's got to be. And I, I can't even fathom if game three goes to decking. What's gonna, what might come out of our mouths? Oh, it's not that big of a deal. I, I'm, I will walk out at some point. And then we can do the top four or not. So <laughs> I'm not super worried about it. That's, that's <laughs> not my problem. That is not my problem. You know? Yeah. How are you doing besides? I. It's bringing me flashbacks to a, to uh, AP European history, reading about trench warfare in World War I, mm -hmm. where if you, if you made, like, where gains were measured in inches and feet for territory. The weapons had, <laughs> sorry, the tactics had not caught up to the weapons. <laughs> True. Yeah. What's the best thing we could think of doing? It's just walk in a straight line towards <laughs> their weaponry. That's the best. That's the best thing that we had still. I, I was reading the other day that they uh, they built fake trees that they would they would like take pictures of a tree on the battlefield, like, mm -hmm. and then they would go and build a replica of it, and then at night like swap out like the dead like tree stump with one that a soldier could be inside and he would need to be in there all day and then they would use that where he could scout enemy locations because you know with trench war you wouldn't know exactly where the enemy was in the trenches and then we'd use that to call out artillery strikes that's sweet yeah kind of wild um but not doesn't really have anything to do with this game what does <laughs> yeah, what do you want to? Uh, we can talk about. I mean, yeah, there's the summer sale is still going on. It was going on at the beginning of that game. It's still going on. Yeah. We didn't even see the beginning of that game. Keep in mind, we right. came into we that in. game when there was like mm -hmm. forty cards left in deck. Mm -hmm. I will say this: as you see, the fox in the forest here, direwolf summer sale that's running from June 23rd to July 7th, so it's active right now. You have a steam and get a. Uh, 
a number of Direwolf's offerings of digital uh, ports of physical games that we have worked alongside. Uh, many of these creators, award-winning games, 50% uh, off a these games across all platforms except for the Fox in the Forest, which is only 30% off for reasons that were not um, given to me. So make sure to check out the Dark Wolf Summer Sale over at Steam right now, June 23rd, which is, you know, inside of that range right now to July 7th. Raiders of the North Sea, Root, and others. And others. There we go. Sagrada. Yeah. So, as predicted, the uh, the players have uh, taken a moment before joining Game Three. Yeah, you know, I will. What I do appreciate about that is, you know, DQD said, you know, forty minutes ago, you're going to get decked. I know you can't get out. Was every single play from there flawless? Maybe not. Was it unnecessarily risky using two saloon massacres to kill a silenced the Rat King? It wasn't silenced. It w oh, it wasn't silenced. Oh, come, that would be outrageous. Perhaps not. But they were correct <laughs> that the game was essentially locked up at the point where they started playing uh, very defensively. And, yeah. um, you know, it went the way that it went, uh, which is really worrisome for, for Dark Revenger. If your opponent has that level of intimacy with the matchup, given your deck list, that they can identify from that point of they're they're done and you know dark revenger really was all on the ground they don't have ways to break up any a stalemate no really evasive units besides the stray flyer off the dinosaur nest and so you know it's a uh, gotta be a little nerve-wracking your opponent sort of identifying that sort of leak in your deck not necessarily leak because the deck's built however it's built but um that they have identified that vulnerability so quickly here we go. They're back. Dark Revenger, turn one, no play. And that is because they want to play a dinosaur nest on turn two. Yeah. This is this is the look of a game where DQD might just get pummeled by dinosaur nests in like five minutes. It's the definite possibility. Their hand is rancid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, do you play Conclave getting time this turn? It feels like... It, I mean, it, it's... You're not in a rush to play Field Medic. I think the yeah. problem is you're priced into going back-to-back -back Sultan Conclaves and then passing, at which point, one, you're pretty far away from um, the display, but two, it's so obvious what you're doing that you're not going to get anything of value off of it. Just keep going. Keep going. And the good news for Dark Revenger is that if the... If the dinosaur nest didn't immediately get waystone ignited, it promises big things for the big wheel. Mm -hmm. That's right. Shrivel takes out waystone igniter. Zito Cabal House Cat. Yes. Cabal leaders have pets too. Yeah. It's a rich and deep world. They're just, they're just like you. They just they have a different <laughs> job. Oh God! Now we're now we're settling in. Did not hit power number four for the big wheel, Dark Revenger. Just don't attack, don't block. Just say go. You can't attack. You can't block either. Uh oh. Igniter. So now it's interesting with the igniter because you could kill the dinosaur nest before it flips, or you could not. They don't know about the big wheel. On the other hand. So they're going to kill it. And now they get their second time influence, so Field Medic will be online. Power number four could be coming in the way of Call the Hit being inscribed. It is. Do you want to make this attack with these Dinos? Nope, because I have no interest in putting Waste on Igniter into the Void, where it could possibly recur if my plan here is to just play the big wheel and grind out extra cards. I'm not sure that DQD has... Um, through the unknown. I think all the copies might be on Dark Revenger. I know we didn't see any last game. Oh. Well, if you wanted to play Nahid's Faithful, I also wouldn't do it because, you know, you have a 4-4 uh, four, four against a 2-1. Sure. So, either way, my analysis is unassailable. I would never. No assailing. All right. The big wheel is here. But Waystone Igniter 
has come off the top of the deck. Mm -hmm. And the hopes of Dark Revenger pulling ahead in this game have been stymied by the one-cost Radiant. Good news is that Dark Revenger might just like miss second time influence and die pretty quickly here. But we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Got to think about this call to hit. A lot of implications. A lot of ins, a lot of outs, a lot of what have you's. Yeah, if you don't play Nahid's Faithful and sack and like sack the um the dinosaur. Oh wow. So this faithful might just trade off with an igniter. So we're gonna see faithful number two make a four four here. Yeah. And this lets you hold up three. Oh my. Impending doom. Good god almighty, a thing that can attack. Yeah, and Dark Revenger doesn't have a Cloud Scraper in hand. And they don't have a second time influence for one if they did. Now, they're going to start munching on it with the Rat King, as you can imagine. Slow way to do it, though. It is a slow way to do it. It's not called Immediate Doom, though. It's just Impending Doom. Impending Doom. Yeah. Alley. Wow. Wow. Cat is back. And now you can use Rat King to shrink Rat King to call the hit the Rat King. I apologize for not saying the Rat King with every time. It's an honorary title. Oh, it is. Right. Okay. Well, this is a this is a thing that I bring up all the time in our creative meetings about the 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 names we give. It's like yeah. is this an honorary title or not? So you know what I'm talking about here. Yes, I've been in I've been in those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> that that's... me just rapid firing off ten completely unusable names. <sighs> yeah, there was one where you just. It was the giant. Yeah. Which which uh, which one was it? Well, it was from uh, it was from Unleashed. It was um. Was it it was a Dune Hill Clan? I think it was it Enraged Tower Tall. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's the one where I said those, those name suggestions aren't even in the drafts. They're just, they're just not okay. And you sent no. me Giant Dullard so many times. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're not calling a card Giant Dullard. Smooth brain Giant. No, we can't call it that either. No, no. Yeah, that was that was the one I wasn't even gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> but you said it. Yeah, can't risk attacking with the. Uh... Oh, there's you don't need to play around field mech there because Dark Revenger doesn't have second time influence. But, you know, what are you going to do? Not a big deal. What can you do? Well, I sort of suggested just a, the free attack. Oh, yeah, that, well, that, sure. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> what, were, what, were the, uh, what were the pitches for Cackling Hustler? Was it Alacritus Hustler? <laughs> 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 yeah which we is could, actually a sick name just people don't know what the word alacritus means we could set up a localization for just you like your names because like, right? we, <laughs> we have like simplified chinese and regular chinese um we could do <laughs> english sullivan well funny enough you should mention that um when i was uh at Upper Deck many, many moons ago, I would occasionally write some, you know, design articles in the same way that I do now, um, except they were, like, badly written and worse, but essentially the same responsibilities. And uh, we got a call from the German office that was like, we can't translate these articles. There's too many, uh, <laughs> too, too too many, many SAT words or whatever. So, uh, Dark Revenger, Missing Second Time Influence. I think DQD's got this. Oh, yeah. They, you know, all king aside, they they played the two games we watched pretty brilliantly, I would say. At least the second, at least game number two was, was great. Oh, yeah. Everything is coming in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
What's Dark Avenger at? They're at six? Yeah, I can't even believe it. Here we go. What you got? Can they draw anything? Well, they can play Krogar in there. That's their best draw. Yeah, t time is their best. Time influence is their best draw, so we'll see from there. Wow. Just a pretty quick beatdown right there. Nothing, nothing, uh, nothing too fancy there. Yeah. Display a will. You could throw out the field medic for good measure. But Dark Avenger has conceded. This match goes to DQD. And, yeah. Um, Closing thoughts before we go to a break and get ready for the semifinals. I mean, that, that that game, too, you know, like, you know, all kidding aside, and, you know, obviously it took a very long time and all that. It is really impressive to identify that early on in the game that your opponent's locked out. Yeah. Like, that is – you have to have a familiarity with the matchup and such an analysis of your – like, being able to spot, looking at a deck list, okay, what are their ways to get out of a – let's assume the game's gummed down on the on the board. The, the, you really can't attack very profitably on the ground. What are the ways to break that open? And if DQ is able to look through your deck list and go like, no, you're missing all the potential cards that are breakers here, but be it end of an era, be it, you know, saloon massacre, or whatever the cards are, if you can identify like, oh, they're just not here, you can make that sort of read very early on. And that that is legitimately like really hard to do and really impressive. It took me a couple of turns to see, to kind of figure out what was going on there because I'm like, there's no way that they know that Dark Revengers just locked here this early. That's That would be a really hard thing to deduce, but with open deck lists and uh, familiarity with the mirror match, they were able to do it, and now they're on to the top four. All right. Oh, I I totally forgot. A any matches left in the round? <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, let's go to break. We'll be back in 10 minutes with the semifinals. Stay tuned. So, um, who designed Furious Megaventris, or what's the card name? The three five. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to remember what the playtest name was for it. It was like Stopasaurus or something. I can't remember. Um, yeah. So uh, the initial design went through some permutations, but it was basically exact. Like it went out the door. How it went out the door. Like we tested versions that were slightly stronger and slightly weaker or whatever. And we got to this point towards the end and, and to sort of this dovetails back to the, to the beginning of the show, we were talking about, you know, three months versus three years of like, we knew it was super good. I really believed in the gameplay of like, it's interesting with relic weapons. It's dynamic. Um, certain skills like deadly and flying can line up against it in ways that are novel. Endurance is novel against it. And I'm like, I know if we put this out the door at a three, as a three, five, that it's going to be super good. There's a better than 50% chance that we'll have to nerf it, walk it back a little bit at some point. But uh, I want to make sure that the world feels like very different when we put out a, a new release. I believe in the gameplay of it broadly. And if it ends up being a little too good, we have some stuff in our back pocket. Another thing that I think informed Magna Ventress is, so we're doing like this dinosaur themed set and Justice doesn't have dinosaurs. So if we make one Justice dinosaur that's super, super, super good, will people be inspired to say, oh, what, what if I tried a dinosaur deck with Justice in it just because Magna Ventress is so sweet and now we have this like weird three faction deck. That, that materialized like week one, people experimented with it. It ultimately didn't end up being very good, but I am a believer in if we have a weird unit type in a faction, if we make it super good, people might try to build a three faction deck or a two faction deck they would have never tried before. And that's interesting. So um, yeah, I mean, we uh, I, it went out the door eyes wide open where I, my perspective was like super good, really believe in the gameplay good chance that we're kind of sick of this thing in three or four months and we can take a point of health off of it and it'll still be a good tier one piece, but you know, not uh, the best card in the format probably. And um, I was willing to, we, I were willing to roll the dice on, on that experiment. And we ended up doing it a little bit, still really good. And uh, the world was very different when the card came out. And so it was, in my opinion, a success, even if, um, you know, ultimately we did have to nerf it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's cool. I 
from a stand, my standpoint, I'm not sure about the endurance part because you know there's not a decision space of not attacking. So that's my biggest you know problem with the card. So it was like maybe it's I'm coming from a different place because it's about simplicity and using the card right. So yeah, I understand the perspective from from your side as a designer, but I would like it being a tree fight that doesn't have any injuries because you need to protect that tree um shield that comes into the play yeah I, I think it will also be a cool design space there yeah the the, the so there's a, a couple the, the tricky parts with not having endurance and i think what you're saying is like totally justifiable right is the one uh is the card just when it doesn't have endurance does it air too much towards just play defense 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 and wait yeah. for your storm hall plate because there's really powerful ways to leverage armor uh in and like playing a really long game and once it's once you're there it's like a three five blocker might actually be better than a six eight attacker a good portion of the time if you're just trying to set up some big thing down the line and the other is um if we expect the card's going to be really good and really popular removing endurance gets to a point where you actually don't want to be the first one to play it it's much stronger for me to for it's much stronger for you to play a Magnet Ventress and then me hit it and then attack your armor and have that advantage. And I'm really skeptical of cards that are like, you're not supposed to play this. You're supposed to hold it and wait for them to play their copy. Uh, again, we could go the non-endurance route. That's like a, a totally reasonable way and would have removed some rate from the card. I, I still prefer just getting some of the health down because I think it's nice if it encourages mid-range more than uh, storm, uh, storm hall plating, wait all day, sit around forever, and the um, you want to hold for the opposing copy stuff. I'm not a huge fan of, but yeah, we 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 could we could have totally done it that way. And I think what you're saying is true. Of yeah, like actually make the per person like make a decision. Don't make it just it's like free. Yeah, of course I attack because it's super sick. I get it for free. Um, so there's an argument for doing it the way that you that you're suggesting for sure, but. Um, I, I think all all other things being equal, I'd rather go after the health or the strength or whatever and try to leave endurance on the design. No, no, I, I like the second point. I remember the times in where legendary rule in Magic had a, like the weird ruling right. of, yeah, yeah, and it wasn't a fun time. So, yeah. And uh, maybe the last, like the, I really like this uh, releasing cards per week think where, where you try to shake the meta game but also like release the story a bit so is that something that you're experimenting with and that you're happy with definitely and 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 the credit for that largely goes to andrew beckstrom that was really his vision and um i've been really happy with the results it's a it's so that the tough thing is like to be to, to get to the point where uh, it's like, oh, we can time this piece for the metagame to shift things up right now. We have to wait on certain things. And for the workflow, it's better if we get things done in advance. So like art and engineering and QA can do their work. So my perspective is, and, and what we're trying to get to is sort of like, let's get this stuff done ahead of time. Let's just use this as an opportunity to tell a story, to give people cards that are like sweet and fun that they don't have to spend money for. And at the last second, if we really like, we feel we really need to do something, we can change a card at the last minute. But like, let's not make it the expectation that we're working on this thing two days before we're supposed to put it on the client. So it's a tricky balance because it is a good opportunity for us to occasionally put out some cards that are just timed just right. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I think we shouldn't lean on that as a crutch. It's it's about storytelling. It's about giving people things that are fun. And if we really have a five alarm fire, or if we really say like, oh, this card would be so perfect if we just change this little thing at the last minute because X, Y, and Z, that's great. We can do it, but we, we shouldn't go in with that as the plan, I guess. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the community really enjoys those cards. It's awesome. And I mean, I, I was kind of, you know, a lot of different people from design and creative are pitching in on the storytelling. And um, I I basically wrote the Sill chapter and it was just so cool, like seeing that come to life with the text and the storyline and the different cards, like it, it was really cool for me. And I mean, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, obviously. And 
to have a moment where I was like, oh, this is so cool seeing like the finished product here is doesn't happen to me a whole lot anymore. And um, I got to have that with that chapter. So yeah, we consider it to be a success. Um, you know, there's still a chance we iterate on it a little bit or keep tinkering around, but broadly, um, yeah, it's been awesome and we're just gonna keep doing it. Cool, yeah. And uh, for the draft change and the pack change, I mean, it's a bit maybe short to have a analysis now or the data backing it up, but how, how are you feeling about that? The, the change with the draft packs and the cards in the draft packs for the draft environment? Really positive. I mean, I, I can't really speak to, um, you know, the, the exact numbers are proprietary, um, but for me, it's more start from the position of like, the game's really fun, knock down barriers that make it more complicated or sort of harder to figure out. And the combination of the draft pack, what's actually legal, the draft pack is informing expedition. I only play expedition. There's all these cards that are illegal from a set that's not really a set. And I have to like find just a list of cards. I log in one day, all my decks are illegal because the draft pack changed. Like all that stuff to me is like, all of the things being equal, that is just a barrier for both drafters and people who play Expedition. And if we think that qualitatively the experience is the same, but we're making it a lot more simpler and easy to process and you come, maybe you log out and come back six months later, do you understand what's going on? Anytime that we're improving that to me, it's like, that's just, that's just positive for sure, assuming that it's gameplay neutral. I think it's better than gameplay neutral. Um, and, you know, the response we've gotten so far, I would say broadly is positive. So, you know, again, we always try to leave ourselves open the possibility that we're wrong or that we, there's more information that we can use, like try to stay humble about it. But so far the, the returns have been really positive on that change. All right, welcome back. It's semifinal time here. We're going to be starting off with Alex Fierro at the top of our bracket. Um, they're going to be up against Iron Man. Down at the bottom, DQD is going to see if they got anything left in the tank. They're going mm -hmm. up against Gozu. Um, and so, you know, Gozu already qualified for Worlds, but, you know, still fighting to get that money and uh, show the competitors this weekend what they got. So, We'll be starting off with Alex Fierro on the Ricano deck against uh, Iron Man on Xenon, and then we'll check in and see if uh, DQD is still uh, still playing, but I, I got a feeling they are. Yeah, we're going to get the Ricano match going here, uh, and I assume we'll have plenty of time to go down to the Zen and Mirror. All right, so the round has begun, and we'll be joining that match as soon as it's ready, and it's ready! Alex Fierro, top of your screen on Ricano. Iron Man down at the bottom. Zenon, one of the decks. Big decks this weekend. Alex Fierro very nicely picked up a Seat of Glory to help ensure they got smooth power for the next few turns. Imagine we're going to see Jeering Yeti or Riot Detail here. It's going to be Riot Detail. This is a 2-2 two -two charge. Gets plus 2, plus 2, or taunt the turn you play it. Your choice. And there's a little dinosaur poking on in. Shizu Silver Hilt. It's this gonna is, come in, and this is interesting because even if you yeah, this is this is a nice hedge against the uh, field medic. You know, you don't want to just give up your turn, but you at least get to draw a card here in the event that field medic shows up. And maybe a play we might see from Iron Man is block, but no contract, but. I don't know. A free three three sounds like it's worth two two debt to me. Yeah, especially because the follow up play here is no. Okay, so draw a card for Alex Fierro. Those units trade off, and oh, look at that! We got give chase in the deck for Alex Fierro this weekend. Now Vikram is going to steal Shizu. So now if Alex Fierro wants to play Scale Swarm Patrol, they got nothing to buff up, but. That's okay with them. And for Iron Man, they can play Krogar, but now Scale Swarm Patrol is too large to be silenced. 
Unsurprisingly, no blocks. But here's Krogar. Ah, the Cambrai Law Mage a little late, but nevertheless. And we're getting in some nice buffs in, and now here's Jeering Yeti. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, for as, as powerful as the start was from Iron Man going first um, and, you know, playing the ostensibly more powerful deck, they are kind of running out of ways to make inroads here. Yeah, they sure are. So for Iron Man, they have drawn a Hidden Garut. So maybe they're trying to set up something where they can uh, deal with one of these key units after a block plus a Hidden Garut. Feels like this is a this is too much damage to just to totally ignore. But wow, look at that! Uh, it's ch the the Scale Swarm Patrol is not going to get into the action with that Alchemy Student in hand. You can uh, understand why they feel like they might be able to tease this out for another moment. Yeah, this is uh, Alex here with some really tight tactical play to start off. So these Scale Swarm Patrols are going to buff each other up. We're going to see an Alchemy Student. Now we might see a chump from the Vikram. Give back the Shizu and then bring it back with Through the Unknown to get that giant Scale Swarm Patrol. But the health total race just swung way back. Right. Yep, so there's Vikram. Stealing... The bigger scale swarm patrol. Hmm. All things considered. All right. Well, let's see what happens with give chase. So from the top five cards of your deck, you can play three unit, two units with cost three or less. They get plus two, plus two and charge this turn at the end of your turn, put them into your hand. So Alex must have a little bit of choice here as they haven't immediately shown what they got. And it's likely that whatever is up there has been modified too by these patrols because we haven't had any of the mods come through. No, the Shizu this turn that got drawn. Oh. A little bit bigger, yeah. All right, so Olin buffs something, and we're going to see a taunt here. And is Shizu an alchemy student? Are they going to attack? Well, I do like attacking with Shizu, right? Because you have one ton already kind of priced in. And if Vikram blocks. Yeah. It did feel like that would go decently well. Now you get to bring back both the Riot Detail and the Olin back to your hand. All right, there's Sahin. Yeah, I mean, Alex is not that high. They're at only at 11. So a chump by the Scale Swarm Patrol. They're going to drop down to six. But wow, look at that. With Sahin Stateless, they're close. Yeah, although there is the question now of, you know. Yes. So what did right. Alex put on top of their deck with Olin? It was a Furious Magna Ventress. Makes sense. Oh, this is an unbelievable turn. Oh, no, the riot detail's not going to be quite big enough. Thought I might be able to taunt that uh that Vikram here, but Hmm. So I got a 4/5 Magna Ventress. Yeah, it's rough because, you know, it seems like Man of Ventures is kind of the best play in terms of settling things down a little bit this turn and getting the fire in with a, a big attack on the way back. Right. But uh, when you have six power and the other three cards cost three, you're, all your instinct is telling you to figure out some way to play some of your, your, uh, your threes. This is the alternative path, I suppose.
another Krogar is drawn. If Iron Man attacks with everything, it feels like things could go pretty well for them. Because if either unit blocks Vikram, I think you win the game right now with Sahin. Right. As it stands, they are going to win the game right now with Sahin because one of the units got through. But yeah, I think Iron Man could have been maybe been a little more aggressive there. But. Yeah, I, I I don't think there was any way for that to go wrong, especially with Alex having no power available. But uh, right. in the end, there no realistic way for Alex to block out of that situation and leave themselves with any prospects the following turn. And so Iron Man takes game one. All right. So uh, nicely done there by the Iron Man, uh, taking it down. Uh, Dinosaur Nest flipping early was great. Um, yeah, it's, it seems like uh, couldn't find a way to get the, the Scale Swarm Patrol back, even with an Olin. So mm -hmm. that that was certainly unfortunate. Yeah, no idea if there's just no... You know, I mean, obviously, Olin is selecting from a fairly limited range, so yeah. don't know if there's any sort of removal or relic weapon that can handle uh, a Vikram there, but that was uh, pretty much the whole game there. That advantage couldn't be unwound. All right. So as we look to game number two here, Alex will be on the play. Uh, give Chase a new big new Vercano card. Um, pretty nice there with uh, Riot Detail being able to uh, to use that with the taunt. Oh, yeah, there's a there's a ton of good hits there. All right, so no two drops or one drops for Alex, but they're going to keep here with Olin, Helena, Furious Magnaventurous, and Scale Sworn Patrol. Meanwhile, for Iron Man, pretty typical. They're going to try to see if they can turn things around with uh, Krogar in the mid game. And now this is tricky for Iron Man. If you go ahead and play Zito this turn, you can't drop the Rat King next turn. But there's also a question of how much do you want to play the Rat King with no power to do it that turn. So it's not not a simple thing. Yep. There's Helena drawing that Combray Law Mage kind of one turn later than you'd lo I'd like, ideally. All right, so Magnaventurus hits the Helena, and Vikram is drawn for Iron Man. Yeah, right on time. I mean, this was just looking to be a ton of pressure. Now uh, we're looking at uh, multiple sack outlets the following turn and so much momentum taken out. Big game, though, for uh, Scale Sworn Patrol to buff up the Helena up to a 4-4. That means it's going to be out of range for Krogar to silence it. And, yeah, Iron Man would have had that available as they do hit power number 5. Starting off with a Magnaventurous attack. On the board, this is... Not exactly a chump attack, thanks to the Rat King, so it's going to get in there for three. And, yeah, the options aren't ideal here for Iron Man, but I think just starting to deploy some Krogars looks pretty good. Now, we're going to get to see a second Scale Swarm Patrol. We got a really buffed up top of the deck. If we drop down Olin, what are we going to search for here? It's got to be something without flying. Honestly, I don't even mind getting Jeering Yeti. <laughs> Just keep letting the good times roll. Oh, oh I see, because it inscribes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I was going to say, why do you want power burst? Yeah, no, that... So Iron Man's going to die in a couple of turns here, but they, they got a moment or two. I mean, Alchemy Student could be the get, you know. Give your thing lifesteal. We're going to see a double block here on the Magna Ventress. Maybe. I do think Iron Man's looking to get out on this Vikram. 
maybe they were willing to chump attack that Magna Ventress, and so that way they can ultimately recur the Vikram and steal the Helena. Yeah. Zito comes down. Rat's going to get sacked. Yeah, I wonder if Iron Man will even just use the racking just to shrink Helena by one. No? Okay, so it was another Magna Ventress. And, yeah, that'll come down right away and stun one of these in the Heat's Faithfuls. Alex really doesn't want Iron Man gaining any kind of health right now. Devour is going to sack. Yeah, this Magna Ventress actually it does sacked seem... It Zito, okay. This Magna Ventress actually does seem worse than um, getting a Jeering Yeti. <laughs> And so right now, Helena's a 6-6, six, six, but the threat of a second racking is going to make it hard here for blocking. But no Nahith Faithful comes in. We're going to see a double block on Krogar with Furious Magnaventress and Cambrai Law Mage. Magnaventress pokes away the armor. And yeah, the Rat King is going to just shrink it down a little bit. There's a buffed up Riot detail. Problem is, is even if you attack with that, getting that one double blocked by two Nahit Faithfuls adds a lot of time to the clock. Right, yeah. Not, not worth a whole lot here. So we do play it. I mean, you, it's hard to hold cards in hand with... Uh, Zito in the deck, uh, thanks to Revenge, and we see a top deck Zito here. Well, 5-5 five five is also just a, a pretty solid blocker here, all told. That is, yeah, that too. So Scalestorm Patrol not going to get into the mix here. And was that enough action for the Rat King to go after something other than Helena? It was. Alex has let themselves get pretty low, but they, they really are just not trying to lose the Scale Swarm Patrols. Battlefront Dasher. So that's just going to buff up Helena just a little bit more. And now Field Medic. Oof, that gains a lot of health. Yeah, but that's, you know, the, the game now is at risk from Iron Man's perspective of just being about just total size and an uncontested Helena. The field max a lot of time. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with that. But, um, you know, that's not necessarily a uh, that much of a safety valve here. So the Rat King sacks the Spiteling, drops them down, and now a Justice Sigil buffs up Helena real big. The Scale Sworn Patrols are getting bigger. So... I Field Medic is going to gain a lot of health here. And you can even play Krogar too, but Iron Man's no longer really making much progress here. If you were to play Krogar, sack it, kill the Battlefront Dasher, and attack with everything, not even sure you're getting that much in. You are not. And I mean, at this point, because um, Vikram is just in immediate win you just take the helena and it's uncontested right i i think you should be airing around trying to buy yourself time yep well that's the win yeah <laughs> all right so vikram's gonna steal helena here with no cards in hand for alex fiero there's no risk and iron man moving on to the finals Whew. there you have it there you go so uh that match i mean you certainly understand why Alex's deck is so all in on units with give chase. Uh, it did seem like the inability to interact with an opposing hunt master Vikram um, was really brutal. And in particular, not having a unit that they could search up with Olin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, those uh, and field medic is also part of that too. 
that's a really rough card to deal with if all you're doing is, is really just attacking. And yeah, the, that deck's putting a lot of eggs into the basket of just here's one big unit. And if you can't kill Thickrum, that's going to be uh, problematic a lot of the time, as we saw there in, in game number two, certainly. Okay. All right. So checking in on the other semifinal, um, we've got Gozu and DQD. How are we looking on the game count, Tim? It's 0-0. Zero, zero. They only have seven power each. Huh. Okay. All right. Game one. So be it. We got that Dune Hill clan in hand for DQD, but the health totals are a lot lower than we're used to seeing. So uh, Gozu playing pretty carefully here as, you know, Field Medic is going to buttress the health totals. And is that enough to win? It looks... Well, maybe. If that Vikram stole another Vikram... I yeah. guess we don't know whose Vikram is. Right. Looks like, yeah, one was stolen by the other. So that's going to remove yep. a blocker, give you another attacker. And uh, DQD takes down game number one there. So, all right. Yeah. Heading into game number two. We've seen this before in the Zen and Mirror. And so, uh, Gozu probably got a chance to see some of what happened in the last round. Yeah, I, I imagine so. I remember, <laughs> Gozu already qualified for the World Championship. Yep. So, um, in the event that uh, they were to win here, that invite would pass down. Yeah, right over to Iron Man. Right. So, fair enough. Okay, so for we've got now, we've got Iron Man in the finals waiting in the wings to play one of these two players. Um, so, for the Zen and Mirror, it seems like some of the most important cards are having that early dinosaur nest, and then uh, Field Medic just being this card which just threatens to make any early turn attack so unprofitable has really um, made it tough for people to close out games. I think it's a different experience here than on the ladder. Um, once you're talking about our best players and also open deck lists, you can actually really get into the weeds of like what are the actual important cards in each individual list. And stuff like Field Medic just doesn't pull as much weight. Now, it still has moments of being good, and um, you know certainly it can gain a huge burst of, of health or whatever, but I think when players are skilled and are aware of each other's deck list, it's just not what the mirror match appears to be about. Um, and certainly with the, with the deck list available, that it becomes around your the specific threats and answers that you have that are um, able to present recurring advantages um, or allow you to a, a single card that kind of blows up everything that the other players don't have up until that point. All right, so turn two here for Gozu. They're going to run out a Nahid's Faithful. Meanwhile, on the other side, DQD had to do a little bit of redrawing, but they, they, found, they found their stride now, and we'll see how far ahead Gozu wants to try to pull here. There is those Saloon Massacres. Those have just been so great for DQD. It seems like they're, pl they're more in on them than many of the other players this weekend playing the scene in deck. And we're going to see a contracted Saloon Massacre. So for Gozu, very interesting. How are we going to play this? Are we going to get going with Vic charging Vikrams? We are. So five points coming in. And you look at the other hand and certainly could see a lot of damage just keep on coming in. I mean, a Waystone Igniter on the other side. Yeah, it's not a common play that you see in the mirror matches, just turn four, play Vikram. But Gozu, I think, smartly identifying that, you know, DQD is going to be under debt the next turn. You have another Vikram to follow up with. And uh, the Saloon Massacre is sort of suggestive of a hand that wants to play a longer game. So we will see Waste on Igniter, and it is going to make a Spiteling. So... Nice little play. You don't expose yourself too much to a single piece of removal. You can still double block into this Vikram if you would like to. Yeah, 
And for Gozu, with that through the unknown in hand, it's a pretty good spot to be in to have access to a Vikram in the void. So much so that it looks like DQD might not even making um, the double block down. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. I mean, that's a really uh, uh, unorthodox play there, to say the least. So Zaheen deals four. And now DQD could be holding up that field medic if they want. We'll see if they go for that or the Rat King. But Gozu definitely looking to uh, to push this game into a faster conclusion than we might be used to seeing. So I really like the way that DQD is sort of um, setting up these plays. It looks like they're putting a premium basically on uh, try to hold back my premium cards as much as possible. That Rat King play... Obviously, it's not as flashy as playing Vikram. It doesn't have the ceiling of Field Medic, but it's a really good-looking turn using some non-premium resources. And if your opponent happens to have a, a Vikram to steal something, you have called the hit and then your own Vikram. Uh, if they just play some units out, maybe you can set up Vikram plus the Rat King to sacrifice and you know uh, get a clean exchange that way. So that was not the best turn or the highest ceiling turn from DQD, but it was the one that got a really nice turn out of cards that are typically not at a premium in the matchup. So we'll see a trade with Waystone Igniter and the Charging Vikram. And for Gozu, we are going to see... Vikram steal the Rat King... Now, remember, Rat King is sacrifice another unit. So Can't there's, sack you cannot take the Rat King and sack itself. But and if now. DQD goes Vikram, steal Vikram, you get the Rat King back, I believe. Okay, well, we're just doing it this way. And now you could play Vikram, but you don't have anything to sack for. I mean, the plan here might be just to sandbag one more turn. Like, this yeah. is a good field medic turn. And then you can... Uh, like, you're not in that much of a rush to just fire off Hummaster Vikram here. You can just kind of take your time. Yeah, especially if you do this. You shrink down the Sahin. So now the attacks aren't looking so hot. Gozu's going to draw back um, the Vikram with charge. That's a 4-2. This is going to get blown up pretty hard here by the field yeah. medic. I mean, I, uh, DQD has shown such mastery of the pure match in the short time we've had yeah. him on. I mean, again, an absolute blowout with field medic, not something that typically happens in the in the mirror match here. Incredible stuff. Like the, Just the quality of play here has been so high. And now Vikram will steal the Sahin with Devour in hand. That's a great spot to be in. I mean, if you're Gozu, you almost feel like they must have just top decked that Vikram and not it's been in their hand for five turns. Sure. So the Sahin gets devoured. That's going to get DQD another field medic. That's great. So the Rat King... I imagine we'll see it start to get down the other Rat King. No easy blocks here for, for Gozu. Um, man. This, this turning into a Devour, not ideal. So DQD going to go up to 15 now. Hitting Dunehill Clan, and that might be the clincher as oh. Field Medic is going to eat the Rat King again. Yikes. Mm -hmm. Going to get to attack for six. Dropping Gozu down to seven. Dunehill Clan going to be unleashed. Two five fives. All right, last draw. 
for Gozu to keep themselves alive. They hit a field medic. That puts them up to 12. A chump on a Dune Hill clan. Oh, they're still alive. Yeah, but they, they don't get to make any forward progress. It's just a chump block in another turn. Nicely done by Gozu. Not playing out that seed of mystery. If they had, Zito would have taken away the field medic. Yeah, we're right. We're not making much progress with this play. But if you were to get a way to get Vikram, another Vikram and steal a Dune Hill clan, could that be enough? It's dropping to two here, so Zito isn't lethal. That's nice. Sahin deal four, but you're not gaining any health, and that's going to do it. DQD takes it down into – they are moving on to the finals where they will play Iron Man. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back with the finals of this Open. And we'll see if DQD can continue this impressive run of beating players in the Zen and Mirror. Yeah, we'll a be clinic. We'll be back soon. What's your, as a designer, as a player, uh, uh, with the um, invoke mechanic? I mean, it's a digital mechanic, which I like, but the, the variability in the power level of the cards can uh, that you get from the invoke can really swing some games. So invoke in draft and invoke in constructed are two like very different animals in my mind. Uh, in draft, uh, we got to be careful about it. You know, we did a Ten uncommons and cold hunt. I'm not sure, like at the end of the day, if that's like positive or negative. But like we know the risk going in, right? Invokes not weighted for rarity, and so people are just spiking rares and legendaries off their uncommon all the time. And like, is that just sort of frustrating and repetitive? Um, so that that's one thing. For constructed, I really like it. There's two things that I really like about invoke and constructed. One is people just have game pieces show up that they otherwise wouldn't play because they invoked into it and you gotta make do with it. And it's just fun and uh, interesting and novel to like one game out of a hundred, you know, like, oh, I got a left right Falchion off of my Incarnus. What am I gonna do with this thing? It's like, that's fun, uh, I, I like that. And then the second thing that I really like about Invoke is um, it does sort of quietly um, air people towards playing an interactive game because one of the ways to make Invoke better is to just be playing with like units in a wide array of things because it, it uh, opens up the distribution of what things are helpful for you. For example, if you invoke into a unit weapon and you're not playing with units, you can't take that card. So I know that's not like that big of a deal, but you know, I play a lot of invoke cards in, in Throne and like it does matter. When I'm playing decks that are more interactive and have more units and like maybe could use a pump spell or just some some something a, a, you know a dark return style effect, my invoking is more powerful than when I'm playing with just all removal or just some control game. So how much of it we're supposed to be doing in draft? I think is a complicated question. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and certainly the the downsides of the you know, super swingy rares and legendaries coming up all the time is definitely there. For constructed, I think it's just unambiguously positive. Um, so how we balance that, how we thread the needle, are we supposed to only do invoke and things like chapter battles? You know, like that's a, 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 an evolving process and conversation, but uh, for constructed, I think it's just awesome. Yeah, I agree for constructed, especially because I think it makes play patterns that are not like, you need to, you know, uh, have a new, new you get a new card and you need to use it so it's not from your deck or or, or I think it makes you know player skills in constructed while in limited you already get like different play patterns from the environment so yeah right. it makes the, it. yeah that's a really good point too the oh here's a weird card that you normally don't play with is that is already the draft experience in some yeah. to some degree. So the the how stimulating it is is, is lower there. But you know in constructed it's like I end up playing with dumping grounds a lot as a card because it just I can focus to it. And like, that's a card that's like pretty interesting, like what it does to a game. And it's not strong enough to just play, but it is strong enough that if you happen to randomly draw in a game, sometimes it does some good stuff. And uh, that part of the invoke experience, I just love. I, I think that part's really, really good. Yeah, I try to make work the inscribe card 
the the shadow inscribe card with invoke i think that's an amazing yeah but i don't care i couldn't break it yeah so yeah i uh i I might have advocated for that card to go out the door the way that it did. <laughs> Let's just say that because um, you know I play a lot of Shadow, even with a ton of Invoke, and I was like, yeah, this is this will be fun, and it's probably not that good, but people will try it, and then that's exactly yeah. what happened. And you know, I still play one or two copies in some of my decks just for fun, and it's like sweet, awesome, that's really really good. But if yeah. that card was if that card was legal in draft, it would probably be really annoying. So yeah. having it in Valley Beyond is like a great place for it. Yeah, yeah I agree. Cool. So, any shout outs? I mean, I know you mentioned your team, Gregory PM, Zach Hill, the rest of the bunch. Is there any social media slash streaming stuff you want to point people towards? Any other shout outs you want to give? Uh, the floor is yours. I mean, I think Gozu, or, or, I mean, he streams a lot. So, uh, I think it's like the number one streamer right now as well as Cassandra, I think they're amazing for the game and for the communities. So shout out for them. Like I enjoy, for example, uh, learning a draft format from watching Cassandra streams. And yeah, um, I think the Eternal community is a, a pretty connected bunch and really great guys uh, all over the place. So yeah. Shout out to Sunnywell with Friends of Eternal, who's try to also improve the community, the people who are making the community tournament uh, uh, tick. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo a couple of things there. First of all, Cassandra is just like awesome, just like perfect community member. And I think there's this, sometimes there's a stereotype of, well, a community member means you're like, you don't play competitively or you're not good. And it's like, no, Cassandra makes Sundays of our open. It's like, that, that person can hang for sure, but they're really passionate about the game and just the community and all that. And I think that's really incredible. And then sort of your broader point about the community, like you can go back, people think that I'm making this up. You can go back and look at some of the archives for some of the forums of like games I used to work on. Uh, I definitely did not like some of our communities on some of the games that I've worked on. And like, you can see me in the discord, just like chatting with people and posting screen caps and like just, trying to answer questions sometimes and like I do it because it's a cool bunch of people to hang out with and talk to and people clearly you know love the game and they're interested in the design process and um you know it's 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 a been a really cool experience for me kind of coming back and and diving into that community a little bit more and I, I think you're absolutely right that Eternals community is just fantastic and from top to bottom like the, the our most competitive players world championships all the way down to people who are just hopping in and trying to learn the game it's it's been really um uh really enriching for me to sort of engage with that yeah Ilya tends to be opinionated he's part of the clan so i can talk about it so i think but yeah i think a lot of people come from the passion for the game and trying to improve yeah. it yeah yeah no i mean I, yeah Ilya is the one that's the name that comes up a lot right like yeah, that person is really passionate. I think yeah. sometimes where 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 I struggle sometimes with some of the posts is this feeling of like, well, what do you actually want the game to be? What do you want to be good? Because there's some amount of sometimes annoyed by the cards being too weak, and sometimes annoyed by the cards being too strong. And it's like, well, what? Tell me what you actually want the thing to be. You know, there's a little bit of that. But in terms of like having a presence and caring about it, like, great. You know what the worst thing is when your forums are dead. So that means yeah. no one cares anymore. So I'll always take passionate and maybe a little erratic sometimes over people not caring, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. So yeah, shout out to the community. Shout out to the community. Well, I think that's going to do it for us. Again, uh, congratulations on your throne open win. Looking forward to seeing you in the world championships later this year. Thank you so much for your time and accommodating. I know our, our time zone differences uh, are, are pretty intense and, you're meeting me on my terms, not the other way around, which I really appreciate. And um, thank you so much for the great interview and, and thoughtful questions and um, congratulations and uh, looking yeah. forward to seeing you later this year. Yeah, I'll try to play some of the tournaments. Uh, so, yeah.
Finals time. Andrew and Patrick in the saddle, ready to go to watch Iron Man versus DQD. See who's the open champion. See who's going to Worlds. Right. Well, at stake here. And uh, I don't know. Have we watched much of this player in the past? DQD. They've been putting on a show. They've been so good in the mirror, both yes. in terms of the structure of their list and their actual play, that I would be surprised if this was a completely fresh face. But here we are, now in the finals. No, I don't recall ever seeing them before. Winner of this match receives $1,500 in cash on top of all the incline prizes and a slot for the 2022 World Championships. So good luck to both of our players in the finals. And, you know, we're going to have fun jo watching – one more Zine and Mirror this weekend with both of uh, with all of you at home, and thanks, you know, for joining us. And we'll be back next month with a draft open, so mm -hmm. make sure you start getting your reps in now. And if you haven't hit Masters in any of our formats, it's a good time to do so. All right, Iron Man versus DQD finals here. Iron Man's kept their hand; they're on the play. They got Zito, Rat King, and Evelina. DQD. You know, just uh, they got Field Medic, I guess, and Black Maw Cardasaur. That's one of the best comeback cards for a unit we've ever had, I think. I would discard the Medic. As that? Uh, no, as uh, to the Zito. Oh, discard the Medic. I was trying to talk about the game. My <laughs> mistake. <laughs> I'll try to keep up. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Iron Man. Crack it in with Zito on turn number three. They got him down to 23. Here's the Rat King and his little friends. Display will. Can't quite play that one yet. Well, you could have if you pitched the field medic <laughs> instead of the whatever. They are all coming in. So field medic coming down. DQD going to contract. Gain some health. Block the Rat King. It'll get devoured. And normally this play doesn't look very good um, because it's like, okay, well, Rat King's one of the best cards. Just trade it for Field Medic. Not even really, just devour. But knowing that uh, DQD is going to be in debt for next turn, uh, the fact that it frees up a shot for Evelina at least once means that while that play most of the time doesn't look very good, I think in that particular instance, it's um, a, a, a wise line from Iron Man. Wow. So no inscribed call the hit there by DQD. They're missing power drops, and they're going to have to make a choice here about whether or not they want to chump this Evelina. Next turn, they could kill it with Display of Will. But for now, Iron Man's going to get in there for six damage and draw a Rhinarch. 5-5 five, five, Overwhelm Dinosaur. And, you know, holding on to that call to hit largely a gesture towards how important it is to be able to kill a Huntmaster Vikram if it gets played. Yeah, although a little suspicious to value it that highly in this spot when you have um, display of will in the event that it goes that way. Sure. All right, there's display of will taking out Evelina, which means these other units. One's getting in the Zito. The rat goes away. And now here's that 5-5 five five dinosaur made by Evelina. DQD missed on their power, so if they want... It's going to be either one of these four drops, or they could hold up a Devourer here. I would have discarded Field Medic to the Zito on turn one. <laughs> but who's to say? Yeah. There's well, no, no way to know. It's, uh, it's in the past. <laughs> <laughs> There's impending doom. Uh, just let me have this one, man. <laughs> wow. The impending doom does not trade with the Rhinarch. So uh, this is much more... Um, Aggressive, I guess you would say, than we're used to seeing from DQD. They did pick up a Krogar, though, so mm, they got some comeback. Card. Oh, yeah. A dinosaur Nest got dropped last turn by Iron Man. Is 
So Vikram's going to take the dinosaur. Penning Doom's going to drop him down to seven. But now we get to Krogar to silence the Vikram. Get back our Reinarch. And with another Sahin Stateless in hand, very close for Iron Man right now to, uh, to finishing this game off. Defensive impending doom is rarely good. They did finally get a power last turn, but it was depleted. So we're going to see an attack by the Biggins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, what's the harm of attacking with everything here? But it's... A field medic getting contracted could be potentially messy in terms of allowing mm. DQD to kind of clean up some of the smaller stuff on the house. As it stands, though, they are cleaning up quite a bit here. Yeah. I mean, this attack is not great, but I think playing around field medic here is, is worth giving up a little bit of equity from Iron Man's spot. And will Iron Man drop down the Sahin Stateless? You know, there's always that tactical value of your opponent not knowing you got Four more points, and of course, we do know there are saloon massacres on the other side. Right, and that block last turn of, of you know, wouldn't put in that much effort to get rid of the five fives is sort of suggestive of maybe having saloon massacre. So again, I, I like the uh, I like the patience. Wow, another Sahin stateless. This is very close. If well, wait with a charged dinosaur, does Iron Man have it? Yes. Wow. Unless there's call to hit, but like who really cares? <laughs> I bet Iron Man would care. Well, it's not it's uh, my point is that it's not like it's the end of the world. Oh, and sure. you'd also have to put your opponent on double Sahin and undepleted power to even make that play in the first place. So, you know. Well, there's Sahin number one. Take four. You got no relics to give me? Alright, you're gonna have to take four. I wouldn't pay it. No, never mind. Boom. So there you go. Iron Man takes down game number one here against DQD. That was the first time we've ever seen them lose a game in the mirror. We've seen them win. They'd won four in a row before that point, though we we came into a game two where they were down a game. Yep. No, uh, Iron Man played that really, really well. I think, again, the um, there were some power stumbles there as a result of the discard of the Zito and one turn of not contracting the call hit. And, you know, it, it can look like there's – just the sort of soup of exchanges and card advantage and swings or whatever. And certainly there are some critical interactions that come up in the matchup, especially oriented around Huntmaster Vikram. But just sort of playing your stuff on time when, you know, the tempo can swing so dramatically, when many of the key cards have contract and so missing power on turn five can imply being down a power on turn eight as well. A lot of times that's really what the games, games come down to. And, uh, Iron Man's draw was a lot smoother in terms of just making their power drops. All right. Game number two, DQD down a game. They'll be kicking things off. Do they like this draw? They've got an inscribed Cloud Scraper that gets them the third power, but they think they can do better. Is that enough to make you want to go to six? Nope. I think the Saloon Massacre implies having enough time. Uh, the fact that you have double shadow and double time, which is not the easiest thing for this deck. You have an uh, Evelina to inscribe if the if it comes down to the absolute worst case scenario. So I think that hands, uh, you know, I understand the risks there, but uh, a fine seven card hand to keep after you've already redrawn. All right, Iron Man going to contract Zito. Make him discard a card. That's going to be the Saloon Massacre. So not going to try to get a big multiple like advantage out of that. But, you know, when, when your opponent contracts a Zito on turn one, you know they're not going to be playing Dinosaur Nest on turn two. So how far behind do you really think you're going to be in the early turns? Right. Love to see there just the instant discard of Field Medic there from Iron Man. The card's got spots to, if the game's very aggressive or if it's turn 20 and things look a certain way, but uh, by and large, it, it's not really what these games are about. And Iron Man gets uh, off of it immediately. It's 
So no plays from DQD. They're going to hold up this field medic. And looks pretty attractive here to play at contract and block. Well, given the, the, the texture of DQD's hand, that looked like a pretty good spot to, uh, to play Vikram. So if they chose not to, it's just about trying to set up this, this turn. So Iron Man just sacks out of the Nahid's Faithful and can't make any other plays. So now uh, DQD can start with attacking. Question is, what are they going to deploy after that, if anything? Well, there's also, they could just play Vikram pre-combat sure. here and just hit for a ton. You know, it's sort of the, the problem with that line. I, I Maybe it's the right thing to do. It's a little incongruous with your leftovers, right? You have like, a scheme slash removal spell that may not work, a cloud scraper that's unlikely to match up to anything. If your follow up in hand was something that was a little bit more aggressive, I think it's a no brainer. As it stands, DQD is definitely going to go for it, but now the the hand sort of, you know, it's not the ideal set of leftovers. So we'll see Krogar silence the field medic or silence the Zito, put Iron Man up to 23. Drew the impending doom, so if you want, you could trade off and play that. Wow, no trades from Iron Man. Well, in, in, in this matchup, I think there's a premium on keeping around the things that can survive a saloon massacre. So now going from, you know, 23 to 18 is not nothing. And if it's going from, let's say, 13 to 8, maybe the block is different. But if you've got the cushion, uh, I, I think you would like to, if possible, uh, try to keep the stuff that has 5 health around and allow the board to get cluttered with things that have 4 or less health. So as we go back to DQD, they found a Dunehill clan. If they want, they can use Display of Will to clear out that Sahin. But they're going to just attack for now with looks like the flyer and the 3-3. Three, three. So both this, of these players are playing aggressively, but also very calculated. Yeah, calculated. Th this is what I was sort of referring to with the hand being a little incongruous. You know, the impending doom in the follow-up turn was a great draw. But now it's like, okay, you could play a 5-5, five, five, I guess. You could spend your turn on a removal spell, I guess. None of these options are really that appealing. Well, you throw down a 6-5 here that uh, holds off the Nahid's Faithful. and We got we got big old 6-5 Vanillas getting played. You love it. Evelina, not the best blocker. It would also mean you wouldn't be able to hold up Devour this turn if that matters. I don't know how much leaving up Devour matters because even if... Well, I guess the problem with not leaving up Devour is if... Uh, DQD just goes no blocks you're in a lot of trouble on the way back wow this is the most aggressive line from DQD not even chumping with that silent Zito so it looks like we might be kind of moving in here well, all the points oh. matter here for example that Zito yeah. that, that could add up to 9 right this plus field medic plus impending doom and then you're in a spot where there's a there are not a small list of things that deal one and then all right so now you could saloon massacre so that was pretty crafty there from uh from dqd and they got to kill everything except for their units now we see the reinarch And will DQD mate let this trade happen? Looks like it. Yeah, this is another spot where it's, you know, you're losing by so much that you have to try to spike. And keeping the devour back gives Vikram the most leverage of any play you have available. So here's Zito. Will Iron Man contract it? Because you gotta know what your outs are to that impending doom, because if you can't deal with that, it doesn't matter. So they're not going to. You gotta just devour right now. Yeah, I'm surprised that there was no contract uh, because that would still leave you with uh, – you have undepleted power in your hand, so you still have enough to 
Vikram and Devour, which I thought would be the out there, but I'm sure Iron Man knows better than me what the uh, what the actual sequence is that they were well, maybe drawing to there. Yeah, yeah. If you Vic, yeah. I I assume that Vikram was the, if not out, at least the you know like that's what you're trying to recover to, and um, so you still have enough power at eight two minus two minus four, but. Uh, as it stands, doesn't matter. Vikram wasn't there anyway, and we'll be going to game three in a moment. Yeah. Two pretty quick ones in the matchup, given the, what we've seen uh, earlier in the day. Yeah, it is funny, right? Like the uh, And the way these players are playing is they're both trying to to not let these games go long, it feels like. Um, you know, there's often this idea of, like, why do you, uh, why why should the player who's on the back foot be willing to make plays that are trying to, to trade damage? And the answer is oftentimes because a player whose health total is under pressure has to make plays that can leave them out of position for certain things. Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't applied any pressure to the health total, it really constrains your ability to make your, to, to trap your opponent later on in the game. Yep. That's right. All right. So DQD, Got to win one more game in the Zen and Mirror, but Iron Man not going down swinging. They've got only two power in this opening hand, so look at this. Turn one Zito, no contract. Given how much this matchup is just sort of like a, about a raw accumulation of resources, play is pretty shocking to me. I mean, I understand, you know, it, you would give up uh, being able to faithful on turn two or whatever, but just... Given the slowness of the matchup, giving up a card like that when your hand is not really coming out of the gates regardless is is pretty surprising to me. Yeah, I agree. All right, so first off, we're going to devour the Zito before the other Zito's contract sort of gets through, get some extra cards, decide what we want to work with. I feel like it's... The Garut has felt like the weak, one of the weaker cards in the mirror. Right, to the extent that it has value, it's, a, I guess, an answer to Vikram. But as we've seen, players are, when they have the luxury to, are trying to set up sequences where they Vikram and do the thing the, the very next turn. Or all in one shot, rather. Yeah. Now, Iron Man doesn't have power number four. DQD's got power. They got, they got giants in hand that are coming. So the Heat's Faithful gets in. So now DQD gets to play the Rat King. They, they're going to get to potentially use it on the Heat's Faithful, sacrificing the Zito, getting it back into their deck. And Iron Man, oof, this is frustrating. Just breaking off a couple of times now. They can't make plays. And they're going to be sort of desperate enough to s just trade off in the heats faithful for a rat. How aggressive does ZQD get? Do we see cloud scraper come down? We do six, five and Iron Man's going to bring back that in the faithful. And now we're going to see Vikram or all it can do is just, you know, get that cloud scraper out of combat. So no blocks by Vikram. I guess just worried about a sequence of like play another unit, use the Rat King Saloon Massacre to kill the Vikram. And look at this. Just mm. trying to get way ahead on board. But with another Vikram in tow, Iron Man could take that Duno clan and they get to attack right away. Yeah, I don't know uh, how much I like that line from DQD because Iron Man has missed multiple power drops. It's more likely than usual that they have a second copy of Vikram in hand. And you could have just played the the 6-6 six, six that turn. You still have a lot of Saloon Massacre equity built up if Iron Man decides that they had to play the second uh, Vikram anyway. And it's so much protection against exactly what you're seeing right now. So look at this. Another Vikram takes the Cloud Scraper. 
We drew Evelina. We're going to see a Black Maw Carnosaur. This is a really important unit right now. It's definitely dominating this board. 6-6, six, six, Deadly Lifesteal. Can Iron Man, if Iron Man can find an answer off the top for that, it would be enormous. All right, Zito gets to poke away the last card in DQD's hand. It's an Evelina. And, and that's a really nice draw there, not only getting the last card, but because um, I think Iron Man's turn was likely to just be Devour anyway. Being able to spend all of your power and Devour a Zito instead of something more valuable, uh, really, really efficient turn. Great timing there on that Zito. All right, so by attacking and chumping with that Spiteling, DQD kept themselves alive because they're only at nine. They drew another Duno clan. And it's definitely a pretty risky play to attack with that Black Maw because if something gets devoured, it's rough. Hmm. So both these units are coming, these giants are coming in, and Iron Man is really going to cash in on the value of these Vikrams. This, this is getting very hard for DQD to do anything but block and trade with them, and that is just an awful spot to be in. Maybe, I mean, if you let one through, a Sahin Stateless could just kill you. Yeah, and, and it's one of those, you know, what are you actually beating at this point? You know, it's seven cards to zero. It's you know, 9 versus 24. What is actually your, like, plan to ever pull ahead in any meaningful way? So now the racking on the other side gets silenced. It's going to make any top-decked Vikrams less impactful. There's another, the Rack King... And you can use one of them to shrink down the Dune Hill clan. We're going to see an attack by this Black Maw. But if you chump, if you trade with the Vikram that stole Dune Hill clan and the Dune Hill clan itself, it feels like a pretty great exchange for uh, for Iron Man. Yeah, and the the board's essentially at neutral, and it's five cards to zero. The leftovers are really good in Iron Man's hand, so I mean I would have to imagine you'd want to wow. err on the side of trading off here because you know. But I guess Iron Man's perspective is probably winning short, winning long, don't have to worry about it. So we're at this point, DQD's probably past the turn. Iron Man's just got to decide if they want to use Through the Unknown right now. They get back a Vikram. And if they steal the Rat King that isn't silenced, it is not a lethal attack, but it would be a, a very, very large one. They're just going to steal the Carnosaur. I mean, it is... Really cuts off a lot of outs for DQD to not have that tool to work with. Right, and even if you know you find an answer for the Vikram, it, it comes back exhausted anyway, and uh, DQD is under so much pressure. So if you do sack it to Nahid's Faithful, a top deck Saloon Massacre is really great here for DQD. Well, it was going to be even better if you didn't do it, because the 6-6 is coming yeah, back. Yeah, that's true. All right, so here we go. Devour, draw two. There's a Zito. And another Devour. We are going to contract. Only at 11 here. And not much in the way of blocking. Yeah. Okay, so devour the Zito. Uh, I think that we're going to have lethal coming across 13? here in a moment. There's a saloon massacre. It was two down. So if the if there was no contract and you devoured immediately, would have hit a saloon massacre. But that is going to do it as Iron Man takes down DQD. 
in a in a really tight three game set between those Zenon decks. I mean, saw all kinds of games between those decks. DQD tried to maybe push it a little bit there. Felt like they had the upper hand at one point with you know having those two big giants on board, but it kind of lost them their last answer to Vikram. A Vikram came down, steals the Dune Hill clan, and it, they never came back from that. Really swingy matchup, and we saw games that took 50 turns and games that took seven turns. Like It, it, it plays all over the place. So um, if you want to get an edge in the mirror match, you just got to get your reps in. No other way about it because um, those games were really hard to play strategically and tactically, and we saw them unfold in just a, a variety of different ways over the course of the tournament. All right. Well, it was a, it was a long-fought uh, event by all the players. want to congratulate Iron Man on reaching the World Championships and DQD for a valiant run. And for all the players for participating this weekend, whether you made it to the finals or, or today or not, uh, we really appreciate you coming out and joining us. Hope everyone at home had a good time watching. This was uh, definitely a memorable event. And uh, – We'll be we'll be back next month with a draft open. We got a July fourth casual event coming up. Look for an announcement about that coming this week, as well as a new league, a new chapter coming in July. So lots of fun stuff in store for everyone. As always, we couldn't do this without you, the viewers, and you, the players at home. So thanks so much for joining us. Want to thank our producer Tim Eller for joining us and putting together a great show. First time behind the monitors um, as well as everyone on the Dire Wolf digital team uh, for helping us put this event together uh, for myself and Patrick Sullivan. We're going to sign off here from Dire Wolf digital. Any final thoughts before we uh, hit the road, Patrick? Nope. All right. So we'll see you next month for the draft open until then. See you in the queues.